Chapter One of the Jungle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Chapter One. It was four o'clock in the morning when the ceremony was over and the carriages began to arrive. There had been a crowd following all the way, owing to the exuberance of Maria Barczynskas. The occasion rested heavily upon Maria's broad shoulders. It was her task to see that all things went in due form, and after the best home traditions and flying wildly hither and thither, bowling everyone out of the way, and scolding and exhorting all day with her tremendous voice, Maria was too eager to see that others conformed to the properties to consider them herself. She had left the church, last of all, and desiring to arrive first at the hall, had issued orders to the coachman to drive faster. When that personage had developed a will of his own in the matter, Maria had flung up the window of the carriage, and leaning out proceeded to tell him her opinion of him, first in Lithuanian, which he did not understand, and then in Polish, which he did. Having the advantage of her in altitude, the driver had stood his ground, and even ventured to attempt to speak, and the result had been a furious altercation, which continuing all the way down Ashland Avenue had added a new swarm of urchins to the cortege at each side street for half a mile. This was unfortunate, for already there was a throng before the door. The music had started up, and half a block away you could hear the dull broom, broom of a cello, with the squeaking of two fiddles which vied with each other in intricate and altitudinous gymnastics. Seeing the throng, Maria abandoned precipitately the debate concerning the ancestors of her coachman, and springing from the moving carriage, plunged in and proceeded to clear a way to the hall. Once within, she turned and began to push the other way, roaring meantime, Ike, Ike, who's that Ike? Doris, in tones which made the orchestral uproar sound like fairy music. Se, Graichonis, Pazilims Minimums, Darsas, Dinas, Schnapses, Wines and Liquors, Union headquarters. That was the way the signs ran. The reader, who perhaps has never held much converse in the language of far-off Lithuania, will be glad of the explanation that the place was the rear room of a saloon in that part of Chicago known as the back of the yards. This information is definite and suited to the matter of fact, but how pitifully inadequate it would have seemed to one who understood that it was the supreme hour of ecstasy in the life of one of God's gentlest creatures, the scene of the wedding feast, and the joy transfiguration of little Ona Lucchesite. She stood in the doorway, shepherded by Cousin Maria, breathless from pushing through the crowd, and in her happiness painful to look upon. There was a light of wonder in her eyes, and her lids trembled and her otherwise wan little face was flushed. She wore a muslin dress conspicuously white, and a stiff little veil coming to her shoulders. There were five pink paper roses twisted in the veil, and eleven bright green rose leaves. There were new white cotton gloves upon her hands, and as she stood staring about her she twisted them together feverishly. It was almost too much for her. You could see the pain of too great emotion in her face, and all the tremor of her form. She was so young, not quite sixteen, and small for her age, a mere child, and she had just been married, and married to Jorgis, of all men, to Jorgis Rudkis, he with the white flower in the buttonhole of his new black suit, he with the mighty shoulders and the giant hands. Ona was blue-eyed and fair, while Jurgis had great black eyes with beetling brows, 
and thick black hair that curled in waves about his ears. In short, they were one of those incongruous and impossible married couples with which Mother Nature so often wills to confound all prophets before and after. Jurgis could take up a two-hundred-and-fifty-pound quarter of beef and carry it into a car without a stagger or even a thought. And now he stood in a far corner, frightened as a hunted animal, and obliged to moisten his lips with his tongue each time before he could answer the congratulations of his friends. Gradually there was effected a separation between the spectators and the guests, a separation at least sufficiently complete for working purposes. There was no time during the festivities which ensued when there were not groups of onlookers in the doorways and the corners, and if any one of these onlookers came sufficiently close, or looked sufficiently hungry, a chair was offered him, and he was invited to the feast. It is one of the laws of the Vesalia that no one goes hungry, and, while a rule made in the forests of Lithuania is hard to apply in the stockyards district of Chicago, with its quarter of a million inhabitants, still they did their best, and the children who ran in from the street, and even the dogs, went out again happier. A charming informality was one of those characteristics of this celebration. The men wore their hats, or, if they wished, they took them off, and their coats with them. They ate when and where they pleased, and moved as often as they pleased. There were to be speeches and singing, but no one had to listen who did not care to. If he wished, meantime, to speak or sing himself, he was perfectly free. The resulting medley of sound distracted no one, save possibly alone the babies, of which there were present a number equal to the total possessed by all the guests invited. There was no other place for the babies to be, and so part of the preparations for the evening consisted of a collection of cribs and carriages in one corner. In these the babies slept, three or four together, or wakened together, as the case might be. Those who were still older, or could reach the tables, marched about munching contentedly at meat-bones and bologna sausages. The room is about thirty feet square, with whitewashed walls, bare save for a calendar, a picture of a racehorse, and a family tree in a gilded frame. To the right there is a door from the saloon, with a few loafers in the doorway, and in the corner beyond it a bar, with a presiding genius clad in soiled white, with waxed black mustaches, and a carefully oiled curl plastered against one side of his forehead. In the opposite corner are two tables, filling a third of the room and laden with dishes and cold bahayums, which a few of the hungrier guests are already munching. At the head, where sits the bride, is a snow-white cake, with an Eiffel Tower of constructed decoration, with sugar-roses and two angels upon it, and a generous sprinkling of pink and green and yellow candies. Beyond opens a door into the kitchen, where there is a glimpse to be had of a range with much steam ascending from it, and many women, old and young, rushing hither and thither. In the corner to the left are the three musicians, upon a little platform, toiling heroically to make some impression upon the hubbub. Also the babies, similarly occupied, and an open window whence the populace imbibes the sights and sounds and odors. Suddenly some of the steam begins to advance, and peering through it you discern Aunt Elizabeth, Ona's stepmother, Teda Elzbita, as they call her, bearing aloft a great platter of stewed duck. Behind her is Kotrina, making her way cautiously, staggering beneath a similar burden, and half a minute later there appears old grandmother Mayautkinian with a big yellow bowl of smoking potatoes nearly as big as herself. So bit by bit the feast takes form. There is a ham and a dish of sauerkraut, boiled rice, macaroni, bologna sausages, great piles of penny buns, bowls of milk, and foaming pictures of beer. 
There is also, not six feet from your back, the bar, where you may order all you please and do not have to pay for it. Eich, Grechow, screams Maria Berchinskas, and falls to work herself, for there is more upon the stove inside that will be spoiled if it be not eaten. So with laughter and shouts and endless badinage and merriment the guests take their places. The young men, who for the most part have been huddled near the door, summon their resolution and advance, and the shrinking Jurgis is poked and scolded by the old folks until he consents to seat himself at the right hand of the bride. The two bridesmaids, who insignia of office are paper wreaths, come next, and after them the rest of the guests, old and young, boys and girls. The spirit of the occasion takes hold of the stately bartender, who condescends to a plate of stewed duck. Even the fat policeman, whose duty it will be later in the evening to break up the fights, draws up a chair to the foot of the table, and the children shout and the babies yell, and everyone laughs and sings and chatters, while above all the deafening clamor Cousin Maria shouts orders to the musicians. The Musicians How shall one begin to describe them? All this time they have been there, playing in a mad frenzy. All of this scene must be read or said or sung to music. It is the music which makes it what it is. It is the music which changes the place, from the rear room of a saloon in the back of the yards to a fairy place, a wonderland, a little corner of the high mansions of the sky. The little person who leads this trio is an inspired man. His fiddle is out of tune, and there is no rosin on his bow, but still he is an inspired man. The hands of the muses have been laid upon him. He plays like one possessed by a demon, by a whole horde of demons. You can feel them in the air round about him, capering frenetically, with their invisible feet they set the pace, and the hair of the leader of the orchestra rises on end, and his eyeballs start from their sockets as he toils to keep up with them. Tomosius Kushlaika is his name, and he has taught himself to play the violin by practicing all night after working all day on the killing beds. He is in his shirt-sleeves with a vest figured with faded gold horseshoes and a pink-striped shirt suggestive of peppermint candy. A pair of military trousers, light blue with a yellow stripe, serve to give that suggestion of authority proper to the leader of a band. He is only about five feet high, but even so these trousers are about eight inches short of the ground. You wonder where he could have gotten them, or rather you wonder if the excitement of being in his presence left you time to think of such things. For he is an inspired man. Every inch of him is inspired. You might almost say inspired separately. He stamps with his feet. He tosses his head. He sways and swings to and fro. He has a wizened-up little face, irresistibly comical and when he executes a turn or a flourish, his brows knit and his lips work, and his eyelids wink, the very ends of his necktie bristle out, and every now and then he turns upon his companions, nodding, signaling, beckoning frantically, with every inch of him appealing, imploring, in behalf of the muses and their call. For they are hardly worthy of Timotius, the other two members of the orchestra. The second violin is a Slovak, a tall, gaunt man with black-rimmed spectacles and the mute and patient look of an overdriven mule. He responds to the whip but feebly, and then always falls back into his old rut. The third man is very fat, with a round, red, sentimental nose, and he plays with his eyes turned up to the sky and a look of infinite yearning. He is playing a bass part upon his cello, and so the excitement is nothing to him. No matter what happens in the treble, it is his task to saw out one long, drawn, and lugubrious note after another, from four o'clock in the afternoon until nearly the same hour next morning, for his third of the total income of one dollar per hour. 
Before the feast has been five minutes under way, Tomosius Kuschleika has risen in his excitement. A minute or two more and you see that he is beginning to edge over toward the tables. His nostrils are dilated and his breath comes fast. His demons are driving him. He nods and shakes his head at his companions, jerking at them with his violin, until at last the long form of the second violinist also rises up. In the end all three of them begin advancing, step by step, upon the banqueters. Valentine Chia, the cellist, bumping along with his instrument between notes. Finally all three are gathered at the foot of the tables, and there Timotius mounts upon a stool. Now he is in his glory, dominating the scene. Some of the people are eating, some are laughing and talking, but you will make a great mistake if you think there is one of them who does not hear him. His notes are never true, and his fiddle buzzes on the low ones and squeaks and scratches on the high, but these things they heed no more than they heed the dirt and noise and squalor about them. It is out of this material that they have to build their lives, with it that they have to utter their souls. And this is their utterance, merry and boisterous, or mournful and wailing, or passionate and rebellious, this music is their music, music of home. It stretches out its arms to them, and they have only to give themselves up. Chicago and its saloons and its slums fade away. There are green meadows and sunlit rivers, mighty forests and snow-clad hills. They behold home landscapes and childhood scenes returning. Old loves and friendships begin to waken old joys and griefs to laugh and weep. Some fall back and close their eyes, some beat upon the table. Now and then one leaps up with a cry and calls for this song or that, and then the fire leaps brighter in Timotius' eyes, and he flings up his fiddle and shouts to his companions, and away they go in mad career. The company takes up the choruses, and men and women cry out like all possessed, some leap to their feet and stamp upon the floor, lifting their glasses and pledging each other. Before long it occurs to someone to demand an old wedding song, which celebrates the beauty of the bride and the joys of love. In the excitement of this masterpiece Timotius Kuschleika begins to edge in between the tables, making his way toward the head, where sits the bride. There is not a foot of space between the chairs of the guests and Timotius is so short that he pokes them with his bow whenever he reaches over for the low notes, but still he presses in and insists relentlessly that his companions must follow. During their progress, needless to say, the sounds of the cello are pretty well extinguished, but at last the three are at the head, and Timotius takes his station at the right hand of the bride and begins to pour out his soul in melting strains. Little Ona is too excited to eat. Once in a while she tastes a little something when cousin Maria pinches her elbow and reminds her, but for the most part she sits gazing with the same fearful eyes of wonder. Teta Elsbeta is all in a flutter, like a hummingbird. Her sisters, too, keep running up behind her, whispering, breathless, but Ona seems scarcely to hear them. The music keeps calling and the far-off look comes back, and she sits with her hands pressed together over her heart. Then the tears begin to come into her eyes, and as she is ashamed to wipe them away, and ashamed to let them run down her cheeks, she turns and shakes her head a little, and then flushes red when she sees that Jurgis is watching her. When in the end Tomosius Kuschleika has reached her side and is waving his magic wand above her, Ona's cheeks are scarlet, and she looks as if she would have to get up and run away. In this crisis, however, she is saved by Maria Berchinskas, whom the muses suddenly visit. Maria is fond of a song, a song of lover's parting. She wishes to hear it, and as the musicians do not know it, she has risen and is proceeding to teach them. Maria is short, but powerful in build. She worked in a canning factory, and all day long she handles cans of beef that weigh fourteen pounds. 
She has a broad Slavic face with prominent red cheeks. When she opens her mouth it is tragical, but you cannot help thinking of a horse. She wears a blue flannel shirtwaist, which is now rolled up to the sleeves, disclosing her brawny arms. She has a carving fork in her hand, with which she pounds on the table to mark the time. As she roars her song, in the voice of which it is enough to say that it leaves no portion of the room vacant, the three musicians follow her, laboriously and note by note, but averaging one note behind. Thus they toil through stanza after stanza of a lovesick swan's lamentation. Sudyev kivit keli tu brown gaisis? Sudyev ile me man bidnam? Matal, he chaikri cape uk chausis? Drogberg an sveto rek venam. When the song is over, it is time for the speech, and old Dede Antanas rises to his feet. Grandfather Antony, Jurgis' father, is not more than sixty years of age, but you would think that he was eighty. He has been only six months in America, and the change has not done him good. In his manhood he worked in a cotton mill, but then a coughing fell upon him and he had to leave. Out in the country the trouble disappeared but he had been working in the pickle rooms at Durham's, and the breathing of the cold, damp air all day has brought it back. Now as he rises he is seized with a coughing fit, and holds himself by his chair and turns away his wan and battered face until it passes. Generally it is the custom for the speech at a Vesalia to be taken out of one of the books and learned by heart, but in his youthful days Dede Antanas used to be a scholar, and really makes up all the love letters of his friends. Now it is understood that he has composed an original speech of congratulations and benediction, and this is one of the events of the day. Even the boys who are romping about the room draw near and listen, and some of the women sob and wipe their aprons in their eyes. It is very solemn, for Antonas Rudkus has become possessed of the idea that he has not much longer to stay with his children. His speech leaves them all so tearful that one of the guests, Jokubas Shedvilas, who keeps a delicatessen store on Halstead Street and is fat and hearty, is moved to rise and say that things may not be as bad as that, and then to go on and make a little speech of his own, in which he showers congratulations and prophecies of happiness upon the bride and groom, proceeding to particulars which greatly delight the young men, but which cause Ona to blush more furiously than ever. Jokubas possesses what his wife complacently describes as poetishkan vedintuive, a poetical imagination. Now a good many of the guests have finished, since there is no pretense of ceremony, the banquet begins to break up. Some of the men gather about the bar. Some wander about, laughing and singing. Here and there there will be a little group, chanting merrily and in sublime indifference to the others, and to the orchestra as well. Everybody is more or less restless. One would guess that something is on their minds. And so it proves. The last tardy diners are scarcely given time to finish before the tables and the debris are shoved into the corner and the chairs and the babies piled out of the way, and the real celebration of the evening begins. Then Tomosius Kuschleika, after replenishing himself with a pot of beer, returns to his platform and standing up reviews the scene. He taps authoritatively upon the side of his violin, then tucks it carefully under his chin, then waves his bow in an elaborate flourish, and finally smites the sounding strings and closes his eyes, and floats away in spirit upon the wings of a dreamy waltz. His companion follows, but with his eyes open, watching where he treads, so to speak, and finally Valenti Nachvicha, after waiting for a little, and beating with his foot to get the time, casts up his eyes to the ceiling and begins to saw. Room, room, room. 
the company pairs off quickly, and the whole room is soon in motion. Apparently nobody knows how to waltz, but that is nothing of any consequence. There is music, and they dance, each as he pleases, just as before they sang. Most of them prefer the two-step, especially the young, with whom it is the fashion. The older people have dances from home, strange and complicated steps, which they execute with grave solemnity. Some do not dance anything at all, but simply hold each other's hands and allow the undisciplined joy of motion to express itself with their feet. Among these are Jacobus Shadvilas and his wife Lucia, who together keep the delicatessen store and consume nearly as much as they sell. They are too fat to dance, but they stand in the middle of the floor, holding each other fast in their arms, rocking slowly from side to side, and grinning seraphically, a picture of toothless and perspiring ecstasy. Of these older people many wear clothing reminiscent in some detail of home, an embroidered waistcoat or stomacher, or a gaily colored handkerchief or a coat with large cuffs and fancy buttons. All these things are carefully avoided by the young, most of whom have learned to speak English and to affect the latest style of clothing. The girls wear ready-made dresses or shirtwaists, and some of them look quite pretty. Some of the young men you would take to be Americans, of the type of clerks, but for the fact that they wear their hats in the room. Each of these younger couples affects a style of its own in dancing. Some hold each other tightly, some at a cautious distance, some hold their hands out stiffly, some drop loosely at their sides, some dance springingly, some glide softly, some move with great dignity. There are boisterous couples who tear wildly about the room, knocking everyone out of their way. There are nervous couples whom these frighten and who cry, Nuskrok! Kazra! at them as they pass. Each couple is paired for the evening. You will never see them change about. There is Elena Yesetite, for instance, who has danced on ending hours with Yuzas Rashus, to whom she is engaged. Elena is the beauty of the evening, and she would be really beautiful if she were not so proud. She wears a white shirtwaist, which represents perhaps half a week's labor painting cans. She holds her skirt with her hand as she dances with stately precision, after the manner of the grand dame. Yusos is driving one of Durham's wagons and is making big wages. He affects a tough aspect, wearing his hat on one side and keeping a cigarette in his mouth all the evening. Then there is Yadviga Marcinfus, who is also beautiful, but humble. Yadviga likewise paint cans, but then she has an invalid mother, and three little sisters to support by it, and so she does not spend her wages for shirtwaists. Yadviga is small and delicate, with jet-black eyes and hair, the latter twisted into a little knot and tied on the top of her head. She wears an old white dress which she has made herself and worn to parties for the past five years. It is high-waisted, almost under her arms, and not very becoming. But that does not trouble Yadviga, who is dancing with her Mikolas. She is small, while he is big and powerful. She nestles in his arms as if she would hide herself from view, and leans her head upon his shoulder. He, in turn, has clasped her arms tightly around her, as if he would carry her away, and so she dances and will dance the entire evening, and would dance forever in ecstasy of bliss. You would smile, perhaps, to see them, but you would not smile if you knew all the story. This is the fifth year now that Yadviga has been engaged to Mikolas, and her heart is sick. They would have been married in the beginning on the Mikolas as a father who is drunk all day, and he is the only other man in a large family. Even so they might have managed it, for Mikolas is a skilled man, but for cruel accidents which have almost taken the heart out of them. 
He is a beef boner, and that is a dangerous trade, especially when you are on piecework and trying to earn a bribe. Your hands are slippery, and your knife is slippery, and you are toiling like mad when somebody happens to speak to you or you strike a bone. Then your hand slips up on the blade and there is a fearful gash. And that would not be so bad only for the deadly contagion. The cut may heal, but you can never tell. Twice now, within the last three years, Nikolas has been lying at home with blood poisoning, once for three months, and once for nearly seven. The last time, too, he lost his job, and that meant six weeks more of standing at the doors of the packing-houses, at six o'clock on bitter winter mornings, with a foot of snow on the ground and more in the air. There are learned people who can tell you out of the statistics that beef boners make forty cents an hour, but perhaps these people have never looked into a beef boner's hands. When Timotius and his companions stop for a rest, as perforce they must now and then, the dancers halt where they are and wait patiently. They never seem to tire, and there is no place for them to sit down if they did. It is only for a minute, anyway, for the leader starts up again, in spite of all the protests of the other two. This time it is another sort of dance, a Lithuanian dance. Those who prefer to go on with a two-step, but the majority go through an intricate series of motions resembling more fancy skating than a dance. The climax of it is a furious pestissimo at which the couples seize hands and begin a mad whirling. This is quite irresistible, and every one in the room joins in, until the place becomes a maze of flying skirts and bodies quite dazzling to look upon. But the sight of sights at this moment is Timotius Kuschleika. The old fiddle squeaks and shrieks in protest, but Timotius has no mercy. The sweat starts out on his forehead, and he bends over like a cyclist on the last lap of a race. His body shakes and throbs like a runaway steam engine, and the ear cannot follow the flying showers of notes. There is a pale blue mist where you look to see his bowing arm. With a wonderful rush he comes to the end of the tune and flings up his hands and staggers back exhausted, and with a final shout of delight the dancers fly apart, reeling here and there, bringing up against the walls of the room. After this there is beer for everyone, the musicians included, and the revelers take a long breath and prepare for the great event of the evening, which is the Achavimas. The Achavimas is a ceremony which, once begun, will continue for three or four hours, and it involves one uninterrupted dance. The guests form a great ring, locking hands, and when the music starts up begin to move around in a circle. In the center stands the bride, and one by one the men step into the enclosure and dance with her. Each dances for several minutes, as long as he pleases. It is a very merry proceeding with laughter and singing, and when the guest has finished he finds himself face to face with Teta as Vita who holds the hat. Into it he drops a sum of money, a dollar, or perhaps five dollars, according to his power, and his estimate of the value of the privilege. The guests are expected to pay for this entertainment. If they be proper guests, they will see that there is a neat sum left over for the bride and bridegroom to start life upon. Most fearful they are to contemplate the expenses of this entertainment. They will certainly be over two hundred dollars and maybe three hundred, and three hundred dollars is more than the year's income of many a person in this room. There are able-bodied men here who work from early morning until late at night, in ice-cold cellars with a quarter inch of water on the floor, men who for six or seven months in the year never see the sunlight from Sunday afternoon till the next Sunday morning and who cannot earn three hundred dollars in a year. There are little children here, scarce in their teens, who can hardly see the top of the workbenches, whose parents have lied to get them their places, 
and who do not make the half of three hundred dollars a year, and perhaps not even the third of it. And then to spend such a sum all in a single day of your life at a wedding feast for obviously it is the same thing whether you spend it at once for your own wedding or in a long time at the weddings of all your friends. It is very imprudent, it is tragic, but ah, it is so beautiful. Bit by bit these poor people have given up everything else, but to this they cling with all the power of their souls. They cannot give up the veselia. To do that would mean not merely to be defeated, but to acknowledge defeat. And the difference between these two things is what keeps the world going. The Veselia has come down to them from a far-off time, and the meaning of it was that one might dwell within the cave and gaze upon shadows, provided only that once in his lifetime he could break his chains and feel his wings and behold the sun provided that once in his lifetime he might testify to the fact that life, with all its cares and its terrors, is no such great thing after all, but merely a bubble upon the surface of a river, a thing that one may toss and play with as a juggler tosses his golden balls, a thing that one may quaff, like a goblet of rare red wine. Thus having known himself for the master of things, a man could go back to his toil and live upon the memory all his days. Endlessly the dancers swung round and round. When they were dizzy, they swung the other way. Hour after hour this had continued. The darkness had fallen, and the room was dim from the light of two smoky oil lamps. The musicians had spent all their fine frenzy by now, and played only one tune, wearily, Plottingly. There were twenty bars or so of it, and when they came to the end they began again. Once every ten minutes or so they would fail to begin again, but instead would sink back exhausted, a circumstance which invariably brought on a painful and terrifying scene that made the fat policeman stir uneasily in his sleeping place behind the door. It was all Maria Berchinskas. Maria was one of those hungry souls who clung with desperation to the skirts of the retreating muse. All day long she had been in a state of wonderful exaltation, and now it was leaving, and she would not let it go. Her soul cried out in the words of Faust, Stay thou art fair! Whether it was by beer, or by shouting, or by music, or by motion, she meant that it should not go, and she would go back to the chase of it, and no sooner be fairly started than her chariot would be thrown off the track, so to speak, by the stupidity of those thrice accursed musicians. Each time Maria would emit a howl and fly at them, shaking her fists in their faces, stamping upon the floor, purple and incoherent with rage. In vain, the frightened Fomotius would attempt to speak, to plead the limitations of the flesh. In vain would the puffing and breathless Ponus Jokubus insist, in vain would Teta Elsbeta implore. Schalen, Maria would scream. Paluk ist Helio! What are you paid for, children of hell? And so in sheer terror the orchestra would strike up again, and Maria would return to her place and take up her task. She bore all the burden of the festivities now. Ona was kept up by her excitement, but all of the women and most of the men were tired. The soul of Maria was alone unconquered. She drove on the dancers. What had once been the ring had now the shape of a pear, with Maria at the stem, pulling one way and pushing the other, shouting, stamping, singing, a very volcano of energy. Now and then some coming in or out would leave the door open, and the night air was chill. Maria, as she passed, would stretch out her foot and kick the doorknob, and slam would go the door. Once this procedure was the cause of a calamity, of which Sebastianus Chedvilas was the hapless victim. 
little Sebastianus, aged three, had been wandering about oblivious to all things, holding turned up over his mouth a bottle of liquid known as pop, pink-colored, ice-cold, and delicious. Passing through the doorway, the door smote him full, and the shriek which followed brought the dancing to a halt. Maria, who threatened horrid murder a hundred times a day, and would weep over the injury of a fly, seized little Sebastianus in her arms and bid fair to smother him with kisses. There was a long rest for the orchestra and plenty of refreshments, while Maria was making her peace with her victim, seating him upon the bar and standing beside him and holding to his lips a foaming schooner of beer. In the meantime, there was going on in another corner of the room an anxious conference between Teta Elzbieta and Dede Antanas, and a few of the more intimate friends of the family. A trouble was come upon them. The Veselia is a compact, a compact not expressed, but therefore only the more binding upon all. Everyone's share was different, and yet everyone knew perfectly well what his share was and strove to give a little more. Now, however, since they had come to the new country, all this was changing. It seemed as if there must be some subtle poison in the air that one breathed here. It was affecting all the young men at once. They would come in crowds and fill themselves with a fine dinner, and then sneak off. One would throw another's hat out of the window, and both would go out to get it and neither could be seen again. Or now and then half a dozen of them would get together and march out openly, staring at you and making fun of you to your face. Still others, worse yet, would crowd about the bar and at the expense of the host drink themselves sodden, paying not the least attention to anyone, and leaving it to be thought that either they had danced with the bride already or meant to later on. All these things were going on now, and the family was helpless with dismay. So long they had toiled, and such an outlay they had made. Ona stood by, her eyes wide with terror. Those frightful bills, how they had haunted her, each item gnawing at her soul, all day and spoiling her rest at night. How often she had named them over, one by one, and figured on them as she went to work. Fifteen dollars for the hall, twenty-two dollars and a quarter for the ducks, twelve dollars for the musicians, five dollars at the church, and a blessing of the Virgin besides, and so on, without an end. Worst of all was the frightful bill that was still to come from Graichunas for the beer and liquor that might be consumed. One could never get in advance more than a guess as to this from a saloon-keeper, and then when the time came he always came to you scratching his head and saying that he had guessed too low, but that he had done his best. Your guests had gotten so very drunk. By him you were sure to be cheated unmercifully, and that even though you thought yourself the dearest of the hundreds of friends he had, he would begin to serve your guests out of a keg that was half full, and finish with one that was half empty, and then you would be charged for two kegs of beer. He would agree to serve a certain quality at a certain price, and when the time came you and your friends would be drinking some horrible poison that could not be described. You might complain, but you would get nothing for your pains but a ruined evening. While, as for going to the law about it, you might as well go to heaven at once. The saloon-keeper stood in with all the big politics men in the district, and when you had once found out what it meant to get into trouble with such people, you would know enough to pay what you were told to pay, and shut up. What made all this the more painful was that it was so hard on the few that had really done their best. There was poor old Ponus Jokubus, for instance. He had already given five dollars and did not every one know that Jokubus Chedvilis had just mortgaged his delicatessen store for two hundred dollars to meet several months overdue rent? 
and then there was withered old Pony Anile, who was a widow, and had three children, and the rheumatism besides, and did washing for the tradespeople on Halstead Street at prices it would break your heart to hear named. Anile had given the entire profit of her chickens for several months. Eight of them she owned, and she kept them in a little place fenced around on her back stairs. All day long the children of Anile were raking in the dump for food for these chickens, and sometimes, when the competition there was too fierce, you might see them on Halstead Street walking close to the gutters, and with their mother following to see that no one robbed them of their fines. Money could not tell the value of these chickens to old Mrs. Yuknine. She valued them differently, for she had a feeling that she was getting something for nothing by means of them, that with them she was getting the better of a world that was getting the better of her in so many other ways. So she watched them every hour of the day, and had learned to see like an owl at night to watch them then. One of them had been stolen long ago, and not a month passed that someone did not try to steal another. As the frustrating of this one attempt involved a score of false alarms, it will be understood what a tribute old Mrs. Yuknine brought. Just because Teta Elzbeta had once loaned her some money for a few days and saved her from being turned out of her house. More and more friends gathered round while the lamentation about these things was going on. Some drew nearer, hoping to overhear the conversation, who were themselves among the guilty, and surely that was a thing to try the patience of a saint. Finally there came Jurgis, urged by some, and the story was retold to him. Jurgis listened in silence, with his great black eyebrows knitted. Now and then there would come a gleam underneath them, and he would glance about the room. Perhaps he would have liked to go at some of those fellows with his big clenched fist, but then, doubtless, he realized how little good it would do him. No bill would be any less for turning out any one at this time, and then there would be the scandal, and Jurgis wanted nothing except to get away with Ona and to let the world go its own way. So his hands relaxed and he merely said quietly, It is done, and there is no use in weeping, Teta Elzbeta. Then his look turned toward Ona, who stood close to his side, and he saw the wide look of terror in her eyes. Little one, he said in a low voice, do not worry. It will not matter to us. We will pay them all somehow. I will work harder. That was always what Jurgis said. One had grown used to it as the solution of all difficulties. I will work harder. He had said that in Lithuania, when one official had taken his passport from him, and another had arrested him for being without it, and the two had divided a third of his belongings. He had said it again in New York, when the smooth-spoken agent had taken them in hand and made them pay such high prices and almost prevented their leaving his place, in spite of their pain. Now he said it a third time, and Ona drew a deep breath. It was so wonderful to have a husband, just like a grown woman, and a husband who could solve all problems, and who was so big and strong. The last sob of little Sebastianus had been stifled, and the orchestra had once more been reminded of its duty. The ceremony begins again, but there are few now left to dance with, and so very soon the collection is over and promiscuous dances once more begin. It is now after midnight, however, and things are not as they were before. The dancers are dull and heavy. Most of them have been drinking hard, and have long ago passed the stage of exhilaration. They dance in monotonous measure, round after round, hour after hour, with eyes fixed upon vacancy, as if they were only half conscious, in a constantly growing stupor. The men grasp the women very tightly, but there will be half an hour together when neither will see the other's faces. Some couples do not care to dance, and have retired to the corners where they sit with their arms enlaced. Others who have been drinking still more wander about the room, 
bumping into everything. Some are in groups of two or three, singing, each group its own song. As time goes on there is a variety of drunkenness, among the younger men especially. Some stagger about in each other's arms, whispering maudlin words. Others start quarrels upon the slightest pretext, and come to blows and have to be pulled apart. Now the fat policeman wakens definitely, and feels of his club to see that it is ready for business. He has to be prompt, for these two o'clock in the morning fights, if they once get out of hand, are like a forest fire, and may mean the whole reserves at the station. The thing to do is to crack every fighting head that you see, before there are so many fighting heads that you cannot crack any of them. There is but scant account kept of cracked heads in the back of the yards, for men who have to crack the heads of animals all day seem to get into the habit, and to practice on their friends and even on their families between times. This makes it a cause for congratulation that by modern methods a very few men can do the painfully necessary work of head-cracking for the whole of the cultured world. There is no fight that night, perhaps because Jurgis, too, is watchful, even more so than the policeman. Jurgis has drunk a great deal, as any one naturally would on an occasion when it all has to be paid for, whether it is drunk or not. But he is a very steady man, and does not easily lose his temper. Only once there is a tight shave, and that is the fault of Maria Bachinskas. Maria has apparently concluded about two hours ago that if the altar in the corner with the deity in soiled white be not the true home of the muses, it is, at any rate, the nearest substitute on earth attainable, and Maria is just fighting drunk when there come to her ears the facts about the villains who have not paid that night. Maria goes on the warpath straight off, without even the preliminary of a good cursing, and when she is pulled off it is with the coat-collars of two villains in her hands. Fortunately the policeman is disposed to be reasonable, and so it is not Maria who is flung out of the place. All this interrupts the music for not more than a minute or two. Then again the merciless tune begins, the tune that has been played for the last half-hour without one single change. It is an American tune this time, one which they have picked up on the streets. All seem to know the words of it, or at any rate the first line of it, which they hum to themselves, over and over again, without rest. In the good old summertime, in the good old summertime, in the good old summertime, in the good old summertime. There seems to be something hypnotic about this with its endlessly recurring dominant. It has put a stupor upon every one who hears it, as well as upon the men who are playing it. No one can get away from it, or even think of getting away from it. It is three o'clock in the morning, and they have danced out all their joy, and danced out all their strength, and all the strength that unlimited drink can give them, and still there is no one among them who has the power to think of stopping. Promptly at seven o'clock this same Monday morning they will, every one of them, have to be in their places at Durham's or Brown's or Jones's, each in his working clothes. If one of them be a minute late he will be docked an hour's pay, and if he be many minutes late he will be apt to find his brass check turned to the wall, which will send him out to join the hungry mob that waits every morning at the gates of the packing-houses, from six o'clock until nearly half-past eight. There is no exception to this rule, not even little Ona, who has asked for a holiday the day after her wedding day, a holiday without pay, and been refused, while there are so many who are anxious to work as you wish, there is no occasion for incommoding yourself with those who must work otherwise. Little Ona is nearly ready to faint, and half in a stupor herself, because of the heavy scent in the room. She has not taken a drop, but everyone else there is literally burning alcohol, 
as the lamps are burning oil. Some of the men who are sound asleep in their chairs or on the floor are reeking of it so that you cannot go near them. Now and then Jurgis gazes at her hungrily. He has long since forgotten his shyness. But then the crowd is there, and he still waits and watches the door where a carriage is supposed to come. It does not. And finally he will wait no longer, but comes up to Ona, who turns white and trembles. He puts her shawl about her, and then his own coat. They live only two blocks away, and Jurgis does not care about the carriage. There is almost no farewell. The dancers do not notice them, and all of the children and many of the old folks have fallen asleep of sheer exhaustion. Dede Atanas is asleep, and so are the Shedvilises, husband and wife, the former snoring in octaves. There is Teta Elsbeta and Maria sobbing loudly, and then there is only the silent night, with the stars beginning to pale a little in the east. Jurgis, without a word, lifts Ona in his arms and strides out with her, and she sinks her head upon his shoulder with a moan. When he reaches home he is not sure whether she has fainted or is asleep, and when he has to hold her with one hand while he unlocks the door he sees that she has opened her eyes. "'You shall not go to Brown's today, little one,' he whispers as he climbs the stairs, and she catches his arm in terror, gasping, "'No, no, I dare not. It will ruin us.' But he answers her again, "'Leave it to me. Leave it to me. I will earn more money. I will work harder. End of chapter one. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter two of the jungle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Chapter two. Jurgis talked lightly about work, because he was young. They told him stories about the breaking down of men there in the stockyards of Chicago, and of what had happened to them afterward, stories to make your flesh creep. But Jurgis would only laugh. He had only been there four months, and he was young and a giant besides. There was too much health in him. He could not even imagine how it would feel to be beaten. "'That is well enough for men like you,' he would say. "'Silpness, puny fellows, but my back is broad.' Jurgis was like a boy, a boy from the country. He was the sort of man the bosses like to get hold of, the sort they make it a grievance they cannot get hold of. When he was told to go to a certain place he would go there on the run. When he had nothing to do for the moment he would stand around fidgeting, dancing, with the overflow of energy that was in him. If he were working in a line of men the line always moved too slowly for him, and you could pick him out by his impatience and restlessness. That was why he had been picked out on one important occasion, for Jurgis had stood outside of Brown and Company's central time station not more than half an hour the second day of his arrival in Chicago, before he had been beckoned by one of the bosses. Of this he was very proud, and it made him more disposed than ever to laugh at the pessimists. In vain would they all tell him that there were men in that crowd from which he had been chosen who had stood there a month, yes, many months, and not been chosen yet. Yes, he would say, but what sort of men? broken-down tramps and good-for-nothings, fellows who have spent all their money drinking and want to get more for it? Do you want me to believe that with these arms, and he would clench his fists and hold them up in the air, so that you might see the rolling muscles, that with these arms people will ever let me starve? It is plain, they would answer to this, that you have come from the country, and from very far in the country. And this was the fact for Jurgis had never seen a city, 
and scarcely even a fair-sized town, until he had set out to make his fortune in the world and earn his right to Ona. His father, and his father's father before him, and as many ancestors back as legend could go, had lived in that part of Lithuania known as Brelovcha, the imperial forest. This is a great tract of a hundred thousand acres, which from time immemorial has been a hunting preserve of the nobility. There are a very few peasants settled in it, holding title from ancient times, and one of these was Antanas Rudkis, who had been reared himself and had reared his children in turn upon half a dozen acres of cleared land in the midst of a wilderness. There had been one son besides Jurgis and one sister. The former had been drafted into the army, that had been over ten years ago, but since that day nothing had ever been heard of him. The sister was married, and her husband had bought the place when old Antanas had decided to go with his son. It was nearly a year and a half ago that Jurgis had met Ona at a horse fair a hundred miles from home. Jurgis had never expected to get married. He had laughed at it as a foolish trap for a man to walk into. But here, without ever having spoken a word to her, with no more than the exchange of half a dozen smiles, he found himself, purple in the face with embarrassment and terror, asking her parents to sell her to him for his wife, and offering his father's two horses he had been sent to the fair to sell. But Ona's father proved as a rock. The girl was yet a child, and he was a rich man, and his daughter was not to be had in that way. So Jurgis went home with a heavy heart, and that spring and summer toiled and tried hard to forget. In the fall, after the harvest was over, he saw that it would not do, and tramped the full fortnight's journey that lay between him and Ona. He found an unexpected state of affairs, for the girl's father had died, and his estate was tied up with creditors. Jurgis' heart leaped as he realized that now the prize was within his reach. There was Elsbeta Lukoshite, Teta, or aunt as they called her, Ona's stepmother, and there were her six children of all ages. There was also her brother Jonas, a dried-up little man who had worked upon the farm. They were people of great consequence, as it seemed to Jurgis, fresh out of the woods. Ona knew how to read, and knew many other things that he did not know, and now the farm had been sold and the whole family was adrift, all they owned in the world being about seven hundred roubles, which is half as many dollars. They would have had three times that, but it had gone to court and the judge had decided against them and it had cost the balance to get him to change his decision. Ona might have married and left them, but she would not, for she loved Teta Elsbeta. It was Jonas who suggested they all go to America, where a friend of his had gotten rich. He would work for his part, and the women would work, and some of the children doubtless. They would live somehow. Jurgis, too, had heard of America. That was a country where, they said, a man might earn three roubles a day and Jurgis figured what three roubles a day would mean, with prices as they were where he lived, and decided forthwith that he would go to America and marry, and be a rich man in the bargain. In that country, rich or poor, a man was free, it was said. He did not have to go into the army. He did not have to pay out his money to rascally officials. He might do as he pleased, and count himself as good as any other man. So America was a place of which lovers and young people dreamed. If one could only manage to get the price of a passage, he could count his troubles at an end. It was arranged that they should leave the following spring, and meantime Jurgis sold himself to a contractor for a certain time, and tramped nearly four hundred miles from home with a gang of men to work upon a railroad in Schmolensk. This was a fearful experience with filth and bad food and cruelty and overwork. But Jurgis stood it and came out in fine trim, and with eighty roubles sewed up in his coat. He did not drink or fight, because he was thinking all the time of Ona. 
and for the rest he was a quiet, steady man, who did what he was told to, did not lose his temper often, and when he did lose it made the offender anxious that he should not lose it again. When they paid him off he dodged the company gamblers and dram shops, and so they tried to kill him, but he escaped and tramped at home working at odd jobs and sleeping always with one eye open. So in the summertime they had all set out for America. At the last moment there joined them Maria Bachinskas, who was a cousin of Ona's. Maria was an orphan and had worked since childhood for a rich farmer at Vilna who beat her regularly. It was only at the age of twenty that it had occurred to Maria to try her strength when she had risen up and nearly murdered the man, and then come away. There were twelve in all in the party, five adults and six children, and Ona, who was a little of both. They had a hard time on the passage. There was an agent who helped them, but he proved a scoundrel, and got them into a trap with some officials, and cost them a good deal of their precious money, which they clung to with such horrible fear. This happened to them again in New York, for of course they knew nothing about the country, and had no one to tell them, and it was easy for a man in a blue uniform to lead them away and to take them to a hotel and keep them there, and make them pay enormous charges to get away. The law says that the rate card shall be on the door of a hotel, but it does not say that it shall be in Lithuanian. It was in the stockyards that Jonas' friend had gotten rich, and so to Chicago the party was bound. They knew that one word, Chicago, and that was all they needed to know, at least until they reached the city. Then, tumbled out of the cars without ceremony, they were no better off than before. They stood staring down the vista of Dearborn Street, with its big black buildings towering in the distance, unable to realize that they had arrived and why, when they said Chicago, people no longer pointed in some direction, but instead looked perplexed, or laughed, or went on without paying any attention. They were pitiable in their helplessness. Above all things they stood in deadly terror of any sort of person in official uniform, and so whenever they saw a policeman they would cross the street and hurry by. For the whole of the first day they wandered about in the midst of deafening confusion, utterly lost, and it was only at night that, cowering in the doorway of a house, they were finally discovered and taken by a policeman to the station. In the morning an interpreter was found, and they were taken and put upon a car and taught a new word, stockyards. Their delight at discovering that they were to get out of this adventure without losing another share of their possessions it would not be possible to describe. They sat and stared out of the window. They were on a street which seemed to run on forever, mile after mile, thirty-four of them, if they had known it, and each side of it one uninterrupted row of wretched little two-story frame buildings. Down every side street they could see it was the same never a hill and never a hollow, but always the same endless vista of ugly and dirty little wooden buildings. Here and there would be a bridge crossing a filthy creek, with hard-baked mud shores and dingy sheds and docks along it. Here and there would be a railroad crossing, with a tangle of switches and locomotives puffing and rattling freight cars filing by. Here and there would be a great factory, a dingy building with innumerable windows in it, and immense volumes of smoke pouring from the chimneys, darkening the air above and making filthy the earth beneath. But after each of these interruptions the desolate procession would begin again, the procession of dreary little buildings. A full hour before the party reached the city they had begun to note the perplexing changes in the atmosphere. It grew darker all the time, and upon the earth the grass seemed to grow less green. Every minute as the train sped on the colors of things became dingier, the fields were grown parched and yellow, the landscape hideous and bare. And along with the thickening spoke they began to notice another circumstance, a strange pungent odor. 
They were not sure that it was unpleasant, this odor. Some might have called it sickening, but their taste in odors was not developed, and they were only sure that it was curious. Now, sitting in the trolley car, they realized that they were on their way to the home of it, that they had traveled all the way from Lithuania to it. It was now no longer something far off and faint that you caught in whiffs. You could literally taste it as well as smell it. You could take hold of it, almost, and examine it at your leisure. They were divided in their opinions about it. It was an elemental odor, raw and crude. It was rich, almost rancid, sensual and strong. There were some who drank it in as if it were an intoxicant. There were others who put their handkerchiefs to their faces. The new immigrants were still tasting it, lost in wonder, when suddenly the car came to a halt and the door was flung open and a voice shouted, "'Stockyards!' They were left standing upon the corner, staring. Down a side street there were two rows of brick houses, and between them a vista. Half a dozen chimneys, tall as the tallest of buildings, touching the very sky, and leaping from them half a dozen columns of smoke, thick, oily, and black as night. It might have come from the center of the world, this smoke, where the fires of the ages still smolder. It came as if self-impelled, driving all before it, a perpetual explosion. It was inexhaustible. One stared, waiting to see it stop, but still the great streams rolled out. They spread in vast clouds overhead, writhing, curling. Then, uniting in one giant river, they streamed away down the sky, stretching a black pall as far as the eye could reach. Then the party became aware of another thing. This, too, like the color, was a thing elemental. It was a sound, a sound made up of ten thousand little sounds. You scarcely noticed it at first, it sunk into your consciousness, a vague disturbance, a trouble. It was like the murmuring of the bees in the spring, the whisperings of the forest. It suggested endless activity, the rumblings of a world in motion, it was only by an effort that one could realize that it was made by animals, that it was the distant lowing of ten thousand cattle, the distant grunting of ten thousand swine. They would have liked to follow it up, but at last they had no time for adventures just then. The policeman on the corner was beginning to watch them, and so, as usual, they started up the street. Scarcely had they gone a block, however, before Jonas was heard to give a cry, and began pointing excitedly across the street. Before they could gather the meaning of his breathless ejaculations he had bounded away, and they saw him enter a shop over which was a sign, J. Chetvilles, Delicatessen. When he came out again it was in company with a very stout gentleman in shirt-sleeves and an apron, clasping Jonas by both hands and laughing hilariously. Then Teda Elsbeta recollected suddenly that Shedvilis had been the name of the mythical friend who had made his fortune in America. To find that he had been making it in the delicatessen business was an extraordinary piece of good fortune at this juncture. Though it was well on in the morning, they had not breakfasted, and the children were beginning to whimper. Thus was the happy ending to a woeful voyage. The two families literally fell upon each other's necks for it had been years since Jokubas Shedvilis had met a man from his part of Lithuania. Before half the day they were lifelong friends. Jokubas understood all the pitfalls of this new world, and could explain all of its mysteries. He could tell them the things they ought to have done in the different emergencies, and what was still more to the point, he could tell them what to do now. He would take them to Pony and Nile who kept a boarding-house the other side of the yards. Old Mrs. Yuknine, he explained, had not what one would call choice accommodations, but they might do for the moment. To this Teta Elzbeta hastened to respond that nothing could be too cheap to suit them just then, for they were quite terrified over the sums they had had to expend. A very few days of practical experience in this land of high wages had been sufficient to make clear to them the cruel fact 
that it was also a land of high prices, and that in it the poor man was almost as poor as in any other corner of the earth. And so there vanished in a night all the wonderful dreams of wealth that had been haunting Jurgis. What had made the discovery all the more painful was that they were spending, at American prices, money which they had earned at home rates of wages, and so were really being cheated by the world. The last two days they had all but starved themselves. It made them quite sick to pay the prices that the railroad people asked them for food. Yet when they saw the home of the widow Yuknine, they could not but recoil. Even so, in all their journey they had seen nothing so bad as this. Pony Anile had a four-room flat in one of that wilderness of two-story frame tenements that lie back of the yards. There were four such flats in each building, and each of the four was a boarding-house for the occupancy of foreigners, Lithuanians, Poles, Slovaks, or Bohemians. Some of these places were kept by private persons, some were cooperative. There would be an average of half a dozen boarders to each room. Sometimes there were thirteen or fourteen to one room, fifty or sixty to a flat. Each one of the occupants furnished his own accommodations, that is, a mattress and some bedding. The mattresses would be spread upon the floor in rows, and there would be nothing else in the place except a stove. It was by no means unusual for two men to own the same mattress in common, one working by day and using it by night, and the other working at night and using it in the daytime. Very frequently a lodging-house keeper would rent the same beds to double shifts of men. Mrs. Yuknine was a wizened little woman with a wrinkled face. Her home was unthinkably filthy. You could not enter by the front door at all owing to the mattresses, and when you tried to go up the back stairs you found that she had walled up most of the porch with old boards to make a place to keep her chickens. It was a standing jest of the boarders that Anile cleaned house by letting the chickens loose in the rooms. Undoubtedly this did keep down the vermin, but it seemed probable, in view of all the circumstances, that the old lady regarded it rather as feeding the chickens than as cleaning the rooms. The truth was that she had definitely given up the idea of cleaning anything, under pressure of an attack of rheumatism, which had kept her doubled up in one corner of her room for over a week, during which time eleven of her boarders, heavily in her debt, had concluded to try their chances of employment in Kansas City. This was July, and the fields were green. One never saw the fields, nor any green thing whatever, in Packingtown but one could go out on the road and hobo it, as the men phrased it, and see the country, and have a long rest and an easy time riding on the freight cars. Such was the home to which the new arrivals were welcomed. There was nothing better to be had. They might not do so well by looking further, for Mrs. Yuknine had at least kept one room for herself and her three little children and now offered to share this with the women and the girls of the party. They could get bedding at a second-hand store, she explained, and they would not need any while the weather was so hot. Doubtless they would all sleep on the sidewalk such nights as this, as did nearly all of her guests. Tomorrow, Jurgis said, when they were left alone, tomorrow I will get a job, and perhaps Jonas will get one also, and then we can get a place of our own. Later that afternoon he and Ona went out to take a walk and look about them, to see more of this district which was to be their home. In back of the yards the dreary two-story frame houses were scattered farther apart, and there were great spaces bare, that seemingly had been overlooked by the great soar of a city as it spread itself over the surface of the prairie. These bare places were grown up with dingy yellow weeds, hiding innumerable tomato cans, innumerable children played upon them, chasing one another here and there, screaming and fighting. The most uncanny thing about this neighborhood was the number of children. 
you thought there must be a school just out, and that it was only after long acquaintance that you were able to realize that there was no school, but that these were the children of the neighborhood, that there were so many children to the block in Packingtown that nowhere on its streets could a horse and buggy move faster than a walk. It could not move faster anyhow, on account of the state of the streets. Those through which Jurgis and Ona were walking resembled streets less than they did a miniature topographical map. The roadway was commonly several feet lower than the level of the houses, which were sometimes joined by high board walks. There were no pavements. These were mountains and valleys and rivers, gullies and ditches, and great hollows full of stinking green water. In these pools the children played and rolled about in the mud of the streets. Here and there one noticed them digging in it, after trophies which they had stumbled on. One wondered about this as also about the swarms of flies which hung about the scene, literally blackening the air, and the strange fetid odor which assailed one's nostrils, a ghastly odor, of all the dead things of the universe. It impelled the visitor to questions and then the residents would explain, quietly, that all this was made land, and that it had been made by using it as a dumping ground for the city garbage. After a few years the unpleasant effect of this would pass away, it was said. But meantime in hot weather, and especially when it rained, the flies were apt to be annoying. Was it not unhealthful? the stranger would ask, and the residents would answer, perhaps, but there is no telling. A little way farther on, and Jurgis and Ona, staring open-eyed and wondering, came to the place where this made ground was in the process of making. Here was a great hole, perhaps two city blocks square, and with long files of garbage wagons creeping into it. The place had an odor for which there are no polite words, and it was sprinkled over with children who raked in it from dawn till dark. Sometimes visitors from the packing-houses would wander out to see this dump, and they would stand by and debate as to whether the children were eating the food they got or merely collecting it for the chickens at home. Apparently none of them ever went down to find out. Beyond this dump there stood a great brickyard with smoking chimneys. First they took out the soil to make bricks, and then they filled it up again with garbage which seemed to Jurgis and Ona a felicitous arrangement, characteristic of an enterprising country like America. A little way beyond was another great hole, which they had emptied and not yet filled up. This held water, and all summer it stood there, with the nearby soil draining into it, festering and stewing in the sun, and then when winter came somebody cut the ice on it and sold it to the people of the city. This too seemed to the newcomers an economical arrangement, for they did not read the newspapers, and their heads were not full of troublesome thoughts about germs. They stood there while the sun went down upon this scene, and the sky in the west turned blood-red, and the tops of the houses shone like fire. Jurgis and Ona were not thinking of the sunset, however. Their backs were turned to it, and all their thoughts were of packing town which they could see so plainly in the distance. The line of the building stood clear-cut and black against the sky. Here and there, out of the mass, rose the great chimneys, with the river of smoke streaming away to the end of the world. It was a study in colors now, this smoke. In the sunset light it was black and brown and gray and purple. All the sordid suggestions of the place were gone. In the twilight it was a vision of power. To the two who stood watching while the darkness swallowed it up it seemed a dream of wonder, with its talc of human energy, of things being done, of employment for thousands upon thousands of men, of opportunity and freedom, of life and love and joy. When they came away, arm in arm, Jurgis was saying, "Tomorrow." I shall go there and get a job. End of chapter two. Recording by Tom Weiss.
Chapter Three of the Jungle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Chapter Three. In his capacity as delicatessen vendor, Jakubus Shedvilas had many acquaintances. Among these was one of the special policemen employed by Durham whose duty it frequently was to pick out men for employment. Jokubis had never tried it, but he expressed a certainty that he could get some of his friends a job through this man. It was agreed, after consultation, that he should make the effort with old Antanas and with Jonas. Jurgis was confident of his ability to get work for himself, unassisted by anyone. As we have said before, he was not mistaken in this. He had gone to Brown's and stood there not more than half an hour before one of the bosses noticed his form towering above the rest, and signaled to him. The colloquy which followed was brief and to the point. Speak English? No. Lithuanian. Jurgis had studied this word carefully. Job? J a nod. Worked here before? No stand. Signals and gesticulations on the part of the boss. Vigorous shakes of the head by Jurgis. Shovel guts? No stand. More shakes of the head. Sarnos. Pagechtis. Schluafa. Imitative motions. J. See door? Doris, pointing. J. Tomorrow, seven o'clock. Understand? Freitoy, fresh petes, septinye, decoy. Tamishte. Thank you, sir. And that was all. Jurgis turned away, and then, in a sudden rush, the full realization of his triumph swept over him, and he gave a yell and a jump and started off on a run. He had a job. He had a job. And he went all the way home as if upon wings, and burst into the house like a cyclone, to the rage of the numerous lodgers who had just turned in for their daily sleep. Meantime, Jokubas had been to see his friend the policeman, and received encouragement, so it was a happy party. There being no more to be done that day, the shop was left under the care of Lucia, and her husband sallied forth to show his friends the sights of Packingtown. Jokubis did this with the air of a country gentleman escorting a party of visitors over his estate. He was an old-time resident, and all these wonders had grown up under his eyes, and he had a personal pride in them. The packers might own the land, but he claimed the landscape and there was no one to say nay to this. They passed down the busy street that led to the yards. It was still early morning, and everything was at its high tide of activity. A steady stream of employees was pouring through the gate, employees of the higher sort, at this hour, clerks and stenographers and such. For the women there were waiting big two-horse wagons, which set off at a gallop as fast as they were filled. In the distance there was heard again the lowing of cattle, a sound as of a far-off ocean calling. They followed it this time, as eager as children in sight of a circus menagerie, which indeed the scene a good deal resembled. They crossed the railroad tracks, and then on each side of the street were the pens full of cattle. They would have stopped to look, but Jokubis hurried them on to where there was a stairway and a raised gallery from which everything could be seen. Here they stood, staring, breathless with wonder. There is over a square mile of space in the yards, and more than half of it is occupied by cattle pens. North and south, as far as the eye can reach, there stretches a sea of pens. And they were all filled, so many cattle no one had ever dreamed existed in the world. Red cattle, black, white, and yellow cattle, old cattle and young cattle, 
great bellowing bulls and little calves not an hour born, meek-eyed milk cows and fierce long-horned Texas steers. The sound of them here was as of all the barnyards of the universe, and as for counting them, it would have taken all day simply to count the pens. Here and there ran long alleys, blocked at intervals by gates, and Yokubis told them that the number of these gates was twenty-five thousand. Yokubis had recently been reading a newspaper article which was full of statistics such as that, and he was very proud as he repeated them and made his guests cry out with wonder. Jorgis, too, had a little of this sense of pride. Had he not just gotten a job and become a sharer in all this activity, a cog in this marvelous machine? Here and there about the alleys galloped men upon horseback, booted and carrying long whips. They were very busy calling to each other and to those who were driving the cattle. They were drovers and stock-raisers who had come from far states, and brokers and commission merchants and buyers for all the big packing-houses. Here and there they would stop to inspect a bunch of cattle, and there would be a parley, brief and businesslike. The buyer would nod or drop his whip, and that would mean a bargain, and he would note it in his little book, along with hundreds of others he had made that morning. Then Yokubis pointed out the place where the cattle were driven to be weighed, upon a great scale that would weigh a hundred thousand pounds at once and record it automatically. It was near to the east entrance that they stood, and all along this east side of the yards ran the railroad tracks into which the cars were run, loaded with cattle. All night long this had been going on, and now the pens were full. By tonight they would all be empty, and the same thing would be done again. "'And what will become of all these creatures?' cried Teta Elzbeta. "'By tonight,' Jokubis answered, "'they will all be killed and cut up, and over there on the other side of the packing-houses are more railroad tracks.' where the cars come to take them away. There were two hundred and fifty miles of track within the yards, their guide went on to tell them. They brought about ten thousand head of cattle every day, and as many hogs, and half as many sheep, which meant some eight or ten million live creatures turned into food every year. One stood and watched and little by little caught the drift of the tide as it set in the direction of the packing-houses. There were groups of cattle being driven to the chutes, which were roadways about fifteen feet wide, raised high above the pens. In these chutes the stream of animals was continuous. It was quite uncanny to watch them, pressing on to their fate, all unsuspicious a very river of death. Our friends were not poetical and the sight suggested to them no metaphors of human destiny. They thought only of the wonderful efficiency of it all. The chutes into which the hogs went climbed high up to the very top of the distant buildings, and Yokubis explained that the hogs went up by the power of their own legs, and then their weight carried them back through all the processes necessary to make them into pork. "'They don't waste anything here,' said the guide, and then he laughed, and added a witticism, which he was pleased that his unsophisticated friends should take to be his own. They use everything about the hog except the squeal. In front of Brown's general office building there grows a tiny plot of grass, and this, you may learn, is the only bit of green thing in Packingtown. Likewise, this jest about the hog and his squeal, the stock in trade of all the guides, is the one gleam of humor that you will find there. After they had seen enough of the pens, the party went up the street to the mass of buildings which occupy the center of the yards. These buildings, made of brick and stained with innumerable layers of packing town smoke, were painted all over with advertising signs, from which the visitor realized suddenly that he had come to the home of many of the torments of his life. It was here that they made those products with the wonders of which they pestered him so, by placards that defaced the landscape when he traveled, and by staring advertisements in the newspapers and magazines, 
by silly little jingles that he could not get out of his mind, and gaudy pictures that lurked for him around every street corner. Here was where they made Brown's imperial hams and bacon, Brown's dressed beef, Brown's excelsior sausages. Here was the headquarters of Durham's pure leaf lard, of Durham's breakfast bacon, Durham's canned beef, potted ham, devil chicken, peerless fertilizer. Entering one of the Durham buildings, they found a number of other visitors waiting, and before long there came a guide to escort them through the place. They make a great feature of showing strangers through the packing plants, for it is a good advertisement. But Ponus Jacobus whispered maliciously that the visitors did not see any more than the packers wanted them to. They climbed a long series of stairways outside of the building, to the top of its five or six stories. Here was the chute with its river of hogs, all patiently toiling upward. There was a place for them to rest, to cool off, and then through another passageway they went into a room from which there is no returning for hogs. It was a long, narrow room, with a gallery along it for visitors. At the head there was a great iron wheel, about twenty feet in circumference, with rings here and there along its edge. Upon both sides of this wheel there was a narrow space, into which came the hogs at the end of their journey. In the midst of them stood a great burly negro, bare-armed and bare-chested. He was resting for the moment, for the wheel had stopped while the men were cleaning up. In a minute or two, however, it began slowly to revolve, and then the men upon each side of it sprang to work. They had chains which they fastened about the leg of the nearest hog, and the other end of the chain they hooked into one of the rings upon the wheel. So as the wheel turned, a hog was suddenly jerked off his feet and borne aloft. At the same instant the car was assailed by a most terrifying shriek. The visitors started in alarm, the women turned pale and shrank back. The shriek was followed by another, louder and yet more agonizing, for once started upon that journey the hog never came back. At the top of the wheel he was shunted off upon a trolley and went sailing down the room. And meantime another was swung up, and then another, and another, until there was a double line of them, each dangling by a foot and kicking in frenzy and squealing. The uproar was appalling, perilous to the eardrums. One feared there was too much sound for the room to hold, that the walls must give way or the ceiling crack. There were high squeals and low squeals, grunts and wails of agony. There would come a momentary lull and then a fresh outburst, louder than ever, surging up to a deafening climax. It was too much for some of the visitors. The men would look at each other, laughing nervously and the women would stand with hands clenched and the blood rushing to their faces and the tears starting in their eyes. Meantime, heedless of all these things, the men upon the floor were going about their work. Neither squeals of hogs nor tears of visitors made any difference to them. One by one they hooked up the hogs, and one by one, with a swift stroke, they slit their throats. There was a long line of hogs, with squeals and life-blood ebbing away together, until at last each started again and vanished with a splash into a huge vat of boiling water. It was also very businesslike that one watched it fascinated. It was pork-making by machinery, pork-making by applied mathematics. And yet, somehow, the most matter-of-fact person could not help thinking of the hogs. They were so innocent, they came so very trustingly, and they were so very human in their protests, and so perfectly within their rights. They had done nothing to deserve it, and it was adding insult to injury, as the thing was done here, swinging them up in this cold-blooded impersonal way, without a pretense of apology, without the homage of a tear. Now and then a visitor wept, to be sure, but this slaughtering machine ran on, visitors or no visitors. 
It was like some horrible crime committed in a dungeon, all unseen and unheeded, buried out of sight and out of memory. One could not stand and watch very long without becoming philosophical, without beginning to deal in symbols and similes, and to hear the hog squeal of the universe. Was it permitted to believe that there was nowhere upon the earth or above the earth a heaven for hogs where they were requited for all this suffering? Each one of these hogs was a separate creature. Some were white hogs, some were black, some were brown, some were spotted, some were old, some young, some were long and lean, some were monstrous, and each of them had an individuality of his own, a will of his own, a hope and a heart's desire. Each was full of self-confidence, of self-importance, and a sense of dignity. And trusting and strong in faith he had gone about his business, the while a black shadow hung over him, and a horrid fate waited in his pathway. Now suddenly it had swooped upon him, and had seized him by the leg. Relentless, remorseless it was. All his protests, his screams, were nothing to it. It did its cruel will with him, as if his wishes, his feelings, had simply no existence at all. It cut his throat and watched him gasp out of his life. And now was one to believe that there was nowhere a god of hogs to whom this hog personality was precious, to whom these hog squeals and agonies had a meaning? Who would take this hog into his arms and comfort him, reward him for his work well done, and show him the meaning of his sacrifice? Perhaps some glimpse of all this was in the thoughts of our humble-minded Jorgis, as he turned to go on with the rest of the party, and muttered, Diev, but I'm glad I'm not a hog. The carcass hog was scooped out of the vat by machinery, and then it fell to the second floor, passing on the way through a wonderful machine with numerous scrapers, which adjusted themselves to the size and shape of the animal and sent it out at the other end with nearly all of its bristles removed. It was then again strung up by machinery, and sent upon another trolley ride, this time passing between two lines of men, who sat upon a raised platform, each doing a certain single thing to the carcass as it came to him. One scraped the outside of a leg, another scraped the inside of the same leg. One, with a swift stroke, cut the throat, Another, with two swift strokes, severed the head, which fell to the floor and vanished through a hole. Another made a slit down the body. A second opened the body wider. A third, with a saw, cut the breastbone. A fourth loosened the entrails. A fifth pulled them out, and they also slid through a hole in the floor. There were men to scrape each side and men to scrape the back. There were men to clean the carcass inside to trim it and wash it. Looking down this room one saw, creeping slowly, a line of dangling hogs a hundred yards in length, and for every yard there was a man, working as if a demon were after him. At the end of this hog's progress every inch of the carcass had been gone over several times, and then it was rolled into the chilling room, where it stayed for twenty-four hours and where a stranger might lose himself in a forest of freezing hogs. Before the carcass was admitted here, however, it had to pass a government inspector, who sat in the doorway and felt of the glands in the neck for tuberculosis. This government inspector did not have the manner of a man who was worked to death. He was apparently not haunted by a fear that the hog might get by him before he had finished his testing. If you were a sociable person, he was quite willing to enter into conversation with you, and to explain to you the deadly nature of the tomains which are found in tubercular pork, and while he was talking with you you could hardly be so ungrateful as to notice that a dozen carcasses were passing him, untouched. This inspector wore a blue uniform with brass buttons, and he gave an atmosphere of authority to the scene and, as it were, put the stamp of official approval upon the things which were done in Durham's. 
Jurgis went down the line with the rest of the visitors, staring open-mouthed, lost in wonder. He had dressed hogs himself in the forest of Lithuania, but he had never expected to live to see one hog dressed by several hundred men. It was like a wonderful poem to him, and he took it all in guilelessly, even to the conspicuous signs demanding immaculate cleanliness of the employees. Jurgis was vexed when the cynical Jokubis translated these signs with sarcastic comments offering to take them to the secret rooms where the spoiled meats went to be doctored. The party descended to the next floor, where the various waste materials were treated. Here came the entrails, to be scraped and washed clean for sausage casings. Men and women worked here in the midst of a sickening stench, which caused the visitors to hasten by, gasping. To another room came all the scraps to be tanked, which meant boiling and pumping off the grease to make soap and lard. Below they took out the refuse, and this too was a region in which the visitors did not linger. In still other places men were engaged in cutting up the carcasses that had been through the chilling rooms. First there were the splitters, the most expert workmen in the plant, who earned as high as fifty cents an hour, and did not a thing all day except chop hogs down the middle. Then there were cleaver men, great giants with muscles of iron. Each had two men to attend him, to slide the half-carcass in front of him on the table and hold it while he chopped it, and then turn each piece so that he might chop it once more. His cleaver had a blade about two feet long, and he never made but one cut. He made it so neatly, too, that his implement did not smite through and dull itself. There was just enough force for a perfect cut, and no more. So through various yawning holes there slipped to the floor below, to one room hams, to another four quarters, to another sides of pork. One might go down to this floor and see the pickling rooms, where the hams were put into vats, and the great smoke-rooms with their air-tight iron doors. In other rooms they prepared salt pork. There were whole cellars full of it, built up in great towers to the ceiling. In yet other rooms they were putting up meat in boxes and barrels, and wrapping hams and bacon in oiled paper, sealing and labeling and sewing them. From the doors of these rooms went men with loaded trucks, to the platform where freight cars were waiting to be filled, and one went out there and realized with a start that he had come at last to the ground floor of this enormous building. Then the party went across the street to where they did the killing of beef, where every hour they turned four or five hundred cattle into meat. Unlike the place they had left, all this work was done on one floor, and instead of there being one line of carcasses which moved to the workmen there were fifteen or twenty lines, and the men moved from one to another of these. This made a scene of intense activity a picture of human power wonderful to watch. It was all in one great room, like a circus amphitheater, with a gallery for visitors running over the center. Along one side of the room ran a narrow gallery, a few feet from the floor, into which gallery the cattle were driven by men with goads which gave them electric shocks. Once crowded in there the creatures were prisoned, each in a separate pen by gates that shut, leaving them no room to turn around, and while they stood billowing and plunging, over the top of the pen there leaned one of the knockers, armed with a sledgehammer, and watching for a chance to deal a blow. The room echoed with thuds in quick succession, and the stamping and kicking of the steers. The instant the animal had fallen the knocker passed on to another, while a second man raised a lever and the side of the pen was raised, and the animal, still kicking and struggling, slid out to the killing bed. Here a man put shackles about one leg, and pressed another lever, and the body was jerked up into the air. There were fifteen or twenty such pens, and it was a matter of only a couple of minutes to knock 
fifteen or twenty cattle and rolled them out. Then once more the gates were open and another lot rushed in, and so out of each pen there rolled a steady stream of carcasses, which the men upon the killing beds had to get out of the way. The manner in which they did this was something to be seen and never forgotten. They worked with furious intensity, literally upon the run, at a pace with which there is nothing to be compared except a football game. It was all highly specialized labor, each man having his task to do. Generally this would consist of only two or three specific cuts, and he would pass down the line of fifteen or twenty carcasses, making these cuts upon each. First there came the butcher, to bleed them. This meant one swift stroke, so swift that you could not see it, only the flash of the knife, and before you could realize it the man had darted on to the next line, and a stream of bright red was pouring out upon the floor. This floor was half an inch deep with blood, in spite of the best efforts of men who kept shoveling it through holes. It must have made the floor slippery, but no one could have guessed this by watching the men at work. The carcass hung for a few minutes to bleed. There was no time lost, however, for there were several hanging in each line, and one was always ready. It was let down to the ground, and there came the headsman, whose task it was to sever the head with two or three swift strokes. Then came the floorsman to make the first cut in the skin, and then another to finish ripping the skin down the center, and then half a dozen more in swift succession to finish the skinning. After they were through the carcasses were again swung up, and while a man with a stick examined the skin to make sure that it had not been cut, and another rolled its tip and tumbled it through one of the inevitable holes in the floor, the beef proceeded on its journey. There were men to cut it, and men to split it, and men to gut it and scrape it clean inside. There were some with hoes which threw jets of boiling water upon it, and others who removed the feet and added the final touches. In the end, as with the hogs, the finished beef was run into the chilling room to hang its appointed time. The visitors were taken there and shown them, all neatly hung in rows, labeled conspicuously with the tags of the government inspectors, and some which had been killed by a special process marked with the sign of the kosher rabbi, certifying that it was fit for sale to the orthodox. And then the visitors were taken to the other parts of the building, to see what became of each particle of the waste material that had vanished through the floor and to the pickling rooms, and the salting rooms, the canning rooms, and the packing rooms, where choice meat was prepared for shipping in refrigerator cars, destined to be eaten in all the four corners of civilization. Afterward they went outside, wandering about among the mazes of buildings in which was done the work auxiliary to this great industry. There was scarcely a thing needed in the business that Durham and company did not make for themselves. There was a great steam power plant and an electricity plant. There was a barrel factory and a boiler repair shop. There was a building to which the grease was piped and made into soap and lard, and then there was a factory for making lard cans and another for making soap boxes. There was a building in which the bristles were cleaned and dried for the making of hair cushions and such things. There was a building where the skins were dried and tanned. There was another where heads and feet were made into glue, and another where bones were made into fertilizer. No tiniest particle of organic matter was wasted in Durham's. Out of the horns of cattle they made combs, buttons, hairpins, and imitation ivory. Out of the shin bones and other big bones they cut knife and toothbrush handles, and mouthpieces for pipes. Out of the hoofs they cut hairpins and buttons before they made the rest into glue. From such things as feet, knuckles, hide clippings, and sinews came such strange and unlikely products as gelatin, isinglass, and phosphorus, bone black, shoe blacking, and bone oil. 
they had curled hair works for the cattle tails and a wool pullery for the sheepskins they made pepsin from the stomachs of the pigs and albumen from the blood and violin strings from the ill-smelling entrails when there was nothing else to be done with a thing they first put it into a tank and got out of it all the tallow and grease and then they made it into fertilizer all these industries were gathered into buildings nearby connected by galleries and railroads with the main establishment and it was estimated that they had handled nearly a quarter of a billion animals since the founding of the plant by the elder durham a generation or more ago if you counted with it the other big plants and they were now really all one it was so jacobus informed them the greatest aggregation of labor and capital ever gathered in one place it employed thirty thousand men it supported directly two hundred and fifty thousand people in its neighborhood and indirectly it supported half a million it sent its products to every country in the civilized world and it furnished the food for no less than thirty million people to all these things our friends would listen open mouthed it seemed to them impossible of belief that anything so stupendous could have been devised by mortal man that was why to jurgis it seemed almost profanity to speak about the place as did jokubas skeptically it was a thing as tremendous as the universe the laws and ways of its workings no more than the universe to be questioned or understood all that a mere man could do it seemed to jurgis was to take a thing like this as he found it and do as he was told to be given a place in it and a share in its wonderful activities was a blessing to be grateful for as one was grateful for the sunshine and the rain jurgis was even glad that he had not seen the place before meeting with his triumph for he felt that the size of it would have overwhelmed him but now he had been admitted he was a part of it all he had the feeling that this whole huge establishment had taken him under its protection and had become responsible for his welfare so guileless was he and ignorant of the nature of business that he did not even realize that he had become an employee of brown's and that brown and durham were supposed by all the world to be deadly rivals were even required to be deadly rivals by the law of the land and ordered to try to ruin each other under penalty of fine and imprisonment End of chapter 3 Recording by Tom Weiss Chapter 4 of The Jungle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss The Jungle by Upton Sinclair Chapter 4 Promptly at seven the next morning Jurgis reported for work. He came to the door that had been pointed out to him, and there he waited for nearly two hours. The boss had meant for him to enter, but had not said this, and so it was only when on his way out to hire another man that he came upon Jurgis. He gave him a good cussing, but as Jurgis did not understand a word of it he did not object. He followed the boss who showed him where to put his street clothes, and waited while he donned the working clothes he had bought in a second-hand shop and brought with him in a bundle. Then he led him to the killing beds. The work which Jurgis was to do here was very simple, and it took him but a few minutes to learn it. He was provided with a strip de somme, such as is used by street sweepers, and it was his place to follow down the line the man who drew out the smoking entrails from the carcass of the steer. This mass was to be swept into a trap, which was then closed, so that no one might slip into it. As Jurgis came in, the first cattle of the morning were just making their appearance, and so, with scarcely time to look about him, and none to speak to anyone, he fell to work. It was a sweltering day in July 
and the place ran with steaming hot blood. One waited in it on the floor. The stench was almost overpowering, but to Jurgis it was nothing. His soul was dancing with joy. He was at work at last. He was at work and earning money. All day long he was figuring to himself. He was paid the fabulous sum of seventeen and a half cents an hour, and as it proved a rush day and he worked until nearly seven o'clock in the evening, he went home to the family with the tidings that he had earned more than a dollar and a half in a single day. At home also there was more good news, so much of it at once that there had been quite a celebration in Adelaide's hall bedroom. Jonas had been to have an interview with the special policeman to whom Shedvilis had introduced him, and had taken him to see several of the bosses, with the result that one had promised him a job the beginning of the next week. And then there was Maria Barczynskas, who, fired with jealousy by the success of Jurgis, had set out upon her own responsibility to get a job. Maria had nothing to take with her save her two brawny arms and the word job, laboriously learned. But with these she had marched about Packingtown all day, entering every door where there seemed signs of activity. Out of some she had been ordered with curses, but Maria was not afraid of man or devil, and asked everyone she saw, visitors and strangers, or work people like herself, and once or twice even high and lofty office personages, who stared at her as if they thought she was crazy. In the end, however, she had reaped her reward. In one of the smaller plants she had stumbled upon a room where scores of women and girls were sitting at long tables preparing smoked beef in cans, and wandering through room after room Maria came at last to the place where the sealed cans were being painted and labeled, and here she had the good fortune to encounter the forelady. Maria did not understand then, as she was destined to understand later, what there was attractive to a forelady about the combination of a face full of boundless good nature and the muscles of a dray horse. But the woman had told her to come the next day, and she would perhaps give her a chance to learn the trade of painting cans. The painting of cans being skilled piecework and paying as much as two dollars a day, Maria burst in upon the family with the yell of a Comanche Indian, and fell to capering about the room so as to frighten the baby almost into convulsions. Better luck than all this could hardly have been hoped for. There was only one of them left to seek a place. Jurgis was determined that Teta Elsbeta should stay at home to keep house, and that Ona should help her. He would not have Ona working. He was not that sort of man, he said and she was not that sort of a woman. It would be a strange thing if a man like him could not support the family, with the help of the board of Jonas and Maria. He would not even hear of letting the children go to work. There were schools here in America for children, Jorgis had heard, to which they would go for nothing. That the priest would object to these schools was something of which he had as yet no idea, and for the present his mind was made up that the children of Teta Elsbeda should have as fair a chance as any other children. The oldest of them, little Stanislavus, was but thirteen, and small for his age at that. And while the oldest son of Shedvilas was only twelve and had worked for over a year at Jones's, Jurgis would have it that Stanislavus should learn to speak English and grow up to be a skilled man. So there was only old Dede Antonas. Jurgis would have had him rest, too. But he was forced to acknowledge that this was not possible, and besides, the old man would not hear it spoken of. It was his whim to insist that he was as lively as any boy. He had come to America as full of hope as the best of them, and now he was the chief problem that worried his son. For everyone that Jurgis spoke to assured him that it was a waste of time to seek employment for the old man in Packingtown. Shedvilas told him that the packers did not even keep the men who had grown old in their own service, to say nothing of taking on new ones. And not only was it the rule here, it was the rule 
everywhere in America, so far as he knew. To satisfy Jurgis, he had asked the policeman, and brought back the message that the thing was not to be thought of. They had not told this to old Antony, who had consequently spent the two days wandering about from one part of the yards to another, and had now come home to hear about the triumph of the others, smiling bravely and saying that it would be his turn another day. Their good luck, they felt, had given them the right to think about a home. And sitting out on the doorstep that summer evening, they held consultation about it, and Jurgis took occasion to broach a weighty subject. Passing down the avenue to work that morning, he had seen two boys leaving an advertisement from house to house, and seeing that there were pictures upon it, Jurgis had asked for one, and had rolled it up and tucked it into his shirt. At noontime a man with whom he had been talking had read it to him and told him a little about it, with the result that Jurgis had conceived a wild idea. He brought out the placard, which was quite a work of art. It was nearly two feet long, printed on calendared paper, with a selection of colors so bright that they shone even in the moonlight. The center of the placard was occupied by a house, brilliantly painted, new and dazzling. The roof of it was of a purple hue and trimmed with gold. The house itself was silvery and the doors and windows red. It was a two-story building with a porch in front and a very fancy scrollwork about the edges. It was complete in every tiniest detail, even the doorknob, and there was a hammock on the porch and white lace curtains in the windows. Underneath this, in one corner, was a picture of a husband and wife in loving embrace. In the opposite corner was a cradle with fluffy curtains drawn over it, and a smiling cherub hovering upon silver-colored wings. For fear that the significance of all this should be lost, there was a label, in Polish, Lithuanian, and German, Thom, Namai, Heim. Why pay rent, the linguistic circular went on to demand. Why not own your own home? Do you know that you can buy one for less than your rent? We have built thousands of homes which are now occupied by happy families. So it became eloquent, picturing the blissfulness of married life in a house with nothing to pay. It even quoted, Home, sweet home, and made bold to translate it into Polish, though for some reason it omitted the Lithuanian of this. Perhaps the translator found it a difficult matter to be sentimental in a language in which a sob is known as a kukchoimus and a smile as a nuseshipshoimus. Over this document the family pored long, while Ona spelled out its contents. It appeared that this house contained four rooms, besides a basement, and that it might be bought for fifteen hundred dollars the lot, and all. Of this only three hundred dollars had to be paid down, the balance being paid at the rate of twelve dollars a month. These were frightful sums, but then they were in America, where people talked about such without fear. They had learned that they would have to pay a rent of nine dollars a month for a flat, and there was no way of doing better unless the family of twelve was to exist in one or two rooms, as at present. If they paid rent, of course, they might pay forever and be no better off, whereas if they could only meet the extra expense in the beginning, there would at last come a time when they would not have any rent to pay for the rest of their lives. They figured it up. There was a little left of the money belonging to Teta Elzbieta, and there was a little left to Jurgis. Maria had about fifty dollars pinned up somewhere in her stockings, and Grandfather Antony had part of the money he had gotten for his farm. If they all combined they would have enough to make the first payment, and if they had employment so that they could be sure of a future it might really prove to be the best plan. It was, of course, not a thing even to be talked of lightly. It was a thing they would have to sift to the bottom. And yet, on the other hand, if they were going to make the venture, the sooner they did it, the better, for were they not paying rent all the time and living in a most horrible way besides? Jurgis was used to dirt 
there was nothing could scare a man who had been with a railroad gang, where one could gather up the fleas off the floor of the sleeping room by the handful. But that sort of thing would not do for Ona. They must have a better place of some sort soon. Jurgis said it with all the assurance of a man who had just made a dollar and fifty-seven cents in a single day. Jurgis was at a loss to understand why, with wages as they were, so many of the people of this district should live the way they did. The next day Maria went to see her forelady and was told to report the first of the week and learn the business of can-painter. Maria went home singing out loud all the way, and was just in time to join Ona and her stepmother as they were setting out to go and make inquiry concerning the house. That evening the three made their report to the men. The thing was altogether as represented in the circular, or at any rate so the agent had said. The houses lay to the south, about a mile and a half from the yards. They were wonderful bargains, the gentleman had assured them, personally and for their own good. He could do this, so he explained to them, for the reason that he had himself no interest in their sale. He was merely the agent for a company that had built them. These were the last, and the company was going out of business, so if anyone wished to take advantage of this wonderful no-rent plan he would have to be very quick. As a matter of fact, there was just a little uncertainty as to whether there was a single house left for the agent had taken so many people to see them, and for all he knew the company might have parted with the last. Seeing Teta Elzbeta's evident grief at this news, he added, after some hesitation, that if they really intended to make a purchase he would send a telephone message at his own expense and have one of the houses kept. So it had finally been arranged, and they were to go and make an inspection the following Sunday morning that was Thursday, and all the rest of the week the killing gang at Brown's worked at full pressure, and Jurgis cleared a dollar seventy-five every day. That was at the rate of ten and one-half dollars a week, or forty-five a month. Jurgis was not able to figure, except it was a very simple sum, but Ona was like lightning at such things, and she worked out the problem for the family. Maria and Jonas were each to pay sixteen dollars a month board, and the old man insisted that he could do the same as soon as he got a place, which might be any day now. That would make ninety-three dollars. Then Maria and Jonas were between them to take a third share in the house, which would leave only eight dollars a month for Jurgis to contribute to the payment. So they would have eighty-five dollars a month, or, supposing that Dede Antanas did not get work at once, seventy dollars a month, which ought surely to be sufficient for the support of a family of twelve. An hour before the time on Sunday morning the entire party set out. They had the address written on a piece of paper which they showed to someone now and then. It proved to be a long mile and a half, but they walked it, and half an hour or so later the agent put in an appearance. He was a smooth and florid personage, elegantly dressed, and he spoke their language freely, which gave him a great advantage in dealing with them. He escorted them to the house, which was one of a long row of the typical frame dwellings of the neighborhood, where architecture is a luxury that is dispensed with. Ona's heart sank, for the house was not as it was shown in the picture. The color scheme was different, for one thing and then it did not seem quite so big. Still it was freshly painted, and made a considerable show. It was all brand new, so the agent told them, but he talked so incessantly that they were quite confused, and did not have time to ask many questions. There were all sorts of things they had made up their minds to inquire about, but when the time came they either forgot them or lacked the courage. The other houses in the row did not seem to be new, and few of them seemed to be occupied. When they ventured to hint at this, the agent's reply was that the purchasers would be moving in shortly. To press the matter would have seemed to be doubting his word, and never in their lives had any one of them ever spoken to a person of the class called 
gentlemen, except with deference and humility. The house had a basement about two feet below the street line, and a single story about six feet above it, reached by a flight of steps. In addition there was an attic made by the peak of a roof, and having one small window in each end. The street in front of the house was unpaved and unlighted, and the view from it consisted of a few exactly similar houses, scattered here and there upon lots grown up with dingy brown weeds. The house inside contained four rooms, plastered white. The basement was but a frame, the walls being unplastered and the floor not laid. The agent explained that the houses were built that way, as the purchasers generally preferred to finish the basements to suit their own taste. The attic was also unfinished. The family had been figuring that in case of an emergency they could rent this attic, but they found that there was not even a floor, nothing but joists, and beneath them the lath and plaster of the ceiling below. All of this, however, did not chill their ardor as much as might have been expected, because of the volubility of the agent. There was no end to the advantages of the house, as he set them forth, and he was not silent for an instant. He showed them everything, down to the locks on the doors and the catches on the windows, and how to work them. He showed them the sink in the kitchen, with running water and a faucet, something which Teta Elzbeta had never in her wildest dreams hoped to possess. After a discovery such as that it would have seemed ungrateful to find any fault, and so they tried to shut their eyes to other defects. Still they were peasant people, and they hung on to their money by instinct. It was quite in vain that the agent hinted at promptness. They would see. They would see, they told him. They could not decide until they had had more time. And so they went home again, and all day and evening there was figuring and debating. It was an agony to them to have to make up their minds in a matter such as this. They never could agree altogether. There were so many arguments upon each side, and one would be obstinate, and no sooner would the rest have convinced him than it would transpire that his arguments had caused another to waver. Once in the evening, when they were all in harmony and the house was as good as bought, Shedvilas came in and upset them again. Shedvilas had no use for property-owning. He told them cruel stories of people who had been done to death in this buying-a-home swindle. They would be almost sure to get into a tight place and lose all their money, and there was no end of expense that one could never foresee, and the house might be good for nothing from top to bottom. How was a poor man to know? Then, too, they would swindle you with the contract, and how was a poor man to understand anything about a contract? It was all nothing but robbery, and there was no safety but in keeping out of it. "'And pay rent?' asked Jorgis. "'Ah, yes, to be sure,' the other answered. "'That, too, was robbery. It was all robbery, for a poor man.' After half an hour of such depressing conversation they had their minds quite made up that they had been saved at the brink of a precipice, but then Shedvilis went away, and Jonas who was a sharp little man, reminded them that the delicatessen business was a failure, according to its proprietor, and that this might account for his pessimistic views, which, of course, reopened the subject. The controlling factor was that they could not stay where they were. They had to go somewhere, and when they gave up the house plan and decided to rent, the prospect of paying out nine dollars a month forever they found just as hard to face. All day and all night for nearly a whole week they wrestled with the problem, and then in the end Jurgis took the responsibility. Brother Jonas had gotten his job, and was pushing a truck in Durham's, and the killing gang at Brown's continued to work early and late, so that Jurgis grew more confident every hour more certain of his mastership. It was the kind of thing the man of the family had to decide and carry through, he told himself. Others might have failed at it, but he was not the failing kind. He would show them how to do it. 
He would work all day and all night, too, if need be. He would never rest until the house was paid for and his people had a home. So he told them, and so in the end the decision was made. They had talked about looking at more houses before they made the purchase, but then they did not know where any more were, and they did not know any way of finding out. The one they had seen held the sway in their thoughts. Whenever they thought of themselves in a house, it was this house that they thought of. And so they went and told the agent that they were ready to make the agreement. They knew as an abstract proposition that in matters of business all men are to be accounted liars, but they could not but have been influenced by all they had heard from the eloquent agent and were quite persuaded that the house was something they had run a risk of losing by their delay. They drew a deep breath when he told them that they were still in time. They were to come on the morrow, and he would have the papers all drawn up. This matter of papers was one in which Jurgis understood to the full the need of caution, yet he could not go himself. Everyone told him that he could not get a holiday, and that he might lose his job by asking. So there was nothing to be done but to trust it to the women, was Shed Vilas who promised to go with them. Jurgis spent the whole evening impressing upon them the seriousness of the occasion, and then finally, out of innumerable hiding-places about their persons and in their baggage, came forth the precious wads of money, to be done up tightly in a little bag and sewed fast in the lining of Teta Elsbeta's dress. Early in the morning they sallied forth. Jurgis had given them so many instructions and warned them against so many perils that the women were quite pale with fright, and even the imperturbable delicatessen vendor, who prided himself upon being a businessman, was ill at ease. The agent had the deed all ready, and invited them to sit down and read it. This Shedvilas proceeded to do, a painful and laborious process, during which the agent drummed upon the desk. Teta Elsbeda was so embarrassed that the perspiration came out upon her forehead in beads, for was not this reading as much as to say plainly to the gentleman's face that they doubted his honesty? Yet Jokubus Shedvilas read on and on, and presently there developed that he had good reason for doing so for a horrible suspicion had begun drawing in his mind. He knitted his brows more and more as he read. This was not a deed of sale at all, as far as he could see. It provided only for the renting of the property. It was hard to tell, with all this strange legal jargon, words he had never heard before, but was not this plain. The party of the first part hereby covenants and agrees to rent to the said party of the second part, and then again a monthly rental of twelve dollars for a period of eight years and four months. Then Shedvilas took off his spectacles and looked at the agent and stammered a question. The agent was most polite and explained that that was the usual formula, that it was always arranged that the property should be merely rented. He kept trying to show them something in the next paragraph, but Shedvilas could not get by the word rental, and when he translated it to Teta Elsbeta she too was thrown into a fright. They would not own the home at all, then for nearly nine years. The agent with infinite patience began to explain again, but no explanation would do now. Elsbeta had firmly fixed in her mind the last solemn warning of Jurgis. If there is anything wrong, do not give him the money, but go out and get a lawyer. It was an agonizing moment, but she sat in the chair, her hands clenched like death, and made a fearful effort, summoning all her powers, and gasped out her purpose. Jokubas translated her words. She expected the agent to fly into a passion but he was, to her bewilderment, as ever imperturbable. He even offered to go and get a lawyer for her, but she declined this, 
they went a long way, on purpose to find a man who would not be a confederate. Then let any one imagine their dismay when, after half an hour, they came in with a lawyer and heard him greet the agent by his first name. They felt that all was lost. They sat like prisoners, summoned to hear the reading of their death warrant. There was nothing more that they could do. They were trapped. The lawyer read over the deed, and when he had read it he informed Shedvilas that it was all perfectly regular, that the deed was a blank deed such as was often used in these sales. "'And was the price as agreed?' the old man asked, three hundred dollars down, and the balance at twelve dollars a month, till the total of fifteen hundred dollars had been paid? Yes, that was correct. And it was for the sale of such and such a house, the house and lot, and everything? Yes, and the lawyer showed him where that was all written, and it was all perfectly regular. There were no tricks about it of any sort. They were poor people, and this was all they had in the world, and if there was anything wrong they would be ruined. And so Shedvilas went on, asking one trembling question after another, while the eyes of the women folks were fixed upon him in mute agony. They could not understand what he was saying, but they knew that upon it their fate depended. And when at last he had questioned until there was no more questioning to be done, and the time came for them to make up their minds, and either close the bargain or reject it, it was all that poor Teta Elzbieta could do to keep from bursting into tears. Jokubas had asked her if she wished to sign. He had asked her twice, and what could she say? How did she know if this lawyer were telling the truth, that he was not in the conspiracy, and yet how could she say so? What excuse could she give? The eyes of every one in the room were upon her, awaiting her decision, and at last, half blind with her tears, she began fumbling in her jacket, where she had pinned the precious money, and she brought it out and unwrapped it before the men. All of this Ona sat watching from a corner of the room, twisting her hands together, meantime, in a fever of fright. Ona longed to cry out and tell her stepmother to stop, that it was all a trap, but there seemed to be something clutching her by the throat, and she could not make a sound. And so Teta Elzbeda laid the money on the table, and the agent picked it up and counted it, and then wrote them a receipt for it, and passed them the deed. Then he gave a sigh of satisfaction, and rose and shook hands with them all, still as smooth and polite as at the beginning. Ona had a dim recollection of the lawyer telling Shadvilas that his charge was a dollar, which occasioned some debate and more agony, and then, after they paid that too, they went out into the street, her stepmother clutching the deed in her hand. They were so weak from fright that they could not walk, but had to sit down on the way. So they went home, with a deadly terror gnawing at their souls, and that evening Jurgis came home and heard their story, and that was the end. Jurgis was sure that they had been swindled and were ruined, and he tore his hair and cursed like a madman, swearing that he would kill the agent that very night. In the end he seized the paper and rushed out of the house and all the way across the yards to Halstead Street. He dragged Shedvilas out from his supper and together they rushed to consult another lawyer. When they entered his office the lawyer sprang up, for Jurgis looked like a crazy person with flying hair and bloodshot eyes. His companion explained the situation, and the lawyer took the paper and began to read it, while Jurgis stood clutching the desk with knotted hands, trembling in every nerve. Once or twice the lawyer looked up and asked the question of Shedvilas. The other did not know a word that he was saying, but his eyes were fixed upon the lawyer's face, striving in an agony of dread to read his mind. He saw the lawyer look up and laugh, and he gave a gasp. The man said something to Shedvilas, and Jurgis turned upon his friend, his heart almost stopping. Well, he panted. He says it is all right, asked Shedvilas. All right? 
Yes, he says it is just as it should be. And Jurgis, in his relief, sank down into a chair. Are you sure of it? he gasped, and made Shadvilas translate question after question. He could not hear it often enough. He could not ask with enough variations. Yes, they had bought the house. They had really bought it. It belonged to them. They had only to pay the money, and it would be all right. Then Jurgis covered his face with his hands, for there were tears in his eyes, and he felt like a fool. But he had had such a horrible fright. Strong man as he was, it left him almost too weak to stand up. The lawyer explained that the rental was a form. The property was said to be merely rented until the last payment had been made, the purpose being to make it easier to turn the party out if he did not make the payments. So long as they paid, however, they had nothing to fear. The house was all theirs. Jurgis was so grateful that he paid the half-dollar the lawyer asked without winking an eyelash, and then rushed home to tell the news to the family. He found Ona in a faint and the babies screaming, and the whole house in an uproar, for it had been believed by all that he had gone to murder the agent. It was hours before the excitement could be calmed, and all through that cruel night Jurgis would wake up now and then and hear Ona and her stepmother in the next room, sobbing softly to themselves. End of chapter 4 Recording by Tom Weiss Chapter 5 of The Jungle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss The Jungle by Upton Sinclair Chapter 5 They had bought their home. It was hard for them to realize that the wonderful house was theirs to move into whenever they chose. They spent all their time thinking about it and what they were going to put into it. As their week with Anile was up in three days, they lost no time in getting ready. They had to make some shift to furnish it, and every instance of their leisure was given to discussing this. A person who had such a task before him would not need to look very far in Packingtown. He had only to walk up the avenue and read the signs, or get into a streetcar, to obtain full information as to pretty much everything a human creature could need. It was quite touching, the zeal of people to see that his health and happiness were provided for. Did the person wish to smoke? There was a little discourse about cigars, showing him exactly why the Thomas Jefferson five-cent Perfecto was the only cigar worthy of the name. Had he, on the other hand, smoked too much? Here was a remedy for the smoking habit, twenty-five cent doses for a quarter, and a cure absolutely guaranteed in ten doses. In innumerable ways such as this the traveler found that somebody had been busy to make smooth his pass through the world and to let him know what had been done for him. In Packingtown the advertisements had a style all of their own, adapted to the peculiar population. One would be tenderly solicitous. Is your wife pale? it would inquire. Is she discouraged? Does she drag herself about the house and find fault with everything? Why do you not tell her to try Dr. Lanahan's life preservers? Another would be jocular in tone, slapping you on the back, so to speak. Don't be a chump, it would exclaim. Go ahead and get the Goliath Bunyan cure. Get a move on you, would chime in another. It's easy if you wear the Eureka 250 shoe. Among these importunate signs was one that had caught the attention of the family by its pictures. It showed two very pretty little birds building themselves a home, and Maria had asked an acquaintance to read it to her, and told them that it related to the furnishing of the house. Feather your nest, it ran, and went on to say that it could furnish all the necessary feathers for a four-room nest for the ludicrously small sum of seventy-five dollars. The particularly important thing about this offer was that only a small part of the money need be had at once. The rest one might pay a few dollars every month. Our friends had to have some furniture. 
there was no getting away from that. But their little fund of money had sunk so low that they could hardly get to sleep at night, and so they fled to this as their deliverance. There was more agony and another paper for Elzbieta to sign, and then one night when Jurgis came home he was told the breathless tidings that the furniture had arrived and was safely stowed in the house, a parlor set of four pieces, a bedroom set of three pieces, a dining-room table and four chairs, a toilet set with beautiful pink roses painted all over it, an assortment of crockery also with pink roses, and so on. One of the plates in the set had been found broken when they unpacked it, and Ona was going to the store the first thing in the morning to make them change it. Also they had promised three saucepans, and there had only two come, and did Jurikus think that they were trying to cheat them? The next day they went to the house, and when the men came from work they ate a few hurried mouthfuls at Anilay's and then set to work at the task of carrying their belongings to their new home. The distance was in reality over two miles, but Jurgis made two trips that night, each time with a huge pile of mattresses and bedding on his head, with bundles of clothing and bags and things tied up inside. Anywhere else in Chicago he would have stood a chance of being arrested, but the policemen in Packingtown were apparently used to these informal movings, and contented themselves with a cursory examination now and then. It was quite wonderful to see how fine the house looked, with all the things in it, even by the dim light of a lamp. It was really home, and almost as exciting as the placard had described it. Ona was fairly dancing, and she and cousin Maria took Jurgis by the arm and escorted him from room to room, sitting in each chair by turns, and then insisting that he should do the same. One chair squeaked with his great weight, and they screamed with fright and woke the baby and brought everybody running. Altogether it was a great day, and tired as they were, Jurgis and Ona sat up late, contented simply to hold each other and gaze in rapture about the room. They were going to be married as soon as they could get everything settled, and a little spare money put by and this was to be their home. That little room yonder would be theirs. It was, in truth, a never-ending delight, the fixing up of this house. They had no money to spend for the pleasure of spending, but there were a few absolutely necessary things, and the buying of these was a perpetual adventure for Ona. It must always be done at night, so that Jurgis could go along, and even if it were only a pepper cruet, or half a dozen glasses for ten cents, that was enough for an expedition. On Saturday night they came along with a great basket full of things, and spread them out on the table while everyone stood round, and the children climbed up on the chairs or howled to be lifted up to see. There were sugar and salt and tea and crackers and a can of lard and a milk pail and a scrubbing brush and a pair of shoes for the second oldest boy and a can of oil and a tack hammer, and a pound of nails. These last were to be driven into the walls of the kitchen and the bedrooms to hang things on, and there was a family discussion as to the place where each one was to be driven. Then Jurgis would try to hammer, and hit his fingers because the hammer was too small, and get mad because Ona had refused to let him pay fifteen cents more and get a bigger hammer, and Ona would be invited to try it herself, and hurt her thumb and cry out, which necessitated the thumbs being kissed by Jurgis. Finally, after every one had had a try, the nails would be driven and something hung up. Jurgis had come home with a big packing-box on his head, and he sent Jonas to get another that he had bought. He meant to take one side out of these tomorrow and put shelves in them and make them into bureaus and places to keep things for the bedrooms. The nest, which had been advertised, had not included feathers for quite so many birds as there were in this family. They had, of course, put their dining-table in the kitchen, and the dining-room was used as the bedroom of Teta Elzbeta and five of her children. She and the two youngest slept in the only bed, and the other three had a mattress on the floor. Ona and her husband dragged a mattress into the parlor and slept at night and the three men and the oldest boy slept in the other room, having nothing but the very level floor to rest on for the present. Even so, however, they slept soundly, 
it was necessary for Teta Elzbieta to pound more than once on the floor at a quarter past five every morning. She would have ready a great pot full of steaming black coffee, and oatmeal and bread and smoked sausages, and then she would fix them their dinner pails with more thick slices of bread with lard between them, they could not afford butter, and some onions and a piece of cheese, and so they would tramp away to work. This was the first time in his life that he had ever really worked, it seemed to Jurgis. It was the first time that he had ever had anything to do which took all he had in him. Jurgis had stood with the rest up in the gallery and watched the men on the killing beds marveling at their speed and power as if they had been wonderful machines. It somehow never occurred to him to think of the flesh and blood side of it, that is, not until he actually got down into the pit and took off his coat. Then he saw things in a different light. He got at the inside of them. The pace they set here, it was one that called for every faculty of a man, from the instant the first steer fell till the sounding of the noon whistle, and again from half-past twelve till heaven only knew what hour in the late afternoon or evening. There was never one instant's rest for a man, for his hand or his eye or his brain. Jurgis saw how they managed it. There were portions of the work which determined the pace of the rest, and for these they had picked men whom they paid high wages, and whom they changed frequently. You might easily pick out these pacemakers, for they worked under the eye of the bosses, and they worked like men possessed. This was called speeding up the gang, and if any man could not keep up the pace there were hundreds outside begging to try. Yet Jurgis did not mind it. He rather enjoyed it. It saved him the necessity of flinging his arms about, and fidgeting as he did in most work. He would laugh to himself as he ran down the line, darting a glance now and then at the man ahead of him. It was not the pleasantest work one could think of, but it was necessary work, and what more had a man the right to ask than a chance to do something useful, and to get good pay for doing it? So Jurgis thought, and so he spoke in his bold free way. Very much to his surprise he found that it had a tendency to get him into trouble, for most of the men here took a fearfully different view of the thing. He was quite dismayed when he first began to find it out that most of the men hated their work. It seemed strange, it was even terrible, when you came to find out the universality of the sentiment, but it was certainly the fact. They hated their work. They hated the bosses, and they hated the owners, they hated the whole place, the whole neighborhood, even the whole city, with an all-inclusive hatred, bitter and fierce. Women and little children would fall to cursing about it. It was rotten, rotten as hell. Everything was rotten. When Jurgis would ask them what they meant, they would begin to get suspicious and content themselves with saying, Never mind, you stay here and see for yourself. One of the first problems that Jurgis ran upon was that of the unions. He had had no experience with unions, and he had to have it explained to him that the men were banded together for the purpose of fighting for their rights. Jurgis asked them what they meant by their rights, a question in which he was quite sincere, for he had not any idea of any rights that he had except the right to hunt for a job and do as he was told when he got it. Generally, however, this harmless question would only make his fellow working men lose their tempers and call him a fool. There was a delegate of the butcher helpers' union who came to see Jurgis to enroll him, and when Jurgis found out that this meant that he would have to part with some of his money, he froze up directly, and the delegate, who was an Irishman and only knew a few words of Lithuanian, lost his temper and began to threaten him. In the end, Jurgis got into a fine rage, and made it sufficiently plain that it would take more than one Irishman to scare him into a union. Little by little he gathered that the main thing the men wanted was to put a stop to the habit of speeding up. They were trying their best to force a lessening of the pace, for there were some, they said, who could not keep up with it, whom it was killing. But Jurgis had no sympathy with such ideas as this. He could do the work himself, and so could the rest of them, he declared, if they were good for anything. 
If they couldn't do it, let them go somewhere else. Jurgis had not studied the books, and he would not have known how to pronounce laissez-faire, but he had been round the world enough to know that a man has to shift for himself in it, and that if he gets the worst of it there is nobody to listen to him holler, yet there have been known to be philosophers and plain men who swore by Malthus in the books, and would, nevertheless, subscribe to a relief fund in time of a famine. It was the same with Jurgis, who consigned the unfit to destruction, while going about all day sick at heart because of his poor old father, who was wandering somewhere in the yards begging for a chance to earn his bread. Old Antanas had been a worker ever since he was a child. He had run away from home when he was twelve, because his father beat him for trying to learn to read, and he was a faithful man, too. He was a man you might leave alone for a month, if only you made him understand what you wanted him to do in the meantime. And now here he was, worn out in soul and body, and with no more place in the world than a sick dog. He had his home, as it happened, and someone who would care for him if he never got a job. But his son could not help thinking, suppose this had not been the case. Antonas Rutkus had been into every building in Packingtown by this time, and into nearly every room. He had stood mornings among the crowd of applicants till the very policeman had come to know his face, and to tell him to go home and give it up. He had been likewise to all the stores and saloons for a mile about, begging for some little thing to do, and everywhere they had ordered him out, sometimes with curses, and not once even stopping to ask him a question. So, after all, there was a crack in the fine structure of Jurgis' faith in things as they are. The crack was wide while Dede Antanas was hunting a job, and it was yet wider when he finally got it. For one evening the old man came home in a great state of excitement, with the tale that he had been approached by a man in one of the corridors of the pickle rooms of Durham's, and asked what he would pay to get a job. He had not known what to make of this at first, but the man had gone off with matter-of-fact frankness to say that he could get him a job, provided that he were willing to pay one-third of his wages for it. Was he a boss? Antanas had asked, to which the man had replied that that was nobody's business, but that he could do what he said. Jurgis had made some friends by this time, and he sought one of them and asked what this meant. The friend who was named Tomosius Kushlaika, was a sharp little man who folded hides on the killing beds, and he listened to what Jurgis had to say without seeming at all surprised. They were common enough, he said, such cases of petty graft. It was simply some boss who proposed to add a little to his income. After Jurgis had been there a while he would know that the plants were simply honeycombed with rottenness of that sort. The bosses grafted off the men, and they grafted off each other, and some day the superintendent would find out about the boss, and then he would graft off the boss. Warming to the subject, Tomosius went on to explain the situation. Here was Durham's, for instance, owned by a man who was trying to make as much money out of it as he could, and did not care in the least how he did it, and underneath him ranged in ranks and grades like an army were managers and superintendents and foremen, each one driving the man next below him and trying to squeeze out of him as much work as possible. And all the men of the same rank were pitted against each other. The accounts of each were kept separately, and every man lived in terror of losing his job if another made a better record than he. So from top to bottom the place was simply a seething cauldron of jealousies and hatreds. There was no loyalty or decency anywhere about it. There was no place in it where a man counted for anything against the dollar. And worse than there being no decency, there was not even any honesty. The reason for that, who could say? It must have been old Durham in the beginning. It was a heritage which the self-made merchant had left to his son along with his millions. Jurgis would find out these things for himself if he stayed there long enough. 
It was the men who had to do all the dirty jobs, and so there was no deceiving them, and they caught the spirit of the place and did like all the rest. Jurgis had come there and thought he was going to make himself useful and rise and become a skilled man, but he would soon find out his error, for nobody rose in Packingtown by doing good work. You could lay that down for a rule. If you met a man who was rising in Packingtown, you met a knave. That man who had been sent to Jurgis' father by the boss, he would rise. The man who told tales and spied upon his fellows would rise. But the man who minded his own business and did his work, why, they would speed him up till they had worn him out, and then they would throw him into the gutter. Jurgis went home with his head buzzing, yet he could not bring himself to believe such things. No, it could not be so. Tomosius was simply another of the grumblers. He was a man who spent all his time fiddling, and he would go to parties at night and not get home till sunrise, and so, of course, he did not feel like work. Then, too, he was a puny little chap, and so he had been left behind in the race, and that was why he was sore. Yet so many strange things kept coming to Jurgis' notice every day. He tried to persuade his father to have nothing to do with the offer, but old Antanas had begged until he was worn out and all his courage was gone. He wanted a job, any sort of a job, so the next day he went and found the man who had spoken to him and promised to bring him a third of all he earned, and that same day he was put to work in Durham's cellars. It was a pickle room where there was never a dry spot to stand upon, and so he had to take nearly the whole of his first week's earnings to buy him a pair of heavy soled boots. He was a squeegee man. His job was to go about all day with a long-handled mop swabbing up the floor. Except that it was damp and dark, it was not an unpleasant job. In summer. Now Antanas Rodkis was the meekest man that God ever put on earth and so Jurgis found it a striking confirmation of what the men all said, that his father had been at work only two days before he came home as bitter as any of them, and cursing Durham's with all the power of his soul, for they had set him to cleaning out the traps, and the family sat round and listened in wonder while he told them what that meant. It seemed that he was working in the room where the men prepared the beef for canning, and the beef had lain in vats full of chemicals, and men with great forks speared it out and dumped it into trucks to be taken to the cooking room. When they had speared out all they could reach they emptied the vat on the floor, and then with shovels scraped up the balance and dumped it into the truck. This floor was filthy, yet they set Antonas with his mop slopping the pickle into a hole that connected with a sink where it was caught and used over again forever, and if that were not enough there was a trap in the pipe where all the scraps of meats and odds and ends of refuse were caught, and every few days it was the old man's task to clean these out and shovel their contents into one of the trucks with the rest of the meat. This was the experience of Antonas, and then there came also Jonas and Maria with tales to tell. Maria was working for one of the independent packers, and was quite beside herself and outrageous with triumph over the sums of money she was making as a painter of cans, but one day she walked home with a pale-faced little woman who worked opposite to her, Jadwiga Marcinkus by name, and Jadwiga told her how she, Maria, had chanced to get her job. She had taken the place of an Irish woman who had been working in that factory ever since anyone could remember for over fifteen years, so she declared. Mary Dennis was her name, and a long time ago she had been seduced and had a little boy. He was a cripple and an epileptic, but still he was all that she had in the world to love, and they had lived in a little room alone somewhere back of Halstead Street where the Irish were. Mary had had consumption, and all day long you might hear her coughing as she worked. Of late, she had been going all to pieces, and when Maria came the forelady had suddenly decided to turn her off. The forelady had to come up to a certain standard herself, 
and could not stop for sick people, Jadwiga explained. The fact that Mary had been there so long had not made any difference to her. It was doubtful if she even knew that for both the poor lady and the superintendent were new people, having only been there two or three years themselves. Jadwiga did not know what had become of the poor creature. She would have gone to see her, but had been sick herself. She had pains in her back all the time, Jadwiga explained, and feared that she had womb trouble. It was not fit work for a woman, handling fourteen-pound cans all day. It was a striking circumstance that Jonas, too, had gotten his job by the misfortune of some other person. Jonas pushed a truck loaded with hams from the smoke-rooms onto an elevator and thence to the packing-rooms. The trucks were all of iron and heavy, and they put about three score hams on each of them, a load of more than a quarter of a ton. On the uneven floor it was a task for a man to start one of these trucks, unless he was a giant, and when it was once started he naturally tried his best to keep it going. There was always the boss prowling about, and if there was a second's delay he would fall to cursing, Lithuanians and Slovaks and such, who could not understand what was said to them. The bosses were wont to kick about the place like so many dogs. Therefore these trucks went, for the most part, on the run, and the predecessor of Jonas had been jammed against a wall by one, and crushed in a horrible and nameless manner. All of these were sinister incidents, but they were trifles compared to what Jurgis saw with his own eyes before long. One curious thing he had noticed the very first day, in his profession of shoveler of guts, which was the sharp trick of the floor bosses whenever there chanced to come a slunk calf. Any man who knows anything about butchering knows that the flesh of a cow that is about to calve, or has just calved, is not fit for food. A good many of these came every day to the packing-houses, and of course, if they had chosen, it would have been an easy matter for the packers to keep them till they were fit for food. But for the saving of time and fodder it was the law that cows of that sort came along with the others, and whoever noticed it would tell the boss, and the boss would start up a conversation with the government inspector, and the two would stroll away. So, in a trice, the carcass of the cow would be cleaned out and entrails would have vanished. It was Jurgis's task to slide them into the trap, calves and all, and on the floor below they took out these slunk calves and butchered them for meat and even used the skins of them. One day a man slipped and hurt his leg, and that afternoon when the last of the cattle had been disposed of and the men were leaving, Jurgis was ordered to remain and do some special work which this injured man had usually done. It was late, almost dark, and the government inspectors had all gone, and there were only a dozen or two of men on the floor. That day they had killed about four thousand cattle, and these cattle had come in freight trains from far states, and some of them had got hurt. There were some with broken legs, and some with gored sides. There were some that had died, from what cause no one could say and they were all to be disposed of, here in darkness and silence. Downers, the men called them, and the packing-house had a special elevator upon which they were raised to the killing beds, where the gang proceeded to handle them, with an air of business-like nonchalance which said, plainer than any words, that it was a matter of everyday routine. It took a couple of hours to get them out of the way, and in the end Jurgis saw them go into the chilling-rooms with the rest of the meat, being carefully scattered here and there so that they could not be identified. When he came home that night he was in a very somber mood, having begun to see at last how those might be right who had laughed at him for his faith in America. End of chapter 5 Recording by Tom Weiss Chapter Six of the Jungle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Chapter Six. Jurgis and Ona were very much in love. They had waited a long time. It was now well into the second year, 
and Jurgis judged everything by the criterion of its helping or hindering their union. All his thoughts were there. He accepted the family because it was a part of Ona, and he was interested in the house because it was to be Ona's home. Even the tricks and cruelties he saw at Durham's had little meaning for him just then, save as they might happen to affect his future with Ona. The marriage would have been at once if they had had their way, but this would mean that they would have to do without any wedding feast, and when they suggested this they came into conflict with the old people. To Teta Elzbeta especially the very suggestion was an affliction. What? she would cry, to be married on the roadside like a parcel of beggars? No, no! Elzbeta had some traditions behind her. She had been a person of importance in her girlhood, had lived on a big estate and had servants, and might have married well and been a lady, but for the fact that there had been nine daughters and no sons in the family. Even so, however, she knew what was decent and clung to her traditions with desperation. They were not going to lose all caste, even if they had come to be unskilled laborers in Packingtown, and that Ona had even talked of omitting a Yeselia was enough to keep her stepmother lying awake all night. It was in vain for them to say that they had so few friends, they were bound to have friends in time, and then the friends would talk about it. They must not give up what was right for a little money. If they did, the money would never do them any good. They could depend upon that. And Elzbeta would call upon Dede Antanas to support her. There was a fear in the souls of these two, lest this journey to a new country might somehow undermine the old home virtues of their children. The very first Sunday they had all been taken to Mass, and poor as they were, Elzbeta had felt it advisable to invest a little of her resources in a representation of the Babe of Bethlehem, made in plaster, and painted in brilliant colors. Though it was only a foot high, there was a shrine with four snow-white steeples, and the Virgin standing with her child in her arms, and the kings and shepherds and wise men bowing down before him. It had cost fifty cents, but Elzbeta had a feeling that money spent for such things was not to be counted too closely. It would come back in hidden ways. The piece was beautiful on the parlor mantel, and one could not have a home without some sort of ornament. The cost of the wedding feast would, of course, be returned to them, but the problem was to raise it even temporarily. They had been in the neighborhood so short a time that they could not get much credit, and there was no one except Shedvilas from whom they could borrow even a little. Evening after evening Jurgis and Ona would sit and figure the expenses, calculating the term of their separation. They could not possibly manage it decently for less than two hundred dollars, and even though they were welcome to count in the whole of the earnings of Maria and Jonas as a loan, they could not hope to raise this sum in less than four or five months. So Ona began thinking of seeking employment herself, saying that if she had even ordinarily good luck she might be able to take two months off the time. They were just beginning to adjust themselves to this necessity when out of the clear sky there fell a thunderbolt upon them, a calamity that scattered all their hopes to the four winds. About a block away from them there lived another Lithuanian family, consisting of an elderly widow and one grown son. Their name was Majauskis, and our friends struck up an acquaintance with them before long. One evening they came over for a visit, and naturally the first subject upon which the conversation turned was the neighborhood and its history, and then Grandmother Majauskini, as the old lady was called, proceeded to recite to them a string of horrors that fairly froze their blood. She was a wrinkled-up and wizened personage. She must have been eighty, and as she mumbled the grim story through her toothless gums she seemed a very old witch to them. Grandmother Majauskini had lived in the midst of misfortune so long that it had come to be her element, and she talked about starvation, sickness, and death as other people might about weddings and holidays. 
The thing came gradually. In the first place, as to the house they had bought, it was not new at all, as they had supposed. It was about fifteen years old, and there was nothing new upon it but the paint, which was so bad that it needed to be put on new every year or two. The house was one of a whole row that was built by a company which existed to make money by swindling poor people. The family had paid fifteen hundred dollars for it, and it had not cost the builders five hundred when it was new. Grandmother Majauskini knew that, because her son belonged to a political organization with a contractor who put up exactly such houses. They used the very flimsiest and cheapest material. They built the houses a dozen at a time, and they cared about nothing at all except the outside shine. The family could take her word as to the trouble they would have, for she had been through it all. She and her son had bought their house in exactly the same way. They had fooled the company, however, for her son was a skilled man who made as high as a hundred dollars a month, and as he had had sense enough not to marry, they had been able to pay for the house. Grandmother Majauskini saw that her friends were puzzled at this remark. They did not quite see how paying for the house was fooling the company. Evidently they were very inexperienced. Cheap as the houses were, they were sold with the idea that the people who had bought them would not be able to pay for them. When they failed, if it were only by a single month, they would lose the house and all that they had paid on it, and then the company would sell it over again. And did they often get a chance to do that? Dieve! Grandmother Majauskini raised her hands. They did it. How often no one could say, but certainly more than half the time. They might ask anyone who knew anything at all about Packingtown as to that. She had been living here ever since this house was built, and she could tell them all about it. And had it ever been sold before? So say milke. Why, since it had been built, no less than four families that their informant could name had tried to buy it and failed. She would tell them a little about it. The first family had been Germans. The families had all been of different nationalities. There had been a representative of several races that had displaced each other in the stockyards. Grandmother Majauskini had come to America with her son at a time when, so far as she knew, there was only one other Lithuanian family in the district. The workers had all been Germans then, skilled cattle butchers that the packers had brought from abroad to start the business. Afterward, as cheaper labor had come, these Germans had moved away. The next were the Irish. There had been six or eight years when Packingtown had been a regular Irish city. There were a few colonies of them still here, enough to run all the unions and the police force and get all the graft. But most of those who were working in the packing houses had gone away at the next drop in wages, after the big strike. The Bohemians had come then, and after them the Poles. People said that old man Durham himself was responsible for these immigrations. He had sworn that he would fix the people of Packingtown, so that they would never again call a strike on him, and so he had sent his agents into every city and village in Europe to spread the tale of the chances of work and high wages at the stockyards. The people had come in hordes, and old Durham had squeezed them tighter and tighter, speeding them up and grinding them to pieces and sending for new ones. The Poles, who had come by tens of thousands, had been driven to the wall by the Lithuanians, and now the Lithuanians were giving way to the Slovaks, who there was, poorer and more miserable than the Slovaks, Grandmother Majauskini had no idea, but the packers would find them, never fear. It was easy to bring them, for wages were really much higher, and it was only when it was too late that the poor people found out that everything else was higher, too. They were like rats in a trap, that was the truth, and more of them were piling in every day. By and by they would have their revenge, though, for the thing was getting beyond human endurance, and the people would rise and murder the packers. 
Grandmother Majauskine was a socialist, or some strange thing. Another son of hers was working in the mines of Siberia, and the old lady herself had made speeches in her time, which made her seem all the more terrible to her present auditors. They called her back to the story of the house. The German family had been a good sort. To be sure, there had been a great many of them, which was a common failing in Packingtown, but they had worked hard, and the father had been a steady man, and they had a good deal more than half paid for the house, but he had been killed in an elevator accident in Durham's. Then there had come the Irish, and there had been lots of them, too. The husband drank and beat the children. The neighbors could hear them shrieking any night. They were behind with their rent all the time, but the company was good to them. There was some politics back of that, Grandmother Majauskini could not say just what, but the Lafferties had belonged to the War Whoop League, which was a sort of political club of all the thugs and rowdies in the district, and if you belonged to that you could never be arrested for anything. Once upon a time old Lafferty had been caught with a gang that had stolen cows from several of the poor people of the neighborhood, and butchered them in an old shanty back of the yards and sold them. He had been in jail only three days for it, and had come out laughing, and had not even lost his place in the packing-house. He had gone all to ruin with the drink, however, and lost his power. One of his sons, who was a good man, had kept him and the family up for a year or two, but then he had got sick with consumption. That was another thing, Grandmother Majauskini interrupted herself. This house was unlucky. Every family that lived in it, someone was sure to get consumption. Nobody could tell why that was. There must be something about the house, or the way it was built. Some folks said it was because the building had been begun in the dark of the moon. There were dozens of houses that way in Packingtown. Sometimes there would be a particular room that you could point out. If anybody slept in that room he was just as good as dead. With this house it had been the Irish first, and then a Bohemian family had lost a child of it, though to be sure that was uncertain, since it was hard to tell what was the matter with children who worked in the yards. In those days there had been no law about the age of children. The packers had worked all but the babies. At this remark the family looked puzzled, and Grandmother Majauskini again had to make an explanation, that it was against the law for children to work before they were sixteen. What was the sense of that? they asked. They had been thinking of letting little Stanislaus go to work. Well, there was no need to worry, Grandmother Majauskini said. The law made no difference except that it forced people to lie about the ages of their children. One would like to know what the lawmakers expected them to do. There were families that had no possible means of support except the children, and the law provided them no other way of getting a living. Very often a man could get no work in Packingtown for months, while a child could go and get a place easily. There was always some new machine, by which the packers could get as much work out of a child as they had been able to get out of a man, and for a third of the pay. To come back to the house again, it was the woman of the next family that had died. That was after they had been there nearly four years, and this woman had had twins regularly every year, and there had been more than you could count when they moved in. After she died, the man would go to work all day and leave them to shift for themselves. The neighbors would help them now and then, for they would almost freeze to death. At the end there were three days that they were left alone, before it was found out that the father was dead. He was a floorsman at Jones's, and a wounded steer had broken loose and mashed him against a pillar. Then the children had been taken away and the company had sold the house that very same week to a party of emigrants. So this grim old woman went on with her tale of horrors. How much of it was exaggeration? Who could tell? It was only too plausible. There was that about consumption, for instance. 
They knew nothing about consumption whatever, except that it made people cough, and for two weeks they had been worrying about a coughing spell of Antonas. It seemed to shake him all over, and it never stopped. You could see a red stain whenever he had spit upon the floor. And yet all these things were as nothing to what came a little later. They had begun to question the old lady as to why one family had been unable to pay, trying to show her by figures that it ought to have been possible, and Grandmother Majauskini had disputed their figures. You say twelve dollars a month, but that does not include the interest. Then they stared at her. Interest! they cried. Interest on the money you still owe, she answered. But we don't have to pay any interest, they exclaimed, three or four at once. We only have to pay twelve dollars each month. And for this she laughed at them. You are like all the rest, she said. They trick you and eat you alive. They never sell the houses without interest. Get your deed and see. Then, with a horrible sinking of the heart, Teta Elzbeta unlocked her bureau and brought out the paper that had already caused them so many agonies. Now they sat round, scarcely breathing, while the old lady, who could read English, ran over it. Yes, she said finally, here it is, of course, with interest thereon monthly, at the rate of seven per cent per annum. And there followed a dead silence. What does that mean? asked Jurgis, finally, almost in a whisper. That means, replied the other, that you have to pay them seven dollars next month as well as the twelve dollars. Then again there was not a sound. It was sickening, like a nightmare, in which suddenly something gives way beneath you, and you feel yourself sinking, sinking down into bottomless abysses. As if in a flash of lightning they saw themselves, victims of a relentless fate, cornered, trapped in the grip of destruction. All the fair structure of their hopes came crashing about their ears, and all the time the old woman was going on talking. They wished that she would be still. Her voice sounded like the croaking of some dismal raven. Jurgis sat with his hands clenched and beads of perspiration on his forehead, and there was a great lump in Ona's throat, choking her. Then suddenly Teta Elzbeta broke the silence with a wail, and Maria began to wring her hands and sob. Ay, ay, Bedaman. All their outcry did them no good, of course. There sat Grandmother Miauskini, unrelenting, typifying fate. No, of course it was not fair, but then fairness had nothing to do with it. And of course, they had not known it. They had not been intended to know it, but it was in the deed, and that was all that was necessary, as they would find out when the time came. Somehow or other they got rid of their guest, and then they passed a night of lamentation. The children woke up and found out that something was wrong, and they wailed and would not be comforted. In the morning, of course, most of them had to go to work, the packing-houses would not stop for their sorrows, but by seven o'clock Ona and her stepmother were standing at the door of the office of the agent. Yes, he told them, when he came, it was quite true that they would have to pay interest. And then Teta Elzbeta broke forth into protestations and reproaches, so that the people outside stopped and peered in at the window. The agent was as bland as ever. He was deeply pained, he said. He had not told them, simply because he had supposed they would understand that they had to pay interest upon their debt, as a matter of course. So they came away, and Ona went down to the yards, and at noontime saw Jurgis and told him. Jurgis took it stolidly. He had made up his mind to it by this time. It was part of fate. They would manage it somehow. He made his usual answer. I will work harder. It would upset their plans for a time, and it would perhaps be necessary for Ona to get work after all. Then Ona added that Teta Elzbeta had decided that little Stanislaus would have to work too, 
It was not fair to let Jurgis and her support the family. The family would have to help as it could. Previously Jurgis had scouted this idea, but now knit his brows and nodded his head slowly. Yes, perhaps it would be best. They would all have to make some sacrifices now. So Ona set out that day to hunt for work, and at night Maria came home saying that she had met a girl named Yasetite, who had a friend that worked in one of the wrapping rooms in Brown's, and might get a place for Ona there. Only the forelady was the kind that takes presents. It was no use for anyone to ask her for a place unless at the same time they slipped a ten-dollar bill into her hand. Jurgis was not in the least surprised at this now. He merely asked what the wages of the place would be. So negotiations were opened, and after an interview Ona came home and reported that the forelady seemed to like her, and had said that, while she was not sure, she thought she might be able to put her at work sewing covers on hands, a job at which she would earn as much as eight or ten dollars a week. That was a bid, so Maria reported, after consulting with her friend, and then there was an anxious conference at home. The work was done in one of the cellars, and Jurgis did not want Ona to work in such a place, but then it was easy work, and one could not have everything. So in the end Ona, with a ten-dollar bill burning a hole in her palm, had another interview with the forelady. Meantime Teta Elsbeta had taken Stanislavus to a priest and gotten a certificate to the effect that he was two years older than he was and with it the little boy now sallied forth to make his fortune in the world. It chanced that Durham had just put in a wonderful new lard machine, and when the special policeman in front of the time station saw Stanislavus and his document, he smiled to himself and told him to go, chai, chai, pointing. And so Stanislavus went along a long stone corridor and up a flight of stairs, which took him into a room lighted by electricity, with the new machines for filling lard cans at work in it. The lard was finished on the floor above, and it came in little jets, like beautiful wriggling snow-white snakes of unpleasant odor. There were several kinds and sizes of jets, and after a certain precise quantity had come out, each stopped automatically, and the wonderful machine made a turn and took the can under another jet, and so on, until it was filled neatly to the brim, and pressed tightly, and smoothed off. To attend to all this and fill several hundred cans of lard per hour, there were necessary two human creatures, one of whom knew how to place an empty lard can on a certain spot every few seconds, and the other of whom knew how to take a full lard can off a certain spot every few seconds and set it upon a tray. And so, after little Stanislavus had stood gazing timidly about him for a few minutes, a man approached him and asked what he wanted, to which Stanislavus said, Job. Then the man said, How old? And Stanislavus answered, Sixteen. Once or twice every year a state inspector would come wandering through the packing plants, asking a child here and there how old he was and so the packers were very careful to comply with the law, which cost them as much trouble as was now involved in the bosses taking the document from the little boy, and glancing at it, and then sending it to the office to be filed away. Then he set someone else at a different job, and showed the lad how to place a lard can every time the empty arm of the remorseless machine came to him, and so was decided the place in the universe of little Stanislavus and his destiny till the end of his days. Hour after hour, day after day, year after year, it was fated that he should stand upon a certain square foot of floor from seven in the morning until noon, and again from half-past twelve until half-past five, making never a motion and thinking never a thought, save for the setting of lard cans. In summer, the stench of the warm lard would be nauseating, 
and in winter the cans would all but freeze to his naked little fingers in the unheated cellar. Half the year it would be dark as night when he went in to work, and dark as night again when he came out, and so he would never know what the sun looked like on weekdays. And for this, at the end of the week, he would carry home three dollars to his family, being his pay at the rate of five cents per hour, just about his proper share of the total earnings of the million and three-quarters of children who are now engaged in earning their livings in the United States. And meantime, because they were young, and hope is not to be stifled before its time, Jurgis and Ona were again calculating, for they had discovered that the wages of Stanislavus would a little more than pay the interest, which left them just about as they had been before. It would be but fair to them to say that the little boy was delighted with his work, and at the idea of earning a lot of money, and also that the two were very much in love with each other. End of chapter 6 Recording by Tom Weiss Chapter 7 of The Jungle this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Chapter 7 All summer long the family toiled, and in the fall they had money enough for Jurgis and Ona to be married according to home traditions of decency. In the latter part of November they hired a hall and invited all their new acquaintances who came and left them over a hundred dollars in debt. It was a bitter and cruel experience, and it plunged them into an agony of despair. Such a time of all times for them to have it, when their hearts were made tender. Such a pitiful beginning it was for their married life. They loved each other so, and they could not have the briefest respite. It was a time when everything cried out to them that they ought to be happy when wonder burned in their hearts and leaped into flame at their slightest breath. They were shaken to the depths of them, with the awe of love realized, and was it so very weak of them that they cried out for a little peace? They had opened their hearts like flowers to the springtime, and the merciless winter had fallen upon them. They wondered if ever any love that had blossomed in the world had been so crushed and trampled. Over them, relentless and savage, there cracked the lash of want. The morning after the wedding it sought them as they slept, and drove them out before daybreak to work. Ona was scarcely able to stand with exhaustion, but if she were to lose her place they would be ruined, and she would surely lose it if she were not on time that day. They all had to go, even little Stanislavus who was ill from overindulgence in sausages and sarsaparilla. All that day he stood at his lard machine, rocking unsteadily, his eyes closing in spite of him, and he all but lost his place even so, for the foreman booted him twice to waken him. It was fully a week before they were all normal again, and meantime, with whining children and cross adults, the house was not a pleasant place to live in. Jurgis lost his temper very little, however, all things considered. It was because of Ona the least glance at her was always enough to make him control himself. She was so sensitive, she was not fitted for such a life as this, and a hundred times a day when he thought of her he would clench his hands and fling himself again at the task before him. She was too good for him, he told himself, and he was afraid because she was his. So long he had hungered to possess her, but now that the time had come he knew that he had not earned the right, that she trusted him so was all her own simple goodness and no virtue of his. But he was resolved that she should never find this out, and so was always on the watch to see that he did not betray any of his ugly self. He would take care even in little matters, such as his manners, and his habit of swearing when things went wrong. 
The tears came so easily into Ona's eyes, and she would look at him so appealingly, that it kept Jurgis quite busy making resolutions, in addition to all the other things he had on his mind. It was true that more things were going on at this time in the mind of Jurgis than ever had in all his life before. He had to protect her, to do battle for her against the horror he saw about them. He was all that she had to look to, and if he failed she would be lost. He would wrap his arms about her and try to hide her from the world. He had learned the ways of things about him now. It was a war of each against all, and the devil take the hindmost. You did not give feasts to other people, you waited for them to give feasts to you. You went about with your soul full of suspicion and hatred. You understood that you were environed by hostile powers that were trying to get your money, and who used all the virtues to bait their traps with. The storekeepers plastered up their windows with all sorts of lies to entice you, the very fences by the wayside, the lamp posts and telegraph poles were plastered over with lies. The great corporation which employed you lied to you, and lied to the whole country. From top to bottom it was nothing but one gigantic lie. So Jurgis said that he understood it, and yet it was really pitiful, for the struggle was so unfair. Some had so much the advantage. Here he was, for instance, vowing upon his knees that he would save Ona from harm, and only a week later she was suffering atrociously, and from the blow of an enemy that he could not possibly have thwarted. There came a day when the rain fell in torrents, and it being December, to be wet with it and have to sit all day long in one of those cold cellars of Brown's was no laughing matter. Ona was a working girl and did not own waterproofs and such things, and so Jurgis took her and put her on the street-car. Now it chanced that this car-line was owned by gentlemen who were trying to make money, and the city having passed an ordinance requiring them to give transfers they had fallen into a rage, and first they had made a rule that transfers could be had only when the fare was paid, and later, growing still uglier, they had made another that the passenger must ask for the transfer, the conductor was not allowed to offer it. Now Ona had been told that she was to get a transfer, but it was not her way to speak up, and so she merely waited, following the conductor about with her eyes, wondering when he would think of her. When at last the time came for her to get out she asked for the transfer, and was refused. Not knowing what to make of this, she began to argue with the conductor, in a language of which he did not understand a word. After warning her several times he pulled the bell and the car went on, at which Ona burst into tears. At the next corner she got out, of course, and as she had no more money she had to walk the rest of the way to the yards in the pouring rain, and so all day long she sat shivering and came home at night with her teeth chattering and pains in her head and back. For two weeks afterward she suffered cruelly, and yet every day she had to drag herself to her work. The forewoman was especially severe with Ona, because she believed that she was obstinate on account of having been refused a holiday the day after her wedding. Ona had an idea that her forelady did not like to have her girls marry perhaps because she was old and ugly and unmarried herself. There were many such dangers in which the odds were all against them. Their children were not as well as they had been at home, but how could they know that there was no sewer to their house, and that the drainage of fifteen years was in a cesspool under it? How could they know that the pale blue milk that they bought around the corner was watered? and doctored with formaldehyde besides. When the children were not well at home, Teta Elsbeta would gather herbs and cure them. Now she was obliged to go to the drug store and buy extracts, and how was she to know that they were all adulterated? How could they find out that their tea and coffee, 
their sugar and flour had been doctored, that their canned peas had been colored with copper salts, and their fruit jams with aniline dyes. And even if they had known it, what good would it have done them, since there was no place within miles of them where any other sort was to be had? The bitter winter was coming, and they had to save money to get more clothing and bedding, but it would not matter in the least how much they saved, they could not get anything to keep them warm. All the clothing that was to be had in the stores was made of cotton and shoddy, which is made by tearing old clothes to pieces and weaving the fiber again. If they paid higher prices they might get frills and fancies, or be cheated, but genuine quality they could not obtain for love nor money. A young friend of Shadvilas, recently come from abroad, had become a clerk in a store on Ashland Avenue, and he narrated with glee a trick that had been played upon an unsuspecting countryman by his boss. The customer had desired to purchase an alarm clock, and the boss had shown him two exactly similar, telling him that the price of one was a dollar, and of the other a dollar seventy-five. Upon being asked what the difference was, the man had wound up the first halfway and the second all the way, and showed the customer how the latter made twice as much noise, upon which the customer remarked that he was a sound sleeper and had better take the more expensive clock. There is a poet who sings that deeper their heart grows and nobler their bearing, whose youth in the fires of anguish hath died but it was not likely that he had reference to the kind of anguish that comes with destitution, that is so endlessly bitter and cruel, and yet so sorry and petty, so ugly, so humiliating, unredeemed by the slightest touch of dignity or even of pathos. It is a kind of anguish that poets have not commonly dealt with. Its very words are not admitted into the vocabulary of poets. The details of it cannot be told in polite society at all. How, for instance, could anyone expect to excite sympathy among lovers of good literature by telling how a family found their home alive with vermin, and of all the suffering and inconvenience and humiliation they were put to, and the hard-earned money they spent in efforts to get rid of them, after long hesitation and uncertainty, they paid twenty-five cents for a big package of insect powder, a patent preparation which chanced to be ninety-five per cent gypsum, a harmless earth which had cost about two cents to prepare. Of course it had not the least effect, except upon a few roaches which had the misfortune to drink water after eating it, and so got their innards set in a coating of plaster of Paris. The family, having no idea of this, and no more money to throw away, had nothing to do but give up and submit to one more misery for the rest of their days. Then there was old Antonas. The winter came, and the place where he worked was a dark, unheated cellar where you could see your breath all day, and where your fingers sometimes tried to freeze. So the old man's cough grew every day worse, until there came a time when it hardly ever stopped and he had become a nuisance about the place. Then, too, a still more dreadful thing happened to him. He worked in a place where his feet were soaked in chemicals, and it was not long before they had eaten through his new boots. Then sores began to break out on his feet, and grow worse and worse. Whether it was that his blood was bad, or there had been a cut, he could not say. But he asked the men about it, and learned that it was a regular thing. It was the saltpeter. Every one felt it sooner or later, and then it was all up with him, at least for that sort of work. The sores would never heal. In the end his toes would drop off if he did not quit. Yet old Antonas would not quit. He saw the suffering of his family, and he remembered what it had cost him to get a job. So he tied up his feet, and went on limping about and coughing, until at last he fell to pieces all at once and in a heap like the one-horse shay. 
They carried him to a dry place and laid him on the floor, and that night two of the men helped him home. The poor old man was put to bed, and though he tried it every morning until the end, he never could get up again. He would lie there and cough and cough, day and night, wasting away to a mere skeleton. There came a time when there was so little flesh on him that the bones began to poke through, which was a horrible thing to see or even to think of. And one night he had a coughing fit, and a little river of blood came out of his mouth. The family, wild with terror, sent for a doctor, and paid half a dollar to be told that there was nothing to be done. Mercifully the doctor did not say this so that the old man could hear, for he was still clinging to the faith that tomorrow or next day he would be better, and could go back to his job. The company had sent word to him that they would keep it for him, or rather Jurgis had bribed one of the men to come one Sunday afternoon and say they had. Dede Antanas continued to believe it, while three more hemorrhages came, and then at last one morning they found him stiff and cold. Things were not going well with them then, and though it nearly broke Teta Elspeta's heart, they were forced to dispense with nearly all the decencies of a funeral. They had only a hearse and one hack for the women and children, and Jurgis, who was learning things fast, spent all Sunday making a bargain for these, and he made it in the presence of witnesses, so that when the man tried to charge him for all sorts of incidentals he did not have to pay. For twenty-five years old Antonas Rutkis and his son had dwelt in the forest together, and it was hard to part in this way. Perhaps it was just as well that Jurgis had to give all his attention to the task of having a funeral without being bankrupted, and so had no time to indulge in memories and grief. Now the dreadful winter was upon them. In the forest, all summer long, the branches of the trees do battle for light, and some of them lose and die, and then come the raging blasts and the storms of snow and hail, and strew the ground with these weaker branches. Just so it was in Packingtown. The whole district braced itself for the struggle that was an agony, and those whose time had come died off in hordes. All the year round they had been serving as cogs in the great packing machine and now was the time for the renovating of it, and the replacing of damaged parts. There came pneumonia and grip, stalking among them, seeking for weakened constitutions. There was the annual harvest of those whom tuberculosis had been dragging down. There came cruel, cold, and biting winds and blizzards of snow, all testing relentlessly for failing muscles and impoverished blood. Sooner or later came the day when the unfit one did not report for work, and then, with no time lost in waiting and no inquiries or regrets, there was a chance for a new hand. The new hands were here by the thousands. All day long the gates of the packing-houses were besieged by starving and penniless men. They came literally by the thousands every single morning, fighting with each other for a chance for life blizzards and cold made no difference to them, they were always on hand. They were on hand two hours before the sun rose, an hour before the work began. Sometimes their faces froze, sometimes their feet and their hands, sometimes they froze altogether, but still they came, for they had no other place to go. One day Durham advertised in the paper for two hundred men to cut ice and all that day the homeless and starving of the city came trudging through the snow from all over its two hundred square miles. That night forty score of them crowded into the station-house of the stockyards district. They filled the rooms, sleeping in each other's laps, toboggan fashion, and they piled on top of each other in the corridors, till the police shut the doors and left some to freeze outside. On the morrow, before daybreak, there were three thousand at Durham's, and the police reserves had to be sent for to quell the riot. Then Durham's bosses picked out twenty of the biggest. 
the two hundred proved to have been a printer's error. Four or five miles to the eastward lay the lake, and over this the bitter winds came raging. Sometimes the thermometer would fall to ten or twenty degrees below zero at night, and in the morning the streets would be piled with snowdrifts up to the first-floor windows. The streets through which our friends had to go to work were all unpaved and full of deep holes and gullies. In summer, when it rained hard, a man might have to wade to his waist to get to his house, and now in winter it was no joke getting through these places, before light in the morning and after dark at night. They would wrap up in all they owned, but they could not wrap up against exhaustion, and many a man gave out in these battles with the snowdrifts, and lay down, and fell asleep. And if it was bad for the men, one may imagine how the women and children fared. Some would ride in the cars, if the cars were running. But when you are making only five cents an hour, as was little Stanislovis, you do not like to spend that much to ride two miles. The children would come to the yards with great shawls about their ears, and so tied up that you could hardly find them, and still there would be accidents. One bitter morning in February the little boy who worked at the lard machine with Stanislavus came about an hour late, and screaming with pain. They unwrapped him, and a man began vigorously rubbing his ears, and as they were frozen stiff, it took only two or three rubs to break them short off. As a result of this little Stanislavus conceived a terror of the cold that was almost a mania. Every morning, when it came time to start for the yards, he would begin to cry and protest. Nobody knew quite how to manage him, for threats did no good. It seemed to be something that he could not control, and they feared sometimes that he would go into convulsions. In the end it had to be arranged that he always went with Jurgis, and came home with him again, and often, when the snow was deep, the man would carry him the whole way on his shoulders. Sometimes Jurgis would be working until late at night, and then it was pitiful, for there was no place for the little fellow to wait, save in the doorways or in a corner of the killing beds, and he would all but fall asleep there and freeze to death. There was no heat upon the killing beds. The men might exactly as well have worked out of doors all winter. For that matter, there was very little heat anywhere in the building, except in the cooking rooms and such places, and it was the men who worked in these who ran the most risk of all, because whenever they had to pass to another room they had to go through ice-cold corridors, and sometimes with nothing on above the waist except a sleeveless undershirt. On the killing beds you were apt to be covered with blood, and it would freeze solid. If you leaned against a pillar you would freeze to that, and if you put your hand upon the blade of your knife you would run a chance of leaving your skin on it. The men would tie up their feet in newspapers and old sacks, and these would be soaked in blood and frozen, and then soaked again, and so on, until by night-time a man would be walking on great lumps the size of the feet of an elephant. Now and then, when the bosses were not looking, you would see them plunging their feet and ankles into the steaming hot carcass of the steer, or darting across the room to the hot water jets. The cruelest thing of all was that nearly all of them, all of those who used knives, were unable to wear gloves, and their arms would be white with frost, and their hands would grow numb, and then, of course, there would be accidents. Also, the air would be full of steam from the hot water and the hot blood, so that you could not see five feet before you, and then, with men rushing about at the speed they kept up on the killing beds, and all with butcher knives, like razors in their hands, well, it was to be counted as a wonder that there were not more men slaughtered than cattle, and yet all this inconvenience they might have put up with, if only it had not been for one thing if only there had been some place where they might eat. Jurgis had either to eat his dinner amid the stench in which he had worked, or else to rush, as did all his companions, to any one of the hundreds of liquor stores which stretched out their arms to him. 
to the west of the yards ran Ashland Avenue, and here was an unbroken line of saloons, Whiskey Row they called it. To the north was 47th Street, where there were half a dozen to the block, and at the angle of the two was Whiskey Point, a space of fifteen or twenty acres, and containing one glue factory and about two hundred saloons. One might walk among these and take his choice. Hot pea soup and boiled cabbage today, sauerkraut and hot frankfritters walk in, bean soup and stewed lamb welcome. All of these things were printed in many languages, as were also the names of the resorts, which were infinite in their variety and appeal. There was the home circle and the cozy corner. There were firesides and hearthstones and pleasure palaces and wonderlands and dream castles and love's delights. Whatever else they were called, they were sure to be called Union Headquarters and to hold out a welcome to working men. And there was always a warm stove and a chair near it, and some friends to laugh and talk with. There was only one condition attached. You must drink. If you went in not intending to drink, you would be put out in no time, and if you were slow about going, like as not, you would get your head split open with a beer bottle in the bargain. But all of the men understood the convention and drank. They believed that by it they were getting something for nothing, for they did not need to take more than one drink, and upon the strength of it they might fill themselves up with a good hot dinner. This did not always work out in practice, however, for there was pretty sure to be a friend who would treat you, and then you would have to treat him. Then someone else would come in, and anyhow a few drinks were good for a man who worked hard. As he went back he did not shiver so. He had more courage for his task. The deadly, brutalizing monotony of it did not afflict him so. He had ideas while he worked, and took a more cheerful view of his circumstances. On the way home, however, the shivering was apt to come on him again, and so he would have to stop once or twice to warm up against the cruel cold. As there were hot things to eat in this saloon, too, he might get home late to his supper, or he might not get home at all, and then his wife might set out to look for him, and she too would feel the cold, and perhaps she would have some of the children with her, and so a whole family would drift into drinking as the current of a river drifts downstream. As if to complete the chain, the packers all paid their men in checks, refusing all requests to be paid in coin. And where in Packingtown could a man go to have his check cashed but to a saloon, where he could pay for the favor by spending a part of the money? From all of these things Jurgis was saved because of Ona. He never would take but the one drink at noontime, and so he got the reputation of being a surly fellow, and was not quite welcome at the saloons, and had to drift about from one to another. Then at night he would go straight home, helping Ona and Stanislavus, or often putting the former on a car, and when he got home perhaps he would have to trudge several blocks and come staggering back through the snowdrifts with a bag of coal upon his shoulder. Home was not a very attractive place, at least not this winter. They had only been able to buy one stove, and this was a small one and proved not big enough to warm even the kitchen in the bitterest weather. This made it hard for Teta Elsbeta all day, and for the children who they could not get to school. At night they would sit huddled round this stove while they ate their supper off their laps, and then Jurgis and Jonas would smoke a pipe, after which they would all crawl into their beds to get warm, after putting out the fire to save the coal. Then they would have some frightful experiences with the cold. They would sleep with all their clothes on, including their overcoats, and put over them all the bedding and spare clothing they owned. The children would sleep all crowded into one bed, and yet even so they could not keep warm. The outside ones would be shivering and sobbing, crawling over the others and trying to get down into the center and causing a fight. 
This old house with the leaky weatherboards was a very different thing from their cabins at home, with great thick walls plastered inside and outside with mud. And the cold which came upon them was a living thing, a demon presence in the room. They would waken in the midnight hours when everything was black. Perhaps they would hear it yelling outside, or perhaps there would be death-like stillness, and that would be worse yet. They could feel the cold as it crept in through the cracks, reaching out for them with its icy, death-dealing fingers, and they would crouch and cower and try to hide from it, all in vain. It would come, and it would come, a grisly thing, a specter born in the black caverns of terror, a power primeval, cosmic, shadowing the tortures of the lost souls flung out to chaos and destruction. It was cruel iron-hard, and hour after hour they would cringe in its grasp, alone, alone. There would be no one to hear them if they cried out. There would be no help, no mercy. And so on until morning, when they would go out to another day of toil, a little weaker, a little nearer to the time when it would be their turn to be shaken from the tree. End of chapter 7 Recording by Tom Weiss Chapter 8 of The Jungle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss The Jungle by Upton Sinclair Chapter 8 Yet even by this deadly winter the germ of hope was not to be kept from sprouting in their hearts. It was just at this time that the great adventure befell Maria. The victim was Tamosius Kuschleika, who played the violin. Everybody laughed at them, for Tamosius was petite and frail, and Maria could have picked him up and carried him off under one arm but perhaps that was why she fascinated him. The sheer volume of Maria's energy was overwhelming. That first night at the wedding Tomosius had hardly taken his eyes off her, and later on, when he came to find that she had really the heart of a baby, her voice and her violence ceased to terrify him, and he got the habit of coming to pay her visits on Sunday afternoons. There was no place to entertain company except in the kitchen, in the midst of the family, and Timotius would sit there with his hat between his knees, never saying more than half a dozen words at a time, and turning red in the face before he managed to say those, until finally Jurgis would clap him upon the back in his hearty way, crying, "'Come now, brother, give us a tune,' and then Timotius' face would light up, and he would get out his fiddle tuck it under his chin, and play. And forthwith the soul of him would flame up and become eloquent. It was almost an impropriety, for all the while his gaze would be fixed upon Maria's face, until she would begin to turn red and lower her eyes. There was no resisting the music of Tomosius, however even the children would sit awed and wondering, and the tears would run down Teta Elzbeta's cheeks. A wonderful privilege it was to be thus admitted into the soul of a man of genius, to be allowed to share the ecstasies and the agonies of his inmost life. Then there were other benefits accruing to Maria from this friendship, benefits of a more substantial nature. People paid Timotius big money to come and make music on state occasions, and also they would invite him to parties and festivals knowing well that he was too good-natured to come without his fiddle, and that having brought it he could be made to play while others danced. Once he made bold to ask Maria to accompany him to such a party, and Maria accepted, to his great delight, after which he never went anywhere without her, while if the celebration were given by friends of his he would invite the rest of the family also. In any case Maria would bring back a huge pocketful of cakes and sandwiches for the children, and stories of all the good things she herself had managed to consume. 
she was compelled at these parties to spend most of her time at the refreshment table, for she could not dance with anybody except other women and very old men. Timotius was of an excitable temperament, and afflicted with a frantic jealousy, and any unmarried man who ventured to put his arm about the ample waist of Maria would be certain to throw the orchestra out of tune. It was a great help to a person who had to toil all the week to be able to look forward to some such relaxation as this on Saturday nights. The family was too poor and too hard work to make many acquaintances. In Packingtown, as a rule, people know only their near neighbors and shopmates, and so the place is like a myriad of little country villages. But now there was a member of the family who was permitted to travel and widen her horizon, and so each week there would be new personalities to talk about, how so-and-so was dressed, and where she worked, and what she got, and whom she was in love with, and how this man had jilted his girl, and how she had quarreled with the other girl, and what had passed between them, and how another man beat his wife, and spent all her earnings upon drink, and pawned her very clothes. Some people would have scorned this talk as gossip, but then one has to talk about what one knows. It was one Saturday night, as they were coming home from a wedding, that Tomosius found courage and set down his violin case in the street and spoke his heart. And then Maria clasped him in her arms. She told them all about it the next day, and fairly cried with happiness, for she said that Timotius was a lovely man. After that he no longer made love to her with his fiddle, but they would sit for hours in the kitchen, blissfully happy in each other's arms. It was the tacit convention of the family to know nothing of what was going on in that corner. They were planning to be married in the spring, and have the garret of the house fixed up and live there. Timotius made good wages and little by little the family were paying back their debt to Maria, so she ought soon to have enough to start life upon, only with her preposterous soft-heartedness she would insist upon spending a good part of her money every week for things which she saw they needed. Maria was really the capitalist of the party, for she had become an expert can-painter by this time. She was getting fourteen cents for every hundred and ten cans, and she could paint more than two cans every minute. Maria felt, so to speak, that she had her hand on the throttle, and the neighborhood was vocal with her rejoicings. Yet her friends would shake their heads and tell her to go slow. One could not count upon such good fortune forever. There were accidents that always happened. But Maria was not to be prevailed upon, and went on planning and dreaming of all the treasures she was going to have for her home. And so, when the crash did come, her grief was painful to see. For her canning factory shut down. Maria would about as soon have expected to see the sun shut down. The huge establishment had been to her a thing akin to the planets and the seasons, but now it was shut. And they had not given her any explanation, they had not even given her a day's warning. They had simply posted a notice one Saturday that all hands would be paid off that afternoon and would not resume work for at least a month, and that was all there was to it. Her job was gone. It was the holiday rush that was over, the girl said in answer to Maria's inquiries. After that there was always a slack. Sometimes the factory would start up on half-time after a while, but there was no telling. It had been known to stay closed until way into the summer. The prospects were bad at present, for truckmen who worked in the storerooms said that these were piled up to the ceilings, so that the firm could not have found room for another week's output of cans, and they had turned off three-quarters of these men, which was a still worse sign, since it meant that there were no orders to be filled. It was all a swindle, can-painting, said the girls. You were crazy with delight because you were making twelve or fourteen dollars a week, and saving half of it, but you had to spend it all keeping alive while you were out, and so your pay was really only half what you thought. 
Maria came home, and because she was a person who could not rest without danger of explosion, they first had a great house-cleaning, and then she set out to search Packingtown for a job to fill up the gap. As nearly all the canning establishments were shut down, and all the girls hunting work, it will be readily understood that Maria did not find any. Then she took to trying the stores and saloons, and when this failed she even traveled over into the far distant regions near the lake front, where lived the rich people in great palaces, and begged there for some sort of work that could be done by a person who did not know English. The men upon the killing beds felt also the effects of the slump which had turned Maria out, but they felt it in a different way and a way which made Jurgis understand at last all their bitterness. The big packers did not turn their hands off and close down like the canning factories, but they began to run for shorter and shorter hours. They had always required the men to be on the killing beds and ready for work at seven o'clock, although there was almost never any work to be done till the buyers out in the yards had gotten to work, and some cattle had come over the chutes. That would often be ten or eleven o'clock, which was bad enough in all conscience. But now, in the slack season, they would perhaps not have a thing for their men to do till late in the afternoon. And so they would have to loaf around, in a place where the thermometer might be twenty degrees below zero. At first one would see them running about, or skylarking with each other, trying to keep warm, but before the day was over they would become quite chilled through and exhausted, and when the cattle finally came, so near frozen that to move was an agony. And then suddenly the place would spring into activity, and the merciless speeding up would begin. There were weeks at a time when Jurgis went home after such a day as this with not more than two hours' work to his credit, which meant about thirty-five cents. There were many days when the total was less than half an hour, and others when there was none at all. The general average was six hours a day, which meant for Jurgis about six dollars a week, and this six hours of work wouldn't be done after standing on the killing bed till one o'clock, or perhaps even three or four o'clock in the afternoon. Like as not, there would come a rush of cattle at the very end of the day, which the men would have to dispose of before they went home, often working by electric light till nine or ten, or even twelve or one o'clock, and without a single instant for a bite of supper. The men were at the mercy of the cattle. Perhaps the buyers would be holding off for better prices, if they could scare the shippers into thinking that they meant to buy nothing that day, they could get their own terms. For some reason the cost of fodder for cattle in the yards was much above the market price, and you were not allowed to bring your own fodder. Then, too, a number of cars were apt to arrive late in the day, now that the roads were blocked with snow, and the packers would buy their cattle that night to get them cheaper, and then would come into play their ironclad rule, that all cattle must be killed the same day they were bought. There was no use kicking about this. There had been one delegation after another to see the packers about it, only to be told that it was the rule, and that there was not the slightest chance of its ever being altered. And so on Christmas Eve Jurgis worked till nearly one o'clock in the morning, and on Christmas Day he was on the killing bed at seven o'clock. All this was bad, and yet it was not the worst for after all the hard work a man did, he was paid for only part of it. Jurgis had once been among those who scoffed at the idea of these huge concerns cheating, and so now he could appreciate the bitter irony of the fact that it was precisely their size which enabled them to do it with impunity. One of the rules on the killing beds was that a man who was one minute late was docked an hour, and this was economical for he was made to work the balance of the hour, he was not allowed to stand round and wait, and on the other hand, if he came ahead of time, he got no pay for that, though often the bosses would start up the gang ten or fifteen minutes before the whistle. And this same custom they carried over to the end of the day. 
They did not pay for any fraction of an hour for a broken time. A man might work full fifty minutes, but if there was no work to fill out the hour, there was no pay for him. Thus the end of every day was a sort of lottery, a struggle all but breaking into open war between the bosses and the men, the former trying to rush a job through and the latter trying to stretch it out. Jurgis blamed the bosses for this, though the truth to be told it was not always their fault, for the packers kept them frightened for their lives, and when one was in danger of falling behind the standard, what was easier than to catch up by making the gang work a while for the church? This was a savage witticism the men had, which Jurgis had to have explained to him. Old man Jones was great on missions and such things, and so, whenever they were doing some particularly disreputable job, the men would wink at each other and say, "'Now we're working for the church.' One of the consequences of all these things was that Jurgis was no longer perplexed when he heard the men talk of fighting for their rights. He felt like fighting now himself, and when the Irish delegate of the Butcher's Helpers Union came to him a second time, he received him in a far different spirit. A wonderful idea it now seemed to Jurgis, this of the men, that by combining they might be able to make a stand and conquer the packers. Jurgis wondered who had first thought of it, and when he was told that it was a common thing for men to do in America, he got the first inkling of a meaning in the phrase of free country. The delegate explained to him how it depended upon their being able to get every man to join and stand by the organization and so Jurgis signified that he was willing to do his share. Before another month was by, all the working members of his family had union cards, and wore their union buttons conspicuously and with pride. For fully a week they were quite blissfully happy, thinking that belonging to a union meant an end to all their troubles. But only ten days after she had joined, Maria's canning factory closed down and that blow quite staggered them. They could not understand why the Union had not prevented it, and the very first time she attended a meeting Maria got up and made a speech about it. It was a business meeting, and was transacted in English, but that made no difference to Maria. She said what was in her, and all the pounding of the chairman's gavel and all the uproar and confusion in the room could not prevail. Quite apart from her own troubles she was boiling over with a general sense of the injustice of it, and she told what she thought of the packers and what she thought of a world where such things were allowed to happen. And then, while the echoes of the hall rang with the shock of her terrible voice, she sat down again and fanned herself, and the meeting gathered itself together and proceeded to discuss the election of a recording secretary. Jurgis, too, had an adventure for the first time he attended a union meeting, but it was not of his own seeking. Jurgis had gone with the desire to get into an inconspicuous corner and see what was done, but this attitude of silent and open-eyed attention had marked him out for a victim. Tommy Finnegan was a little Irishman, with big staring eyes and a wild aspect, a hoister by trade, and badly cracked. Somewhere back in the far distant past Tommy Finnegan had had a strange experience, and the burden of it rested upon him. All the balance of his life he had done nothing but try to make it understood. When he talked he caught his victim by the buttonhole, and his face kept coming closer and closer, which was trying because his teeth were so bad. Jurgis did not mind that, only he was frightened. The method of operation of the higher intelligences was Tom Finnegan's theme, and he desired to find out if Jurgis had ever considered that the representation of things in their present similarity might be altogether unintelligible upon a more elevated plane. There were assuredly wonderful mysteries about the developing of these things, and then, becoming confidential, Mr. Finnegan proceeded to tell of some discoveries of his own. "'If ye ever had anything to do with spirits,' said he, and looked inquiringly at Jurgis, who kept shaking his head. "'Never mind, never mind,' continued the other. 
but their influences may be operatin' upon ye. It's sure as I'm tellin' ye, it's them that has the reference to the immediate surroundings that has the most of power. It was vouchsafed to me in me youthful days to be acquainted with spirits. And so Tommy Finnegan went on, expounding a system of philosophy, while the perspiration came out on Jurgis' forehead, so great was his agitation and embarrassment. In the end one of the men, seeing his plight, came over and rescued him, but it was some time before he was able to find anyone to explain things to him, and meanwhile his fear, lest the strange little Irishman should get him cornered again, was enough to keep him dodging about the room the whole evening. He never missed a meeting, however. He had picked up a few words of English by this time, and friends would help him to understand. They were often very turbulent meetings, with half a dozen men declaiming at once in as many dialects of English, but the speakers were all desperately in earnest, and Jurgis was in earnest too, for he understood that a fight was on, and that it was his fight. Since the time of his disillusionment Jurgis had sworn to trust no man, except in his own family but here he discovered that he had brothers in affliction and allies. Their one chance for life was in union, and so the struggle became a kind of crusade. Jurgis had always been a member of the church, because it was the right thing to be, but the church had never touched him. He left all that for the women. Here, however, was a new religion, one that did touch him, that took hold of every fiber of him, and with all the zeal and fury of a convert he went out as a missionary. There were many non-union men among the Lithuanians, and with these he would labor and wrestle in prayer, trying to show them the right. Sometimes they would be obstinate and refuse to see it, and Jurgis at last was not always patient. He forgot how he himself had been blind a short time ago, after the fashion of all crusaders since the original ones, who set out to spread the gospel of brotherhood by force of arms. End of chapter 8 Recording by Tom Weiss Chapter 9 of The Jungle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss THE JUNGLE BY UPTON SINCLAIR CHAPTER Nine. One of the first consequences of the discovery of the Union was that Jurgis became desirous of learning English. He wanted to know what was going on at the meetings, and to be able to take part in them, and so he began to look about him and to try to pick up words. The children, who were at school and learning fast, would teach him a few and a friend loaned him a little book that had some in it, and Ona would read them to him. Then Jurgis became sorry that he could not read himself, and later on in the winter, when someone told him that there was a night school that was free, he went and enrolled. After that, every evening that he got home from the yards in time, he would go to the school. He would go even if he were in time for only half an hour. They were teaching him both to read and to speak English, and they would have taught him other things if only he had had a little time. Also the Union made another great difference with him. It made him begin to pay attention to the country. It was the beginning of democracy with him. It was a little state, the Union, a miniature republic. Its affairs were every man's affairs and every man had a real say about them. In other words, in the Union Jurgis learned to talk politics. In the place where he had come from there had not been any politics. In Russia one thought of the government as an affliction, like the lightning and the hail. "'Duck, little brother, duck!' the wise old peasants would whisper. "'Everything passes away.' And when Jurgis had first come to America he had supposed that it was the same. He had heard people say that it was a free country, but what did that mean? He found that here 
precisely as in Russia, there were rich men who owned everything, and if one could not find any work, was not the hunger he began to feel the same sort of hunger? When Jurgis had been working about three weeks at Brown's, there had come to him one noontime a man who was employed as a night watchman, and who asked him if he would not like to take out naturalization papers and become a citizen. Jurgis did not know what that meant, but the man explained the advantages. In the first place it would not cost him anything, and it would get him half a day off, with his pay just the same. And then when election time came he would be able to vote, and there was something in that. Jurgis was naturally glad to accept, and so the night watchman said a few words to the boss, and he was excused for the rest of the day. When, later on, he wanted a holiday to get married, he could not get it, and as for a holiday with pay just the same, what power had wrought that miracle heaven only knew? However, he went with the man, who picked up several other newly landed immigrants, Poles, Lithuanians, and Slovaks, and took them all outside, where stood a great four-horse tallyho coach, with fifteen or twenty men already in it. It was a fine chance to see the sights of the city, and the party had a merry time, with plenty of beer handed up from inside. So they drove downtown and stopped before an imposing granite building, in which they interviewed an official who had the papers all ready, with only the names to be filled in. So each man in turn took an oath, of which he did not understand a word, and then was presented with a handsome ornamented document with a big red seal and the shield of the United States upon it, and was told that he had become a citizen of the Republic and the equal of the President himself. A month or two later Jurgis had another interview with this same man, who told him where to go to register, and then finally, when election day came, the packing houses posted a notice that men who desired to vote might remain away until nine that morning, and the same night watchman took Jurgis and the rest of his flock into the back room of a saloon and showed each of them where and how to mark a ballot, and then gave each two dollars and took them to the polling place, where there was a policeman on duty, especially to see that they got through all right. Jurgis felt quite proud of this good luck, till he got home and met Jonas, who had taken the leader aside and whispered to him, offering to vote three times for four dollars, which offer had been accepted. And now in the Union Jurgis met men who explained all this mystery to him, and he learned that America differed from Russia in that its government existed under the form of a democracy. The officials who ruled it and got all the graft had to be elected first, and so there were two rival sets of grafters, known as political parties, and the one got the office who bought the most votes. Now and then the election was very close, and that was the time the poor man came in. In the stockyards this was only in national and state elections, for in local elections the Democratic Party always carried everything. The ruler of the district was therefore the Democratic boss, a little Irishman named Mike Scully. Scully held an important party office in the state, and bossed even the mayor of the city, it was said. It was his boast that he carried the stockyards in his pocket. He was an enormously rich man. He had a hand in all the big graft in the neighborhood. It was Scully, for instance, who owned that dump which Jurgis and Ona had seen the first day of their arrival. Not only did he own the dump, but he owned the brick factory as well, and first he took out the clay and made it into bricks, and then he had the city bring garbage to fill up the hole so that he could build houses to sell to the people. Then, too, he sold the bricks to the city at his own price, and the city came and got them in its wagons. And also he owned the other hole nearby, where the stagnant water was. 
and it was he who cut the ice and sold it, and what was more, if the men told truth, he had not had to pay any taxes for the water, and he had built the ice house out of city lumber, and had not had to pay anything for that. The newspapers had got hold of that story, and there had been a scandal, but Scully had hired somebody to confess and take all the blame, and then skip the country. It was said, too, that he had built his brick kiln in the same way, and that the workmen were on the city payroll while they did it. However, one had to press closely to get these things out of the men, for it was not their business, and Mike Scully was a good man to stand in with. A note signed by him was equal to a job any time at the packing-houses, and also he employed a good many men himself, and worked them only eight hours a day, and paid them the highest wages. This gave him many friends, all of whom he had gotten together into the War Whoop League, whose clubhouse you might see just outside the yards. It was the biggest clubhouse and the biggest club in all Chicago, and they had prize-fights every now and then, and cock-fights, and even dog-fights. The policemen in the district all belonged to the League, and instead of suppressing the fights they sold tickets for them. The man that had taken Jurgis to be naturalized was one of these Indians, as they were called, and on election day there would be hundreds of them out and all with big wads of money in their pockets, and free drinks at every saloon in the district. That was another thing, the men said. All the saloon-keepers had to be Indians, and to put up on demand, otherwise they could not do business on Sundays, nor have any gambling at all. In the same way Scully had all the jobs in the fire department at his disposal, and all the rest of the city graft in the stockyards district. He was building a block of flats somewhere up on Ashland Avenue, and the man who was overseeing it for him was drawing pay as a city inspector of sewers. The city inspector of water pipes had been dead and buried for over a year, but somebody was still drawing his pay. The city inspector of sidewalks was a barkeeper at the War Whoop Café, and maybe he could make it uncomfortable for any tradesman who did not stand in with Sully. Even the packers were in awe of him, so the men said. It gave them pleasure to believe this, for Scully stood as the people's man, and boasted of it boldly when election day came. The packers had wanted a bridge at Ashland Avenue, but they had not been able to get it till they had seen Scully. And it was the same with Bubbly Creek which the city had threatened to make the packers cover over till Scully had come to their aid. Bubbly Creek is an arm of the Chicago River, and forms the southern boundary of the yards. All the drainage of the square mile of packing houses empties into it, so that it is really a great open sewer a hundred or two feet wide. One long arm of it is blind, and the filth stays there forever and a day. The grease and chemicals that are poured into it undergo all sorts of strange transformations, which are the cause of its name. It is constantly in motion, as if huge fish were feeding in it, or great leviathans disporting themselves in its depths. Bubbles of carbonic acid gas will rise to the surface and burst, and make rings two or three feet wide. Here and there the grease and filth have caked solid, and the creek looks like a bed of lava. Chickens walk about on it, feeding, and many times an unwary stranger has started to stroll across and vanished temporarily. The packers used to leave the creek that way, till every now and then the surface would catch on fire and burn furiously, and the fire department would have to come and put it out. Once, however, an ingenious stranger came and started to gather this filth in scows, to make lard out of, and then the packers took the cue, and got an injunction to stop him, and afterward gathered it themselves. The banks of Bubbly Creek are plastered thick with hairs, and this also the packers gather and clean. And there were things even stranger than this, according to the gossip of the men. 
The packers had secret mains through which they stole billions of gallons of the city's water. The newspapers had been full of this scandal. Once there had even been an investigation and an actual uncovering of the pipes, but nobody had been punished, and the thing went right on. And then there was the condemned meat industry, with its endless horrors. The people of Chicago saw the government inspectors in Packingtown, and they all took that to mean that they were protected from diseased meat. They did not understand that these hundred and sixty-three inspectors had been appointed at the request of the packers, and that they were paid by the United States government to certify that all the diseased meat was kept in the state. They had no authority beyond that. For the inspection of meat to be sold in the city and state the whole force in Packingtown consisted of three henchmen of the local political machine. Rules and Regulations for the Inspection of Livestock and Their Products United States Department of Agriculture, Bureau of Animal Industries, Order No. 125 Section 1 Proprietors of Slaughterhouses, Canning, salting, packing, or rendering establishments engaged in the slaughtering of cattle, sheep, or swine, or the packing of any of their products, the carcasses or products of which are to become subjects of interstate or foreign commerce, shall make application to the Secretary of Agriculture for inspection of said animals and their products. Section 15 such rejected or condemned animals shall at once be removed by the owners from the pens containing animals which have been inspected and found to be free from disease and fit for human food, and shall be disposed of in accordance with the laws, ordinances, and regulations of the state and municipality in which said rejected or condemned animals are located. Section 25. A Microscopic Examination for Trichini made of all swine products exported to countries requiring such examination. No microscopic examination will be made of hogs slaughtered for interstate trade, but this examination shall be confined to those intended for the export trade. And shortly afterward one of these, a physician, made the discovery that the carcasses of steers which had been condemned as tubercular by the government inspectors, and which therefore contained tomains, which are deadly poisons, were left upon an open platform and carted away to be sold in the city. And so he insisted that these carcasses be treated with an injection of kerosene, and was ordered to resign the same week. So indignant were the packers that they went farther and compelled the mayor to abolish the whole Bureau of Inspection, so that since then there has not been even a pretense of any interference with the graft. There was said to be two thousand dollars a week hush money from the tubercular steers alone, and as much again from the hogs which had died of cholera on the trains, and which you might see any day being loaded into box-cars and hauled away to a place called Globe in Indiana, where they made a fancy grade of lard. Jurgis heard of these things little by little, in the gossip of those who were obliged to perpetrate them. It seemed as if every time you met a person from a new department you heard of new swindles and new crimes. There was, for instance, a Lithuanian who was a cattle butcher for the plant where Maria had worked, which killed meat for canning only, and to hear this man describe the animals which came to his place would have been worth while for a Dante or a Zola. It seemed that they must have agencies all over the country to hunt out old and crippled and diseased cattle to be canned. There were cattle which had been fed on whiskey malt, the refuse of the breweries, and had become what the men called steerly, which means covered with boils. It was a nasty job killing these, for when you plunged your knife into them they would burst and splash foul-smelling stuff into your face and when a man's sleeves were smeared with blood and his hands steeped in it, how was he ever to wipe his face or to clear his eyes so that he could see? It was stuff such as this that made the embalmed beef that had killed several times as many United States soldiers 
as all the bullets of the Spaniards. Only the army beef, besides, was not fresh canned, it was old stuff that had been lying for years in the cellars. Then, one Sunday evening, Jurgis sat puffing his pipe by the kitchen stove, and talking with an old fellow whom Jonas had introduced, and who worked in the canning rooms at Durham's, and so Jurgis learned a few things about the great and only Durham canned goods, which had become a national institution. They were regular alchemists at Durham's. They advertised a mushroom ketchup, and the men who made it did not know what a mushroom looked like. They advertised potted chicken, and it was like the boarding-house soup of the comic papers through which a chicken had walked with rubbers on. Perhaps they had a secret process for making chickens chemically. Who knows? said Jurgis' friend. The things that went into the mixture were tripe, and the fat of pork, and beef suet, and hearts of beef, and finally the waste ends of veal, when they had any. They put these up in several grades, and sold them at several prices, but the contents of the cans all came out of the same hopper. And then there was potted game, and potted grouse, potted ham, and deviled ham, deviled, as the men called it. Deviled ham was made out of the waste ends of smoked beef that were too small to be sliced by the machines, and also tripe, dyed with chemicals, so that it would not show white, and trimmings of hams and corned beef, and potatoes, skins and all, and finally the hard cartilaginous gullets of beef, after the tongues had been cut out. All this ingenious mixture was ground up and flavored with spices to make it taste like something. Anybody who could invent a new imitation had been sure of a fortune from old Durham, said Jurgis' informant. But it was hard to think of anything new in a place where so many sharp wits had been at work for so long, where men welcomed tuberculosis in the cattle they were feeding because it made them fatten more quickly, and where they bought up all the old rancid butter left over in the grocery stores of a continent and oxidized it by a forced air process, to take away the odor, re-churned it with skim milk, and sold it in bricks in the cities. Up to a year or two ago it had been the custom to kill horses in the yards, ostensibly for fertilizer, but after long agitation the newspapers had been able to make the public realize that the horses were being canned. Now it was against the law to kill horses in Packingtown and the law was really complied with, for the present at any rate. Any day, however, one might see sharp-horned and shaggy-haired creatures running with the sheep, and yet what a job you would have to get the public to believe that a good part of what it buys for lamb and mutton is really goat's flesh. There was another interesting set of statistics that a person might have gathered in Packingtown, those of the various afflictions of the workers. When Jurgis had first inspected the packing plants with Shedvilas, he had marveled while he listened to the tale of all the things that were made out of the carcasses of animals, and of all the lesser industries that were maintained there. Now he found that each one of these lesser industries was a separate little inferno, in its way as horrible as the killing beds, the source and fountain of them all. The workers in each of them had their own peculiar diseases, and the wandering visitor might be skeptical about all the swindles, but he could not be skeptical about these, for the worker bore the evidence of them about on his own person. Generally he had only to hold out his hand. There were the men in the pickle rooms, for instance, where old Antanas had gotten his death. Scarce a one of these that had not some spot of horror on his person. Let a man so much as scrape his finger pushing a truck into the pickle room, and he might have a sore that would put him out of the world. All the joints in his fingers might be eaten by the acid, one by one. Of the butchers and floorsmen, the beef boners and trimmers, and all those who used knives, you could scarcely find a person who had the use of his thumb. Time and again the base of it had been slashed, 
till it was a mere lump of flesh against which the men pressed the knife to hold it. The hands of these men would be crisscrossed with cuts, until you could no longer pretend to count them or to trace them. They would have no nails, they had worn them off pulling hides, their knuckles were swollen so that their fingers spread out like a fan. There were men who worked in the cooking rooms, in the midst of steam and sickening odors, by artificial light. In these rooms the germs of tuberculosis might live for two years, but the supply was renewed every hour. There were the beef-luggers, who carried two-hundred-pound quarters into the refrigerator cars, a fearful kind of work that began at four o'clock in the morning and that wore out the most powerful men in a few years. There were those who worked in the chilling rooms, and whose special disease was rheumatism. The time limit that a man could work in the chilling rooms was said to be five years. There were the wool-pluckers, whose hands went to pieces even sooner than the hands of the fickle men, for the pelts of the sheep had to be painted with acid to loosen the wool, and then the pluckers had to pull out this wool with their bare hands till the acid had eaten their fingers off. There were those who made the tins for the canned meat, and their hands too were a maze of cuts, and each cut represented a chance for blood poisoning. Some worked at the stamping machines, and it was very seldom that one could work long there at the pace that was set, and not give out and forget himself and have a part of his hand chopped off. There were the hoisters, as they were called, whose task it was to press the lever which lifted the dead cattle off the floor. They ran along upon a rafter, peering down through the damp and the steam, and as old Durham's architects had not built the killing room for the convenience of the hoisters, at every few feet they would have to stoop under a beam, say four feet above the one they ran on, which got them into the habit of stooping, so that in a few years they would be walking like chimpanzees. Worst of any, however, were the fertilizer men, and those who served in the cooking rooms. These people could not be shown to a visitor, for the odor of a fertilizer man would scare any ordinary visitor at a hundred yards, and as for the other men who worked in tank rooms full of steam, and in some of which there were open vats near the level of the floor, their peculiar trouble was that they fell into the vats, and when they were fished out there was never enough of them left to be worth exhibiting. Sometimes they would be overlooked for days, till all but the bones of them had gone out to the world as Durham's pure leaf lard. End of chapter 9 Recording by Tom Weiss Chapter 10 of The Jungle this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Chapter 10. During the early part of the winter, the family had had money enough to live and a little over to pay their debts with. But when the earnings of Jurgis fell from nine or ten dollars a week to five or six, there was no longer anything to spare. The winter went and the spring came, and found them still living thus from hand to mouth, hanging on day by day with literally not a month's wages between them and starvation. Maria was in despair, for there was still no word about the reopening of the canning factory, and her savings were almost entirely gone. She had had to give up all idea of marrying then. The family could not get along without her though for that matter she was likely soon to become a burden even upon them, for when her money was all gone they would have to pay back what they owed her in board. So Jurgis and Ona and Teta Elzbeta would hold anxious conferences until late at night, trying to figure out how they could manage this, too, without starving. Such were the cruel terms upon which their life was possible, that they might never have nor expect a single instant's respite from worry, a single instant in which they were not haunted by the thought of money. They would no sooner escape as by a miracle from one difficulty than a new one would come into view. 
In addition to all their physical hardships, there was thus a constant strain upon their minds. They were harried all day and nearly all night by worry and fear. This was in truth not living. It was scarcely even existing, and they felt that it was too little for the price they paid. They were willing to work all the time, and when people did their best ought they not to be able to keep alive? There seemed never to be an end to the things they had to buy and to the unforeseen contingencies. Once their water pipes froze and burst, and when, in their ignorance, they thawed them out, they had a terrifying flood in their house. It happened while the men were away, and poor Elzbieta rushed out into the street screaming for help, for she did not even know whether the flood could be stopped or whether they were ruined for life. It was nearly as bad as the latter, they found in the end, for the plumber charged them seventy-five cents an hour, and seventy-five cents for another man who had stood and watched him, and included all the time the two had been going and coming, and also a charge for all sorts of materials and extras. And then again, when they went to pay their January's installment on the house, the agent terrified them by asking them if they had had the insurance attended to yet. In answer to their inquiry he showed them a clause in the deed which provided that they were to keep the house insured for one thousand dollars as soon as the present policy ran out, which would happen in a few days. Poor Elzbieta, upon whom again fell the blow, demanded how much it would cost them. Seven dollars, the man said, and that night came Jurgis, grim and determined, requesting that the agent would be good enough to inform him, once and for all, as to all the expenses they were liable for. The deed was signed now, he said, with sarcasm proper to the new way of life he had learned. The deed was signed, and so the agent had no longer anything to gain by keeping quiet. And Jurgis looked the fellow squarely in the eye. And so the fellow wasted no time in conventional protests, but read him the deed. They would have to renew the insurance every year. They would have to pay the taxes, about ten dollars a year. They would have to pay the water tax, about six dollars a year. Jurgis silently resolved to shut off the hydrant. This, besides the interest and the monthly installments, would be all, unless by chance the city should happen to decide to put in a sewer or to lay a sidewalk. Yes, said the agent, they would have to have these whether they wanted them or not, if the city said so. The sewer would cost them about twenty-two dollars, and the sidewalk fifteen if it were wood, twenty-five if it were cement. So Jurgis went home again. It was a relief to know the worst at any rate, so that he could no more be surprised by fresh demands. He saw now how they had been plundered, but they were in for it. There was no turning back. They could only go on and make the fight and win, for defeat was a thing that could not even be thought of. When the springtime came they were delivered from the dreadful cold, and that was a great deal. But in addition they had counted on the money they would not have to pay for coal, and it was just at this time that Maria's board began to fail. Then, too, the warm weather brought trials of its own. Each season had its trials, as they found. In the spring there were cold rains that turned the streets into canals and bogs. The mud would be so deep that wagons would sink up to the hubs, so that half a dozen horses could not move them. Then, of course, it was impossible for anyone to get to work with dry feet, and this was bad for men that were poorly clad and shod, and still worse for women and children. Later came midsummer, with the stifling heat, when the dingy killing beds of Durham's became a very purgatory. One time, in a single day, three men fell dead from sunstroke. All day long the rivers of hot blood poured forth, until, with the sun beating down and the air motionless, the stench was enough to knock a man over. All the old smells of a generation would be drawn out by this heat, for there was never any washing of the walls and rafters and pillars, and they were caked with the filth of a lifetime. 
the men who worked on the killing beds would come to reek with foulness, so that you could smell one of them fifty feet away. There was simply no such thing as keeping decent. The most careful man gave it up in the end, and wallowed in uncleanness. There was not even a place where a man could wash his hands, and the men ate as much raw blood as food at dinner-time. When they were at work they could not even wipe off their faces, they were as helpless as newly born babes in that respect. And it may seem like a small matter, but when the sweat began to run down their necks and tickle them, or a fly to bother them, it was a torture like being burned alive. Whether it was the slaughterhouses or the dumps that were responsible one could not say, but with the hot weather there descended upon Packingtown a veritable Egyptian plague of flies. There could be no describing this. The houses would be black with them. There was no escaping. You might provide all your doors and windows with screens, but their buzzing outside would be like the swarming of bees, and whenever you opened the door they would rush in as if a storm of wind were driving them. Perhaps the summertime suggests to you thoughts of the country, visions of green fields and mountains and sparkling lakes. It had no such suggestion for the people in the yards. The great packing machine ground on remorselessly, without thinking of green fields, and the men and women and children who were part of it never saw any green thing, not even a flower. Four or five miles to the east of them lay the blue waters of Lake Michigan, but for all the good it did them it might have been as far away as the Pacific Ocean. They had only Sundays, and then they were too tired to walk. They were tied to the great packing machine, and tied to it for life. The managers and superintendents and clerks of Packingtown were all recruited from another class, and never from the workers. They scorned the workers, the very meanest of them. A poor devil of a bookkeeper who had been working in Durham's for twenty years at a salary of six dollars a week, and might work there for twenty more and do no better, would yet consider himself a gentleman, as far removed as the poles from the most skilled worker on the killing beds. He would dress differently, and live in another part of the town, and come to work at a different hour of the day, and in every way make sure that he never rubbed elbows with a laboring man. Perhaps this was due to the repulsiveness of the work. At any rate, the people who worked with their hands were a class apart, and were made to feel it. In the late spring the canning factory started up again, and so once more Maria was heard to sing, and the love music of Timotius took on a less melancholy tone. It was not for long, however, for a month or two later a dreadful calamity fell upon Maria. Just one year and three days after she had begun work as a can painter she lost her job. It was a long story. Maria insisted that it was because of her activity in the Union. The packers, of course, had spies in all the Unions, and in addition they made a practice of buying up a certain number of the Union officials, as many as they thought they needed. So every week they received reports as to what was going on, and often they knew things before the members of the Union knew them. Anyone who was considered to be dangerous by them would find that he was not a favorite with his boss, and Maria had been a great hand for going after the foreign people and preaching to them. However that might be, the known facts were that a few weeks before the factory closed Maria had been cheated out of her pay for three hundred cans. The girls worked at a long table, and behind them walked a woman with pencil and notebook keeping count of the number they finished. This woman was, of course, only human, and sometimes made mistakes. When this happened there was no redress. If on Saturday you got less money than you had earned, you had to make the best of it. But Maria did not understand this, and made a disturbance. Maria's disturbances did not mean anything, and while she had known only Lithuanian and Polish they had done no harm, for people only laughed at her and made her cry. 
but now Maria was able to call names in English, and so she got the woman who made the mistake to disliking her. Probably, as Maria claimed, she made mistakes on purpose after that. At any rate, she made them, and the third time it happened Maria went on the warpath and took the matter first to the forelady, and when she got no satisfaction there, to the superintendent. This was unheard of presumption. But the superintendent said he would see about it, which Maria took to mean that she was going to get her money. After waiting three days she went to see the superintendent again. This time the man frowned, and said that he had not had time to attend to it, and when Maria, against the advice and warning of every one, tried it once more, he ordered her back to her work in a passion. Just how things happened after that Maria was not sure, but that afternoon the forelady told her that her services would not be any longer required. Poor Maria could not have been more dumbfounded had the woman knocked her over the head. At first she could not believe what she heard, and then she grew furious and swore that she would come anyway, that her place belonged to her. In the end she sat down in the middle of the floor and wept and wailed. It was a cruel lesson, but then Maria was headstrong. She should have listened to those who had had experience. The next time she would know her place, as the poor lady expressed it. And so Maria went out, and the family faced the problem of an existence again. It was especially hard this time, for Ona was to be confined before long, and Jurgis was trying hard to save up money for this. He had heard dreadful stories of the midwives, who grow as thick as fleas in Packingtown, and he had made up his mind that Ona must have a man-doctor. Jurgis could be very obstinate when he wanted to, and he was, in this case, much to the dismay of the women, who felt that a man-doctor was an impropriety, and that the matter really belonged to them. The cheapest doctor they could find would charge them fifteen dollars, and perhaps more when the bill came in, and here was Jurgis declaring that he would pay it, even if he had to stop eating in the meantime. Maria had only about twenty-five dollars left. Day after day she wandered about the yards begging a job, but this time without hope of finding it. Maria could do the work of an able-bodied man when she was cheerful, but discouragement wore her out easily, and she would come home at night a pitiable object. She learned her lesson this time, poor creature. She learned it ten times over. All the family learned it along with her, that when you have once got a job in Packingtown you hang on to it, come what will. Four weeks Maria hunted, and half of a fifth week. Of course she stopped paying her dues to the Union. She lost all interest in the Union, and cursed herself for a fool that she had ever been dragged into one. She had about made up her mind that she was a lost soul when somebody told her of an opening, and she went and got a place as a beef trimmer. She got this because the boss saw that she had the muscles of a man, and so he discharged the man and put Maria to do his work, paying her a little more than half what he had been paying before. When she first came to Packingtown Maria would have scorned such work as this. She was in another canning factory, and her work was to trim the meat of those diseased cattle that Jurgis had been told about not long before. She was shut up in one of the rooms where the people seldom saw the daylight. Beneath her were the chilling rooms where the meat was frozen, and above her were the cooking rooms. And so she stood on an ice-cold floor while her head was often so hot that she could scarcely breathe. Trimming beef off the bones by the hundredweight, while standing up from early morning till late at night, with heavy boots on and the floor always damp and full of puddles, liable to be thrown out of work indefinitely because of a slackening in the trade, liable again to be kept overtime in rush seasons, and be worked till she trembled in every nerve and lost her grip on her slimy knife and gave herself a poisoned wound. That was the new life that unfolded itself before Maria. 
but because Maria was a human horse she merely laughed and went at it. It would enable her to pay her board again and keep the family going. And as for Timotius, well, they had waited a long time and they could wait a little longer. They could not possibly get along upon his wages alone, and the family could not live without hers. He would come and visit her and sit in the kitchen and hold her hand, and he must manage to be content with that. But day by day the music of Timotius' violin became more passionate and heartbreaking, and Maria would sit with her hands clasped and her cheeks wet and all her body a-tremble, hearing in the wailing melodies the voices of the unborn generations which cried out in her for life. Maria's lesson came just in time to save Ona from a similar fate. Ona, too, was dissatisfied with her place, and had far more reason than Maria. She did not tell half of her story at home, because she saw it was a torment to Jurgis, and she was afraid of what he might do. For a long time Ona had seen that Miss Henderson, the forelady in her department, did not like her. At first she thought it was the old-time mistake she had made in asking for a holiday to get married. Then she concluded it must be because she did not give the forelady a present occasionally. She was the kind that took presents from the girls, Ona learned, and made all sorts of discriminations in favor of those who gave them. In the end, however, Ona discovered that it was even worse than that. Miss Henderson was a newcomer, and it was some time before rumor made her out, but finally it transpired that she was a kept woman, the former mistress of the superintendent of a department in the same building. He had put her there to keep her quiet, it seemed, and that not altogether with success, for once or twice they had been heard quarreling. She had the temper of a hyena, and soon the place she ran was a witch's cauldron. There were some of the girls who were of her own sort, who were willing to toady to her and flatter her, and these would carry tales about the rest, and so the furies were unchained in the place. Worse than this, the woman lived in a bawdy house downtown, with a coarse red-faced Irishman named Connor, who was the boss of the loading gang outside, and would make free with the girls as they went to and from their work. In the slack seasons some of them would go with Miss Henderson to this house downtown. In fact, it would not be too much to say that she managed her department at Brown's in conjunction with it. Sometimes women from the house would be given places alongside of decent girls, and after other decent girls had been turned off to make room for them. When you worked in this woman's department the house downtown was never out of your thoughts all day. There were always whiffs of it to be caught, like the odor of the Packingtown rendering plants at night when the wind shifted suddenly. There would be stories about it going the rounds. The girls opposite you would be telling them and winking at you. In such a place Ona would not have stayed a day but for starvation, and, as it was, she was never sure that she could stay the next day. She understood now that the real reason that Miss Henderson hated her was that she was a decent married girl, and she knew that the tale-bearers and the toadies hated her for the same reason, and were doing their best to make her life miserable. But there was no place a girl could go in Packingtown, if she was particular about things of this sort. There was no place in it where a prostitute could not get along better than a decent girl. Here was a population, low class and mostly foreign, hanging always on the verge of starvation, and dependent for its opportunities of life upon the whim of men every bit as brutal and unscrupulous as the old-time slave-drivers. Under such circumstances immorality was exactly as inevitable, and as prevalent as it was under the system of chattel slavery things that were quite unspeakable went on there in the packing-houses all the time, and were taken for granted by everybody. Only they did not show, as in the old slavery times, because there was no difference in color between master and slave. One morning Ona stayed home, and Jurgis had the man-doctor, according to his whim, 
and she was safely delivered of a fine baby. It was an enormous big boy, and Ona was such a tiny creature herself that it seemed quite incredible. Jurgis would stand and gaze at the stranger by the hour, unable to believe that it had really happened. The coming of this boy was a decisive event with Jurgis. It made him irrevocably a family man. It killed the last lingering impulse that he might have had to go out in the evenings and sit and talk with the men in the saloons. There was nothing he cared for now so much as to sit and look at the baby. This was very curious, for Jurgis had never been interested in babies before. But then this was a very unusual sort of a baby. He had the brightest little black eyes and little black ringlets all over his head. He was the living image of his father, everybody said, and Jurgis found this a fascinating circumstance. It was sufficiently perplexing that this tiny mite of life should have come into the world at all in the manner that it had, that it should have come with a comical imitation of its father's nose was simply uncanny. Perhaps, Jurgis thought, this was intended to signify that it was his baby, that it was his and Ona's, to care for all its life. Jurgis had never possessed anything nearly so interesting. A baby was, when you came to think about it, assuredly a marvelous possession. It would grow up to be a man, a human soul, with a personality all its own, a will of its own. Such thoughts would keep haunting Jurgis, filling him with all sorts of strange and almost painful excitements. He was wonderfully proud of little Antonas. He was curious about all the details of him, the washing and the dressing and the eating and the sleeping of him, and asked all sorts of absurd questions. It took him quite a while to get over his alarm at the incredible shortness of the little creature's legs. Jurgis had, alas, very little time to see his baby. He never felt the chains about him more than just then. When he came home at night the baby would be asleep, and it would be the merest chance if he awoke before Jurgis had to go to sleep himself. Then in the morning there was no time to look at him, so really the only chance the father had was on Sundays. This was more cruel yet for Ona, who ought to have stayed home and nursed him, the doctor said, for her own health as well as the baby's, but Ona had to go to work and leave him for Teta Elsbeta to feed upon the pale blue poison that was called milk at the corner grocery. Ona's confinement lost her only a week's wages. She would go to the factory the second Monday, and the best that Jurgis could persuade her was to ride in the car, and let him run along behind, and help her to Brown's when she alighted. After that it would be all right, said Ona. It was no strain sitting still, sewing hands all day, and if she waited longer she might find that her dreadful forelady had put someone else in her place. That would be a greater calamity than ever now, Ona continued, on account of the baby. They would all have to work harder now on his account. It was such a responsibility. They must not have the baby grow up to suffer as they had. And this indeed had been the first thing that Jurgis had thought of himself. He had clenched his hands and braced himself anew for the struggle, for the sake of that tiny mite of human possibility. And so Ona went back to Brown's and saved her place and a week's wages, and so she gave herself some one of the thousand ailments that women group under the title of womb trouble, and was never again a well person as long as she lived. It is difficult to convey in words all that this meant to Ona, it seemed such a slight offense, and the punishment was so out of all proportion that neither she nor anyone else ever connected the two. Womb trouble to Ona did not mean a specialist diagnosis and a course of treatment, and perhaps an operation or two. It meant simply headaches and pains in the back and depression and heart sickness and neuralgia when she had to go to work in the rain. The great majority of the women who worked in Packingtown suffered in the same way, and from the same cause, so it was not deemed a thing to see the doctor about. Instead, Ona would try patent medicines, one after the other, 
as her friends told her about them. As these all contained alcohol or some other stimulant, she found that they all did her good while she took them, and so she was always chasing the phantom of good health and losing it because she was too poor to continue. End of chapter 10 Recording by Tom Weiss Chapter 11 of The Jungle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss The Jungle by Upton Sinclair Chapter 11 During the summer the packing houses were in full activity again, and Jurgis made more money. He did not make so much, however, as he had the previous summer, for the packers took on more hands. There were new men every week, it seemed. It was a regular system, and this number they would keep over to the next slack season, so that everyone would have less than ever. Sooner or later, by this plan, they would have all the floating labor of Chicago trained to do their work, and how very cunning a trick was that! The men were to teach new hands, who would some day come and break their strike, and meantime they were kept so poor that they could not prepare for the trial. But let no one suppose that this superfluity of employees meant easier work for any one. On the contrary, the speeding up seemed to be growing more savage all the time. They were continually inventing new devices to crowd the work on. It was for all the world like the thumbscrew of the medieval torture chamber. They would get new pacemakers and pay them more. They would drive the men on with new machinery. It was said that in the hog-killing rooms the speed at which the hogs moved was determined by clockwork, and that it was increased a little every day. In piecework they would reduce the time, requiring the same work in a shorter time, and paying the same wages, and then after the workers had accustomed themselves to this new speed they would reduce the rate of payment to correspond with the reduction in time. They had done this so often in the canning establishments that the girls were fairly desperate. Their wages had gone down by a full third in the past two years, and a storm of discontent was brewing that was likely to break any day. Only a month after Maria had become a beef trimmer the canning factory that she had left posted a cut that would divide the girls' earnings almost squarely in half, and so great was the indignation at this that they marched outside without even a parley, and organized in the street outside. One of the girls had read somewhere that a red flag was the proper symbol for oppressed workers, and so they mounted one, and paraded all about the yards, yelling with rage. A new union was the result of this outburst, but the impromptu strike went to pieces in three days, owing to the rush of new labor. At the end of it the girl who had carried the red flag went downtown and got a position in a great department store, at a salary of two dollars and a half a week. Jurgis and Ona heard these stories with dismay, for there was no telling when their own time might come. Once or twice there had been rumors that one of the big houses was going to cut its unskilled men to fifteen cents an hour, and Jurgis knew that if this was done his turn would come soon. He had learned by this time that Packingtown was really not a number of firms at all, but one great firm, the Beef Trust, and every week the managers of it got together and compared notes, and there was one scale for all the workers in the yards and one standard of efficiency. Jurgis was told that they also fixed the price they would pay for beef on the hoof, and the price of all dressed meat in the country, but that was something he did not understand or care about. The only one who was not afraid of a cut was Maria, who congratulated herself, somewhat naively, that there had been one in her place only a short time before she came. Maria was getting to be a skilled beef trimmer, and was mounting to the heights again. During the summer and fall Jurgis and Ona managed to pay her back the last penny they owed her, and so she began to have a bank account. 
Timotius had a bank account also, and they ran a race and began to figure upon household expenses once more. The possession of vast wealth entails cares and responsibilities, however, as poor Maria found out. She had taken the advice of a friend and invested her savings in a bank on Ashland Avenue. Of course she knew nothing about it, except that it was big and imposing. What possible chance has a poor foreign working girl to understand the banking business as it is conducted in this land of frenzied finance? So Maria lived in a continual dread lest something should happen to her bank, and would go out of her way mornings to make sure that it was still there. Her principal thought was of fire, for she had deposited her money in bills and was afraid that if they were burned up the bank would not give her any others. Jurgis made fun of her for this, for he was a man and was proud of his superior knowledge, telling her that the bank had fireproof vaults and all its millions of dollars hidden safely away in them. However, one morning Maria took her usual detour and, to her horror and dismay, saw a crowd of people in front of the bank, filling the avenue solid for half a block. All the blood went out of her face for terror. She broke into a run, shouting to the people to ask what was the matter, but not stopping to hear what they answered, till she had come to where the throng was so dense that she could no longer advance. There was a run on the bank, they told her then but she did not know what that was, and turned from one person to another, trying in an agony of fear to make out what they meant. Had something gone wrong with the bank? Nobody was sure, but they thought so. Couldn't she get her money? There was no telling. The people were afraid not, and they were all trying to get it. It was too early yet to tell anything. The bank would not open for nearly three hours. So, in a frenzy of despair, Maria began to claw her way toward the doors of this building, through a throng of men, women, and children, all as excited as herself. It was a scene of wild confusion, women shrieking and wringing their hands and fainting, and men fighting and trampling down everything in their way. In the midst of the melee Maria recollected that she did not have her bank book, and could not get her money anyway so she fought her way out and started on a run for home. This was fortunate for her, for a few minutes later the police reserves arrived. In half an hour Maria was back, Teta Elzbeta with her, both of them breathless with running and sick with fear. The crowd was now formed in a line, extending for several blocks, with half a hundred policemen keeping guard, and so there was nothing for them to do but to take their places at the end of it. At nine o'clock the bank opened and began to pay the waiting throng, but then what good did that do Maria, who saw three thousand people before her, enough to take out the last penny of a dozen banks? To make matters worse a drizzling rain came up and soaked them to the skin, yet all the morning they stood there, creeping slowly toward the goal. All the afternoon they stood there, heartsick, seeing that the hour of closing was coming, and that they were going to be left out. Maria made up her mind that, come what might, she would stay there and keep her place. But as nearly all did the same, all through the long cold night she got very little closer to the bank for that. Toward evening Jurgis came. He had heard the story from the children and he brought some food and dry wraps, which made it a little easier. The next morning, before daybreak, came a bigger crowd than ever, and more policemen from downtown. Maria held on like grim death, and toward afternoon she got into the bank and got her money, all in big silver dollars, a handkerchief full. When she had once got her hands on them her fear vanished, and she wanted to put them back again but the man at the window was savage, and said that the bank would receive no more deposits from those who had taken part in the run. So Maria was forced to take her dollars home with her, watching to right and left, expecting every instant that someone would try to rob her, 
and when she got home she was not much better off. Until she could find another bank there was nothing to do but sew them up in her clothes, and so Maria went about for a week or more, loaded down with bullion and afraid to cross the street in front of the house, because Jurgis told her she would sink out of sight in the mud. Waited this way she made her way to the yards, again in fear, this time to see if she had lost her place. But fortunately about ten percent of the working people of Packingtown had been depositors in that bank, and it was not convenient to discharge that many at once. The cause of the panic had been the attempt of a policeman to arrest a drunken man in a saloon next door, which had drawn a crowd at the hour the people were on their way to work, and so started the run. About this time Jurgis and Ona also began a bank account. Besides having paid Jonas and Maria, they had almost paid for their furniture, and could have that little sum to count on. So long as each of them could bring home nine or ten dollars a week, they were able to get along finely. Also election day came round again, and Jurgis made half a week's wages out of that, all net profit. It was a very close election that year, and the echoes of the battle reached even to Packingtown. The two rival sets of grafters hired halls and set off fireworks and made speeches to try to get the people interested in the matter. Although Jurgis did not understand it all, he knew enough by this time to realize that it was not supposed to be right to sell your vote. However, as everyone did it, and his refusal to join would not have made the slightest difference in the results, the idea of refusing would have seemed absurd had it ever come into his head. Now chill winds and shortening days began to warn them that the winter was coming again. It seemed as if the respite had been too short. They had not had time enough to get ready for it, but still it came, inexorably, and the haunted look began to come back into the eyes of little Stanislavus. The prospect struck fear to the heart of Jurgis also, for he knew that Ona was not fit to face the cold and the snowdrifts this year, and suppose that some day when a blizzard struck them and the cars were not running, Ona should have to give up, and should come the next day to find that her place had been given to someone who lived nearer and could be depended on. It was the week before Christmas that the first storm came, and then the soul of Jurgis rose up within him like a sleeping lion. There were four days that the Ashland Avenue cars were stalled, and in those days, for the first time in his life, Jurgis knew what it was to be really opposed. He had faced difficulties before, but they had been child's play. Now there was a death struggle, and all the furies were unchained within him. The first morning they set out two hours before dawn, Ona wrapped up all in blankets and tossed upon his shoulder like a sack of meal, and the little boy, bundled nearly out of sight, hanging by his coat-tails. There was a raging blast beating in his face, and the thermometer stood below zero. The snow was never short of his knees, and in some drifts it was nearly up to his armpits. It would catch his feet and try to trip him. It would build itself into a wall before him to beat him back, and he would fling himself into it, plunging like a wounded buffalo, puffing and snorting in rage. So, foot by foot, he drove his way and when at last he came to Durham's he was staggering and almost blind, and leaned against a pillar gasping, and thanking God that the cattle came late to the killing beds that day. In the evening the same thing had to be done again, and because Jurgis could not tell what hour of the night he would get off he got a saloon-keeper to let Ona sit and wait for him in a corner. Once it was eleven o'clock at night, and black as the pit, but still they got home. That blizzard knocked many a man out, for the crowd outside begging for work was never greater, and the packers would not wait long for anyone. When it was over the soul of Jurgis was a song, for he had met the enemy and conquered, 
and felt himself the master of his fate. So it might be with some monarch of the forest that has vanquished his foes in fair fight and then falls into some cowardly trap in the night-time. A time of peril on the killing fields was when a steer broke loose. Sometimes, in the haste of speeding up, they would dump one of the animals out on the floor before it was fully stunned, and it would get upon its feet and run amuck. Then there would be a yell of warning, the men would drop everything and dash for the nearest pillar, slipping here and there on the floor and tumbling over each other. This was bad enough in the summer, when a man could see. In winter time, it was enough to make your hair stand up, for the room would be so full of steam that you could not make anything out five feet in front of you. To be sure, the steer was generally blind and frantic, and not especially bent on hurting anyone. But think of the chances of running upon a knife, while nearly every man had one in his hand. And then, to cap the climax, the floor boss would come rushing up with a rifle and begin blazing away. It was in one of these melees that Jurgis fell into his trap. That is the only word to describe it. It was so cruel and so utterly not to be foreseen. At first he hardly noticed it. It was such a slight accident. Simply that in leaping out of the way he turned his ankle. There was a twinge of pain, but Jurgis was used to pain and did not coddle himself. When he came to walk home, however, he realized that it was hurting him a great deal, and in the morning his ankle was swollen out nearly double its size, and he could not get his foot into his shoe. Still, even then, he did nothing more than swear a little and wrapped his foot in old rags and hobbled out to take the car. It chanced to be a rush day at Durham's, and all the long morning he limped about with his aching foot. By noontime the pain was so great that it made him faint, and after a couple of hours in the afternoon he was fairly beaten and had to tell the boss. They sent for the company doctor, and he examined the foot and told Jurgis to go home to bed, adding that he had probably laid himself up for months by his folly. The injury was not one that Durham and company could be held responsible for, and so that was all there was to it, so far as the doctor was concerned. Jurgis got home somehow, scarcely able to see for the pain, and with an awful terror in his soul Elzbeta helped him into bed and bandaged his injured foot with cold water and tried hard not to let him see her dismay. When the rest came home at night she met them outside and told them, and they too put on a cheerful face, saying it would only be for a week or two, and that they would pull him through. When they had gotten him to sleep, however, they sat by the kitchen fire and talked it over in frightened whispers. They were in for a siege. That was plainly to be seen. Jurgis had only about sixty dollars in the bank, and the slack season was upon them. Both Jonas and Maria might soon be earning no more than enough to pay their board, and besides that there were only the wages of Ona and the pittance of the little boy. There was the rent to pay, and still some on the furniture. There was the insurance just due, and every month there was sack after sack of coal. It was January, midwinter, an awful time to have to face privation. Deep snows would come again, and who would carry Ona to her work now? She might lose her place, she was almost certain to lose it. And then little Stanislavus began to whimper. Who would take care of him? It was dreadful that an accident of this sort, that no man can help, should have meant such suffering. The bitterness of it was the daily food and drink of Jurgis. It was of no use for them to try to deceive him. He knew as much about the situation as they did, and he knew that the family might literally starve to death. The worry of it fairly ate him up. He began to look haggard the first two or three days of it. In truth, it was almost maddening for a strong man like him, a fighter, to have to lie there helpless on his back. It was for all the world the old story of Prometheus Bound. 
as Jorgis lay on his bed, hour after hour, there came to him emotions that he had never known before. Before this he had met life with a welcome. It had its trials, but none that a man could not face. But now, in the night time, when he lay tossing about, there would come stalking into his chamber a grisly phantom, the sight of which made his flesh curl and his hair to bristle up. It was like seeing the world fall away from underneath his feet, like plunging down into a bottomless abyss into yawning caverns of despair. It might be true, then, after all, what others had told him about life, that the best powers of a man might not be equal to it. It might be true that, strive as he would, toil as he would, he might fail and go down and be destroyed. The thought of this was like an icy hand at his heart, the thought that here, in this ghastly home of all horror, he and all those who were dear to him might lie and perish of starvation and cold, and there would be no ear to hear their cry, no hand to help them. It was true, it was true, that here in this huge city, with its stores of heaped-up wealth, human creatures might be hunted down and destroyed by the wild beast powers of nature, just as truly as ever they were in the days of the cavemen. Ona was now making about thirty dollars a month, and Stanislavus about thirteen. To add to this there was the board of Jonas and Maria, about forty-five dollars. Deducting this from the rent, interest, and installments on the furniture, they had left sixty dollars, and deducting the coal, they had fifty. They did without everything that human beings could do without. They went in old and ragged clothing that left them at the mercy of the cold, and when the children's shoes wore out they tied them up with string. Half invalid as she was, Ona would do herself harm by walking in the rain and cold when she ought to have ridden. They bought literally nothing but food, and still they could not keep alive on fifty dollars a month. They might have done it, if only they could have gotten pure food and at fair prices, or if only they had known what to get, if they had not been so pitifully ignorant. But they had come to a new country, where everything was different, including the food. They had always been accustomed to eat a great deal of smoked sausage, and how could they know that what they bought in America was not the same, that its color was made by chemicals, and that its smoky flavor by more chemicals, and that it was full of potato flour besides. Potato flour is the waste of potato after the starch and alcohol have been extracted. It has no more food value than so much wood, and as its use as a food adulterant is a penal offense in Europe, thousands of tons of it are shipped to America every year. It was amazing what quantities of food such as this were needed every day by eleven hungry persons. A dollar sixty-five a day was simply not enough to feed them, and there was no use trying. And so each week they made an inroad upon the pitiful little bank account that Ona had begun. Because the account was in her name, it was possible for her to keep this a secret from her husband, and to keep the heart-sickness of it for her own. It would have been better if Jurgis had been really ill, if he had not been able to think for he had no resources such as most invalids have. All he could do was to lie there and toss about from side to side. Now and then he would break into cursing, regardless of everything, and now and then his impatience would get the better of him, and he would try to get up, and poor Teta Elsbeta would have to plead with him in a frenzy. Elsbeta was all alone with him the greater part of the time. She would sit and smooth his forehead by the hour, and talk to him and try to make him forget. Sometimes it would be too cold for the children to go to school, and they would have to play in the kitchen where Jurgis was, because it was the only room that was half warm. These were dreadful times, for Jurgis would get as cross as any bear. He was scarcely to be blamed, for he had enough to worry him, 
and it was hard when he was trying to take a nap to be kept awake by noisy and peevish children. Elzbieta's only resource in those times was little Antonas. Indeed, it would be hard to say how they could have gotten along at all if it had not been for little Antonas. It was the one consolation of Jurgis's long imprisonment that now he had time to look at his baby. Teta Elzbieta would put the clothes basket in which the baby slept alongside of his mattress, and Jurgis would lie upon one elbow and watch him by the hour, imagining things. Then little Antanas would open his eyes. He was beginning to take notice of things now, and he would smile. How he would smile! So Jurgis would begin to forget and be happy, because he was in a world where there was a thing so beautiful as the smile of little Antanas, and because such a world could not but be good at the heart of it. He looked more like his father every hour, Elzbieta would say, and said it many times a day, because she saw that it pleased Jurgis. The poor little terror-stricken woman was planning all day and all night to soothe the prison giant who was entrusted to her care. Jurgis, who knew nothing about the age-long and everlasting hypocrisy of woman, would take the bait and grin with delight and then he would hold his finger in front of little Antonas' eyes, and move it this way and that, and laugh with glee to see the baby follow it. There is no pet quite so fascinating as a baby. He would look into Jurgis' face with such uncanny seriousness, and Jurgis would start and cry, Halak, look, Muma, he knows his papa, he does, he does! Tumana Shirdele, the little rascal! End of chapter 11. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter 12 of The Jungle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Chapter 12. For three weeks after his injury, Jurgis never got up from bed. It was a very obstinate sprain. The swelling would not go down, and the pain still continued. At the end of that time, however, he would contain himself no longer, and began trying to walk a little every day, laboring to persuade himself that he was better. No arguments could stop him, and three or four days later he declared that he was going back to work. He limped to the cars and got to Brown's, where he found that the boss had kept his place, that is, was willing to turn out into the snow the poor devil he had hired in the meantime. Every now and then the pain would force Jurgis to stop work, but he stuck it out till nearly an hour before closing. Then he was forced to acknowledge that he could not go on without fainting. It almost broke his heart to do it, and he stood leaning against a pillar and weeping like a child. Two of the men had to help him to the car, and when he got out he had to sit down and wait in the snow till someone came along. So they put him to bed again and sent for the doctor, as they ought to have done in the beginning. It transpired that he had twisted a tendon out of place and could never have gotten well without attention. Then he gripped the sides of the bed and shut his teeth together and turned white with agony while the doctor pulled and wrenched away at his swollen ankle. When finally the doctor left he told him that he would have to lie quiet for two months, and that if he went to work before that time he might lame himself for life. Three days later there came another heavy snowstorm, and Jonas and Maria and Ona and little Stanislavus all set out together, an hour before daybreak, to try to get to the yards. About noon the last two came back, the boy screaming with pain. His fingers were all frosted, it seemed. They had had to give up trying to get to the yards, and had nearly perished in a drift. All that they knew how to do was to hold the frozen fingers near the fire, and so little Stanislavus spent most of the day dancing about in horrible agony till Jurgis flew into a passion of nervous rage and swore like a madman, declaring that he would kill him if he did not stop. All that day and night 
the family was half crazed with fear that ona and the little boy had lost their places and in the morning they set out earlier than ever after the little fellow had been beaten with a stick by jurgis there could be no trifling in a case like this it was a matter of life and death little stanislovas could not be expected to realize that he might a great deal better freeze in the snowdrift than lose his job at the lard machine ona was quite certain that she would find her place gone and was all unnerved when she finally got to brown's and found that the poor lady herself had failed to come and was therefore compelled to be lenient one of the consequences of this episode was that the first joints of three of the little boy's fingers were permanently disabled and another that thereafter he always had to be beaten before he set out to work whenever there was fresh snow on the ground jurgis was called upon to do the beating and as it hurt his foot he did it with a vengeance but it did not tend to add to the sweetness of his temper they say that the best dog will turn cross if he be kept chained all the time and it was the same with the man he had not a thing to do all day but lie and curse his fate and the time came when he wanted to curse everything this was never for very long however for when ona began to cry jurgis could not stay angry the poor fellow looked like a homeless ghost with his cheeks sunken in and his long black hair straggling into his eyes he was too discouraged to cut it or to think about his appearance his muscles were wasting away and what were left were soft and flabby he had no appetite and they could not afford to tempt him with delicacies it was better he said that he should not eat it was a saving about the end of march he had got hold of ona's bank book and learned that there was only three dollars left to them in the world but perhaps the worst of the consequences of this long siege was that they lost another member of their family brother jonas disappeared one saturday night he did not come home and thereafter all their efforts to get trace of him were futile it was said by the boss at durham's that he had gotten his week's money and left there that might not be true of course for sometimes they would say that when a man had been killed it was the easiest way out of it for all concerned when for instance a man had fallen into one of the rendering tanks and had been made into pure leaf lard and peerless fertilizer there was no use letting the fact out and making his family unhappy more probable however was the theory that jonas had deserted them and gone on the road seeking happiness he had been discontented for a long time and not without some cause he paid good board and was yet obliged to live in a family where nobody had enough to eat and maria would keep giving them all her money and of course he could not but feel that he was called upon to do the same then there were crying brats and all sorts of misery a man would have had to be a good deal of a hero to stand it all without grumbling and jonas was not in the least a hero he was simply a weather-beaten old fellow who liked to have a good supper and sit in the corner by the fire and smoke his pipe in peace before he went to bed here there was not room by the fire and through the winter the kitchen had seldom been warm enough for comfort so with the springtime what was more likely than that the wild idea of escaping had come to him two years he had been yoked like a horse to a half-ton truck in durham's dark cellars with never a rest save on sundays and four holidays in the year and with never a word of thanks only kicks and blows and curses such as no decent dog would have stood and now the winter was over and the spring winds were blowing and with a day's walk a man might put the smoke of packing town behind him forever and be where the grass was green and the flowers all the colors of the rainbow but now the income of the family was cut down more than one-third and the food demand was cut only one-eleventh so that they were worse off than ever and they were borrowing money from maria and eating up her bank account and spoiling once again her hopes of marriage and happiness and they were even going into debt 
to Tomoshius Kushlaika, and letting him impoverish himself. Poor Tomoshius was a man without any relatives, and with a wonderful talent besides, and he ought to have made money and prospered, but he had fallen in love, and so given hostages to fortune, and was doomed to be dragged down too. So it was finally decided that two more of the children would have to leave school. Next to Stanislavus, who was now fifteen, there was a little girl, little Kotrina, who was two years younger, and then two boys, Vilimas, who was eleven, and Nekalayus, who was ten. Both of these last were bright boys, and there was no reason why their family should starve when tens of thousands of children no older were earning their own livings. So one morning they were given a quarter apiece, and a roll with a sausage in it, and, with their minds top-heavy with good advice, were sent out to make their way to the city and learn to sell newspapers. They came back late at night, in tears, having walked for the five or six miles to report that a man had offered to take them to a place where they sold newspapers, and had taken their money and gone into a store to get them, and never more been seen. So they both received a whipping, and the next morning set out again. This time they found the newspaper place and procured their stock, and after wandering about till nearly noontime, saying, Paper? to everyone they saw, they had all their stock taken away and received a thrashing besides from a big newsman upon whose territory they had trespassed. Fortunately, however, they had already sold some papers and came back with nearly as much as they started with. After a week of mishaps such as these, the two little fellows began to learn the ways of the trade, the names of the different papers, and how many of each to get, and what sort of people to offer them to, and where to go, and where to stay away from. After this, leaving home at four o'clock in the morning, and running about the streets, first with morning papers and then with evening, they might come home late at night with twenty or thirty cents apiece, possibly as much as forty cents. From this they had to deduct their car fare, since the distance was so great, but after a while they made friends and learned still more, and then they would save their car fare. They would get on a car when the conductor was not looking and hide in the crowd, and three times out of four he would not ask for their fares, either not seeing them or thinking they had already paid it, or, if he did ask, they would hunt through their pockets and then begin to cry, and either have their fares paid by some kind old lady, or else try the trick again on a new car. All this was fair play, they felt. Whose fault was it that at the hours when working men were going to their work and back the cars were so crowded that the conductors could not collect all the fares? And besides, the companies were thieves, people said, had stolen all their franchises with the help of scoundrelly politicians. Now that the winter was by, and there was no more danger of snow, and no more coal to buy, and another room warm enough to put the children into when they cried, and enough money to get along from week to week with, Jurgis was less terrible than he had been. A man can get used to anything in the course of time, and Jurgis had gotten used to lying about the house. Ona saw this, and was very careful not to destroy his peace of mind by letting him know how very much pain she was suffering. It was now the time of the spring rains, and Ona had often to ride to her work, in spite of the expense. She was getting paler every day, and sometimes, in spite of her good resolutions, it pained her that Jurgis did not notice it. She wondered if he cared for her as much as ever, if all this misery was not wearing out his love. She had to be away from him all the time, and bear her own troubles while he was bearing his, and then, when she came home, she was so worn out, and whenever they talked they had only their worries to talk of. Truly it was hard, in such a life, to keep any sentiment alive. The woe of this would flame up in Ona sometimes. At night she would suddenly clasp her big husband in her arms and break into passionate weeping, demanding to know if he really loved her. Poor Jurgis 
who had in truth grown more matter-of-fact under the endless pressure of penury, would not know what to make of these things, and could only try to recollect when he had last been cross, and so Ona would have to forgive him and sob herself to sleep. The latter part of April Jurgis went to see the doctor, and was given a bandage to lace about his ankle, and told that he might go back to work. It needed more than the permission of the doctor, however, for when he showed up on the killing floor of Brown's he was told by the foreman that it had not been possible to keep his job for him. Jurgis knew that this meant simply that the foreman had found someone else to do the work as well and did not want to bother to make a change. He stood in the doorway, looking mournfully on, seeing his friends and companions at work, and feeling like an outcast. Then he went out and took his place with the mob of the unemployed. This time, however, Jurgis did not have the same fine confidence, nor the same reason for it. He was no longer the finest-looking man in the throng and the bosses no longer made for him. He was thin and haggard, and his clothes were seedy, and he looked miserable. And there were hundreds who looked and felt just like him, and who had been wandering about Packingtown for months begging for work. This was a critical time in Jurgis' life, and if he had been a weaker man he would have gone the way the rest did. Those out-of-work wretches would stand about the packing-houses every morning till the police drove them away, and then they would scatter among the saloons. Very few of them had the nerve to face the rebuffs that they would encounter by trying to get into the buildings to interview the bosses. If they did not get a chance in the morning there would be nothing to do but hang about the saloons the rest of the day and night. Jurgis was saved from all this partly to be sure because it was pleasant weather, and there was no need to be indoors, but mainly because he carried with him always the pitiful little face of his wife. He must get work, he told himself, fighting the battle with despair every hour of the day. He must get work. He must have a place again and some money saved up before the next winter came. But there was no work for him. He sought out all the members of his union. Jurgis had stuck to the union through all this, and begged them to speak a word for him. He went to everyone he knew, asking for a chance, there or anywhere. He wandered all day through the buildings, and in a week or two, when he had been all over the yards and into every room to which he had access and learned that there was not a job anywhere, he persuaded himself that there might have been a change in the places he had first visited, and began the round all over, till finally the watchmen and the spotters of the companies came to know him by sight and to order him out with threats. Then there was nothing more for him to do but go with the crowd in the morning, and keep in the front row and look eager, and when he failed go back home and play with little Kotrina and the baby. The peculiar bitterness of all this was that Jurgis saw so plainly the meaning of it. In the beginning he had been fresh and strong, and he had gotten a job the first day, but now he was second-hand, a damaged article, so to speak, and they did not want him. They had got the best of him, they had worn him out with their speeding up and their carelessness, and now they had thrown him away and Jurgis would make the acquaintance of others of these unemployed men and find that they had all had the same experience. There were some, of course, who had wandered in from other places, who had been ground up in other mills. There were others who were out from their own fault, some, for instance, who had not been able to stand the awful grind without drink. The vast majority, however, were simply the worn-out parts of the great merciless packing machine. They had toiled there and kept up with the pace, some of them for ten or twenty years, until finally the time had come when they could not keep up with it any more. Some had been frankly told that they were too old, that a spryer man was needed. Others had given occasion by some act of carelessness or incompetence. With most, however, the occasion had been the same as with Jurgis. 
they had been overworked and underfed so long, and finally some disease had lain them on their backs, or they had cut themselves and had blood poisoning, or met with some other accident. When a man came back after that he would get his place back only by the courtesy of the boss. To this there was no exception, save when the accident was one for which the firm was liable. In that case they would send a slippery lawyer to see him, first to try to get him to sign away his claims, but if he was too smart for that, to promise him that he and his should always be provided with work. This promise they would keep, strictly and to the letter, for two years. Two years was the statute of limitations, and after that the victim could not sue. What happened to a man after any of these things all depended upon the circumstances. If he were of the highly skilled workers he would probably have enough saved up to tide him over. The best-paid men, the splitters, made fifty cents an hour, which would be five or six dollars a day in the rush seasons, and one or two in the dullest. A man could live and save on that, but then there were only half a dozen splitters in each place, and one of them that Jurgis knew had a family of twenty-two children, all hoping to grow up to be splitters like their father. For an unskilled man who made ten dollars a week in the rush seasons and five in the dull, it all depended upon his age and the number he had depended upon him. An unmarried man could save if he did not drink, and if he was absolutely selfish, that is, if he paid no heed to the demands of his old parents, or of his little brothers and sisters, or of any other relatives he might have, as well as of the members of his union and his chums, and the people who might be starving to death next door. End of chapter 12 Recording by Tom Weiss Chapter 13 of The Jungle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Chapter 13. During this time that Jurgis was looking for work occurred the death of little Christophorus, one of the children of Teta Elsbita. Both Christophorus and his brother Josipas were cripples the latter having lost one leg by having it run over, and Christophorus having congenital dislocation of the hip which made it impossible for him to ever walk. He was the last of Teta Elzbieta's children, and perhaps he had been intended by nature to let her know that she had had enough. At any rate he was wretchedly sick and undersized. He had the rickets, and though he was over three years old, he was no bigger than an ordinary child of one. All day long he would crawl around the floor in a filthy little dress, whining and fretting. Because the floor was full of draughts he was always catching cold and snuffling because his nose ran. This made him a nuisance and a source of endless trouble in the family, for his mother with unnatural perversity loved him best of all her children and made a perpetual fuss over him would let him do anything undisturbed, and would burst into tears when his fretting drove Jurgis wild. And now he died. Perhaps it was the smoked sausage he had eaten that morning, which may have been made out of some of the tubercular pork that was condemned as unfit for export. At any rate, an hour after eating it the child had begun to cry with pain, and in another hour he was rolling about on the floor in convulsions. Little Cotrina, who was all alone with him, ran out screaming for help, and after a while a doctor came, but not until Christophorus had howled his last howl. No one was really sorry about this except poor Elzbieta, who was inconsolable. Jurgis announced that so far as he was concerned the child would have to be buried by the city, since they had no money for a funeral, and at this the poor woman almost went out of her senses, wringing her hands and screaming with grief and despair. Her child to be buried in a pauper's grave, and her stepdaughter to stand by 
and hear it said without protesting? It was enough to make Ona's father rise up out of his grave to rebuke her. If it had come to this, they might as well give up at once and be buried all of them together. In the end, Maria said that she would help with ten dollars, and Jorgis being still obdurate, Elsbieta went in tears and begged the money from the neighbors. And so little Christophorus had a mass and a hearse with white plumes on it, and a tiny plot in a graveyard with a wooden cross to mark the place. The poor mother was not the same for months after that. The mere sight of the floor where little Christophorus had crawled about would make her weep. He had never had a fair chance, poor little fellow, she would say. He had been handicapped from his birth. If only she had heard about it in time, so that she might have had that great doctor to cure him of his lameness. Some time ago, Elsbieta was told, a Chicago billionaire had paid a fortune to bring a great European surgeon over to cure his little daughter of the same disease from which Chrysophorus had suffered. And because this surgeon had to have bodies to demonstrate upon, he announced that he would treat the children of the poor, a piece of magnanimity over which the papers became quite eloquent. Elzbieta, at last, did not read the papers, and no one had told her, but perhaps it was as well, for just then they would not have had the car fare to spare to go every day to wait upon the surgeon, nor, for that matter, anybody with the time to take the child. All this while that he was seeking for work there was a dark shadow hanging over Jorgis, as if a savage beast were lurking somewhere in the pathway of his life, and he knew it, and yet could not help approaching the place. There are all stages of being out of work in Packingtown, and he faced in dread the prospect of reaching the lowest. There is a place that waits for the lowest man, the fertilizer plant. The men would talk about it in awe-stricken whispers. Not more than one in ten had ever really tried it. The other nine had contented themselves with hearsay evidence and a peep through the door. There were some things worse than even starving to death. They would ask Jurgis if he had worked there yet, and if he meant to and Jurgis would debate the matter with himself. As poor as they were, and making all the sacrifices that they were, would he dare to refuse any sort of work that was offered to him, be it as horrible as ever it could? Would he dare to go home and eat bread that had been earned by Ona, weak and complaining as she was, knowing that he had been given a chance, and had not had the nerve to take it? And yet, he might argue that way with himself all day, and one glimpse into the fertilizer works would send him away again, shuddering. He was a man, and he would do his duty. He went and made application, but surely he was not also required to hope for success. The fertilizer works of Durham's lay away from the rest of the plant. Few visitors ever saw them and the few who did would come out looking like Dante, of whom the peasants declared that he had been into hell. To this part of the yards came all the tankage and the waste products of all sorts. Here they dried out the bones, and in suffocating cellars where the daylight never came you might see men and women and children bending over whirling machines and sawing bits of bone into all sorts of shapes, breathing their lungs full of the fine dust, and doomed to die, every one of them, within a certain definite time. Here they made the blood into albumen, and made other foul-smelling things into things still more foul-smelling. In the corridors and caverns where it was done you might lose yourself as in the great caves of Kentucky. In the dust and the steam the electric lights would shine like far-off twinkling stars, red and blue-green and purple stars, according to the color of the mist and the brew from which it came. For the odors of these ghastly charnel houses there may be words in Lithuanian, but there are none in English. 
the person entering would have to summon his courage as for a cold-water plunge. He would go in like a man swimming under water. He would put his handkerchief over his face and begin to cough and choke, and then, if he were still obstinate, he would find his head beginning to ring and the veins in his forehead to throb, until, finally, he would be assailed by an overpowering blast of ammonia fumes and would turn and run for his life and come out half-dazed. On top of this were the rooms where they dried the tankage, the mass of brown stringy stuff that was left after the waste portions of the carcasses had had the lard and tallow dried out of them. This dried material they would then grind to a fine powder, and after they had mixed it up well with the mysterious but inoffensive brown rock which they brought in and ground up by the hundreds of carloads for that purpose, the substance was ready to be put into bags and sent out to the world as any one of a hundred different brands of standard bone phosphate. And then the farmer in Maine or California or Texas would buy this at, say, twenty-five dollars a ton, and plant it with his corn, and for several days after the operation the fields would have a strong odor, and the farmer and his wagon and the very horses that had hauled it would all have it too. In Packingtown the fertilizer is pure, instead of being a flavoring, and instead of a ton or so spread out on several acres under the open sky, there are hundreds and thousands of tons of it in one building, heaped here and there in haystack piles, covering the floor several inches deep, and filling the air with a choking dust that becomes a blinding sandstorm when the wind stirs. It was to this building that Jurgis came daily, as if dragged by an unseen hand. The month of May was an exceptionally cool one, and his secret prayers were granted, but early in June there came a record-breaking hot spell, and after that there were men wanted in the fertilizer mill. The boss of the grinding room had come to know Jurgis by this time and had marked him for a likely man, and so when he came to the door about two o'clock this breathless hot day he felt a sudden spasm of pain shoot through him. The boss beckoned to him. In ten minutes more Jurgis had pulled off his coat and overshirt and set his teeth together and gone to work. Here was one more difficulty for him to meet and conquer. His labor took him about one minute to learn. Before him was one of the vents of the mill in which the fertilizer was being ground, rushing forth in a great brown river, with the spray of the finest dust flung forth in clouds. Jurgis was given a shovel, and along with half a dozen others it was his task to shovel this fertilizer into carts. That others were at work he knew by the sound, and by the fact that he sometimes collided with them, otherwise they might as well not have been there, for in the blinding dust storm a man could not see six feet in front of his face. When he had filled one cart he had to grope around him until another came, and if there was none on hand he continued to grope till one arrived. In five minutes he was, of course, a mass of fertilizer from head to feet. They gave him a sponge to tie over his mouth so that he could breathe, but the sponge did not prevent his lips and eyelids from caking up with it and his ears from filling solid. He looked like a brown ghost at twilight. From hair to shoes he became the color of the building and of everything in it, and for that matter a hundred yards outside it. The building had to be left open and when the wind blew Durham and company lost a great deal of fertilizer. Working in his shirt-sleeves and with the thermometer at over a hundred, the phosphates soaked in through every pore of Jurgis' skin, and in five minutes he had a headache, and in fifteen was almost dazed. The blood was pounding in his brain like an engine's throbbing. There was a frightful pain in the top of his skull and he could hardly control his hands. Still, with the memory of his four months' siege behind him, he fought on in a frenzy of determination, and half an hour later he began to vomit. He vomited 
until it seemed as if his innards must be torn into shreds. A man could get used to the fertilizer mill, the boss had said, if he would make up his mind to it, but Jurgis now began to see that it was a question of making up his stomach. At the end of that day of horror he could scarcely stand. He had to catch himself now and then, and lean against a building and get his bearings. Most of the men, when they came out, made straight for a saloon. They seemed to place fertilizer and rattlesnake poison in one class. But Jurgis was too ill to think of drinking. He could only make his way to the street and stagger onto a car. He had a sense of humor, and later on, when he became an old hand, he used to think it fun to board a streetcar and see what happened. Now, however, he was too ill to notice it, how the people in the car began to gasp and sputter, to put their handkerchiefs to their noses and transfix him with furious glances. Jurgis only knew that a man in front of him immediately got up and gave him a seat, and that half a minute later the two people on each side of him got up and that in a full minute the crowded car was nearly empty, those passengers who could not get room on the platform having gotten out to walk. Of course Jurgis had made his home a miniature fertilizer mill a minute after entering. The stuff was half an inch deep in his skin, his whole system was full of it, and it would have taken a week not merely of scrubbing but of vigorous exercise to get it out of him. As it was, he could be compared with nothing known to men, save that newest discovery of the savants, a substance which emits energy for an unlimited time, without being itself in the least diminished in power. He smelled so that he made all the food at the table taste, and set the whole family to vomiting. For himself it was three days before he could keep anything upon his stomach. He might wash his hands and use a knife and fork but were not his mouth and throat filled with the poison? And still Jurgis stuck it out. In spite of splitting headaches he would stagger down to the plant and take up his stand once more and begin to shovel in the blinding clouds of dust. And so at the end of the week he was a fertilizer man for life. He was able to eat again, and though his head never stopped aching it ceased to be so bad that he could not work. So there passed another summer. It was a summer of prosperity all over the country, and the country ate generously of packing-house products, and there was plenty of work for all the family, in spite of the packers' efforts, to keep a superfluidity of labor. They were again able to pay their debts and to begin to save a little sum, but there were one or two sacrifices they considered too heavy to be made for long. It was too bad that the boys should have to sell papers at their age. It was utterly useless to caution them and plead with them, quite without knowing it they were taking on the tone of their new environment. They were learning to swear in voluble English. They were learning to pick up cigar stumps and smoke them, to pass hours of their time gambling with pennies and dice and cigarette cards. They were learning the location of all the houses of prostitution on the levee, and the names of the madams who kept them, and the days when they gave their state banquets, which the police captains and the big politicians all attended. If a visiting country customer were to ask them, they could show him which was Hinky Dink's famous saloon, and could even point out to him by name the different gamblers and thugs and hold-up men who made the place their headquarters and worse yet the boys were getting out of the habit of coming home at night. What was the use, they would ask, of wasting time and energy and a possible car fare, riding out to the stockyards every night when the weather was pleasant and they could crawl under a truck or into an empty doorway and sleep exactly as well? So long as they brought home a half dollar for each day, what mattered it when they brought it? but Jurgis declared that from this to ceasing to come at all would not be a very long step, and so it was decided that Vilimas and Nekalayos should return to school in the fall, and that instead Esbeta should go out and get some work, her place at home being taken by her younger daughter. 
Little Kotrina was like most children of the poor, prematurely made old. She had to take care of her little brother, who was a cripple, and also of the baby. She had to cook the meals and wash the dishes and clean house, and have supper ready when the workers came home in the evening. She was only thirteen and small for her age, but she did all this without a murmur, and her mother went out and after trudging a couple days about the yards settled down as a servant of a sausage machine. Elzbieta was used to working, but she found this change a hard one, for the reason that she had to stand motionless upon her feet from seven o'clock in the morning till half-past twelve, and again from one till half-past five. For the first few days it seemed to her that she could not stand it, she suffered almost as much as Jurgis had from the fertilizer, and would come out at sundown with her head fairly reeling. Besides this, she was working in one of the dark holes by electric light, and the dampness too was deadly. There were always puddles of water on the floor, and a sickening odor of moist flesh in the room. The people who worked there followed the ancient custom of nature, whereby the ptarmigan is the color of dead leaves in the fall and of snow in the winter, and the chameleon, who is black when he lies upon a stump and turns green when he moves to a leaf. The men and women who worked in this department were precisely the color of the fresh country sausage they made. The sausage room was an interesting place to visit for two or three minutes, and provided that you did not look at the people. The machines were perhaps the most wonderful things in the entire plant. Presumably sausages were once chopped and stuffed by hand, and if so it would be interesting to know how many workers had been displaced by these inventions. On one side of the room were the hoppers, into which men shoveled loads of meat and wheelbarrows full of spices. In these great bowls were whirling knives that made two thousand revolutions a minute, and when the meat was ground fine and adulterated with potato flour and well mixed with water, it was forced to the stuffing machines on the other side of the room. The latter were tended by women. There was a sort of spout like the nozzle of a hose, and one of the women would take a long string of casing and put the end over the nozzle and then work the whole thing on, as one works on the finger of a tight glove. This string would be twenty or thirty feet long, but the woman would have it all on in a jiffy, and when she had several on she would press a lever and a stream of sausage meat would be shot out, taking the casing with it as it came. Thus one might stand and see appear, miraculously born from the machine, a wriggling snake of sausage of incredible length. In front was a big pan which caught these creatures, and two more women who seized them as fast as they appeared and twisted them into links. This was, for the uninitiated, the most perplexing work of all, for all that the woman had to give was a single turn of the wrist, and in some way she contrived to give it so that instead of an endless chain of sausages, one after another, there grew under her hands a string of sausages, all dangling from a single center. It was quite like the feet of a prestidigitator, for the woman worked so fast that the eye could literally not follow her, and there was only a mist of motion and tangle after tangle of sausages appearing. In the midst of the mist, however, the visitor would suddenly notice the tense set face with the two wrinkles graven in the forehead and the ghastly pallor of the cheeks and then he would suddenly recollect that it was time he was going on. The woman did not go on. She stayed right there, hour after hour, day after day, year after year, twisting sausage links and racing with death. It was piecework, and she was apt to have a family to keep alive, and stern and ruthless economic laws had arranged it that she could only do this by working just as she did with all her soul upon her work, and with never an instant for a glance at the well-dressed ladies and gentlemen who came to stare at her, as at some wild beast in a menagerie. End of chapter 13 
Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Fourteen of the Jungle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Chapter Fourteen. With one member trimming beef in a cannery and another working in a sausage factory, the family had a first-hand knowledge of the great majority of Packingtown swindles. For it was the custom, as they found, whenever meat was so spoiled that it could not be used for anything else, either to can it or else to chop it up into sausage. With what had been told them by Jonas, who had worked in the pickle rooms, they could now study the whole of the spoiled meat industry on the inside, and read a new and grim meaning into that old Packingtown jest, that they use everything of the pig except the squeal. Jonas had told them how the meat that was taken out of pickle would often be found sour, and how they would rub it up with soda to take away the smell, and sell it to be eaten on free lunch counters. Also, of all the miracles of chemistry which they performed, giving to any sort of meat, fresh or salted, whole or chopped, any color and any flavor and any odor they chose. In the pickling of hams they had an ingenious apparatus, by which they saved time and increased the capacity of the plant. A machine consisting of a hollow needle, attached to a pump, by plunging this needle into the meat and working with his foot, a man could fill a ham with pickle in a few seconds. And yet, in spite of this, there would be hams found spoiled, some of them with an odor so bad that a man could hardly bear to be in the room with them. To pump into these the packers had a second and much stronger pickle which destroyed the odor, a process known to the workers as giving them thirty per cent. Also, after the hams had been smoked, there would be found some that had gone to the bad. Formerly these had been sold as number three grade, but later on some ingenious person had hit upon a new device, and now they would extract the bone, about which the bad part generally lay, and insert in the hole a white hot iron. After this invention there was no longer number one, number two, and three grade. There was only number one grade. The packers were always originating such schemes. They had what they called boneless hams, which were all the odds and ends of pork stuffed into casings, and California hams, which were the shoulders with big knuckle joints and nearly all the meat cut out, and fancy skinned hams, which were made of the oldest hogs, whose skins were so heavy and coarse that no one would buy them, that is, until they had been cooked and chopped fine and labeled head cheese. It was only when the whole ham was spoiled that it came into the department of Elsbeta, cut up by the two thousand revolutions a minute flyers, and mixed with half a ton of other meat, no odor that ever was in a ham could make any difference. There was never the least attention paid to what was cut up for sausage. There would come all the way back from Europe old sausage that had been rejected, and that was moldy and white. It would be dosed with borax and glycerin and dumped into the hoppers and made over again for home consumption. There would be meat that had tumbled out on the floor, in the dirt and sawdust, where the workers had tramped and spit uncounted billions of consumption germs. There would be meat stored in great piles in rooms, and the water from leaky roofs would drip over it, and thousands of rats would race about on it. It was too dark in these storage places to see well but a man could run his hand over these piles of meat and sweep off handfuls of the dried dung of rats. These rats were nuisances, and the packers would put poisoned bread out for them. They would die, and then rats, bread, and meat would go into the hoppers together. This is no fairy story and no joke. The meat would be shoveled into carts, and the man who did the shoveling would not trouble to lift out a rat even when he saw one. There were things that went into the sausage in comparison with which a poisoned rat was a tidbit. There was no place for the men to wash their hands before they ate their dinner, and so they made a practice of washing them in the water that was to be ladled into the sausage. 
There were the butt-ends of smoked meat, and the scraps of corned beef, and all the odds and ends of the waste of the plants that would be dumped into old barrels in the cellar and left there. Under the system of rigid economy which the packers enforced, there were some jobs that it only paid to do once in a long time, and among these was the cleaning out of the waste barrels. Every spring they did it, and in the barrels would be dirt and rust and old nails and stale water, and cartload after cartload of it would be taken up and dumped into the hoppers with fresh meat and sent out to the public's breakfast. Some of it they would make into smoked sausage, but as the smoking took time and was therefore expensive, they would call upon their chemistry department and preserve it with borax and color it with gelatin to make it brown. All of their sausage came out of the same bowl, but when they came to wrap it they would stamp some of it special, and for this they would charge two cents more a pound. Such were the new surroundings in which Elzbieta was placed, and such was the work she was compelled to do. It was stupefying, brutalizing work. It left her no time to think, no strength for anything. She was part of the machine she tended, and every faculty that was not needed for the machine was doomed to be crushed out of existence. There was only one mercy about the cruel grind, that it gave her the gift of insensibility. Little by little she sank into a torpor. She fell silent. She would meet Jurgis and Ona in the evening, and the three would walk home together, often without saying a word. Ona, too, was falling into a habit of silence, Ona, who had once gone about singing like a bird. She was sick and miserable and often she would barely have strength enough to drag herself home. And there they would eat what they had to eat, and afterward, because there was only their misery to talk of, they would crawl into bed and fall into a stupor and never stir until it was time to get up again and dress by candlelight and go back to the machines. They were so numbed that they did not even suffer much from hunger. Now only the children continued to fret when the food ran short. Yet the soul of Ona was not dead. The souls of none of them were dead, but only sleeping. And now and then they would waken, and these were cruel times. The gates of memory would roll open, old joys would stretch out their arms to them, old hopes and dreams would call to them, and they would stir beneath the burden that lay upon them and feel its forever immeasurable weight. They could not even cry out beneath it, but anguish would seize them more dreadful than the agony of death. It was a thing scarcely to be spoken, a thing never spoken by all the world, that will not know its own defeat. They were beaten. They had lost the game. They were swept aside. It was not less tragic because it was so sordid, because it had to do with wages and grocery bills and rents. They had dreamed of freedom, of a chance to look about them and learn something, to be decent and clean, to see their child grow up to be strong. And now it was all gone. It would never be. They had played the game, and they had lost. Six years more of toil they had to face before they could expect the least respite the cessation of the payments upon the house, and how cruelly certain it was that they could never stand six years of such a life as they were living. They were lost, they were going down, and there was no deliverance for them, no hope. For all the help it gave them the vast city in which they lived might have been an ocean waste, a wilderness, a desert, a tomb. So often this mood would come to Ona in the night-time, when something wakened her. She would lie, afraid of the beating of her own heart, fronting the blood-red eyes of the old primeval terror of life. Once she cried aloud and woke Jurgis, who was tired and cross. After that she learned to weep silently. Their moods so seldom came together now. 
It was as if their hopes were buried in separate graves. Jurgis, being a man, had troubles of his own. There was another specter following him. He had never spoken of it, nor would he allow anyone else to speak of it. He had never acknowledged its existence to himself. Yet the battle with it took all the manhood that he had, and once or twice, alas, a little more. Jurgis had discovered drink. He was working in the steaming pit of hell. Day after day, week after week, until now there was not an organ of his body that did its work without pain, until the sound of ocean breakers echoed in his head day and night, and the buildings swayed and danced before him as he went down the street. And from all the unending horror of this there was a respite, a deliverance. He could drink. He could forget the pain. He could slip off the burden. He would see clearly again. He would be master of his brain, of his thoughts, of his will. His dead self would stir in him, and he would find himself laughing and cracking jokes with his companions. He would be a man again, and master of his life. It was not an easy thing for Jurgis to take more than two or three drinks. With the first drink he could eat a meal, and he could persuade himself that that was economy. With the second he could eat another meal, but there would come a time when he could eat no more, and then to pay for a drink was an unthinkable extravagance, a defiance of the age-old instincts of his hunger-haunted class. One day, however, he took the plunge, and drank up all that he had in his pockets, and went home half-piped, as the men phrase it. He was happier than he had been in a year, and yet because he knew that the happiness would not last he was savage, too with those who would wreck it, and with the world and with his life. And then again beneath this he was sick with the shame of himself. Afterward when he saw the despair of his family and reckoned up the money he had spent, the tears came into his eyes, and he began the long battle with the specter. It was a battle that had no end, that never could have one, but Jurgis did not realize that very clearly. He was not given much time for reflection. He simply knew that he was always fighting. Steeped in misery and despair as he was, merely to walk down the street was to be put upon the rack. There was surely a saloon on the corner, perhaps on all four corners, and some in the middle of the block as well and each one stretched out a hand to him, each one had a personality of its own, allurements unlike any other. Going and coming, before sunrise and after dark, there was warmth and a glow of light, and the steam of hot food, and perhaps music, or a friendly face, and a word of good cheer. Jurgis developed a fondness for having Ona on his arm whenever he went out on the street, and he would hold her tightly and walk fast. It was pitiful to have Ona know of this. It drove him wild to think of it. The thing was not fair, for Ona had never tasted drink, and so could not understand. Sometimes, in desperate hours, he would find himself wishing that she might learn what it was, so that he need not be ashamed in her presence. They might drink together and escape from the horror, escape for a while, come what would. So there came a time when nearly all the conscious life of Jurgis consisted of a struggle with the craving for liquor. He would have ugly moods, when he hated Ona and the whole family, because they stood in his way. He was a fool to have married, he had tied himself down, had made himself a slave. It was all because he was a married man that he was compelled to stay in the yards, if it had not been for that he might have gone off like Jonas and to hell with the packers. There were few single men in the fertilizer mill, and those few were working only for a chance to escape. Meantime, too, they had something to think about while they worked. They had the memory of the last time they had been drunk, and the hope of the time when they would be drunk again. As for Jurgis, he was expected to bring home every penny. 
He could not even go with the men at noontime. He was supposed to sit down and eat his dinner on a pile of fertilizer dust. This was not always his mood, of course. He still loved his family. But just now was a time of trial. Poor little Antonas, for instance, who had never failed to win him with a smile. Little Antonas was not smiling just now, being a mass of fiery red pimples. He had had all the diseases that babies are heir to, in quick succession. Scarlet fever, mumps, and whooping cough in the first year, and now he was down with the measles. There was no one to attend to him but Kotrina. There was no doctor to help him because they were too poor, and children did not die of the measles, at least not often. Now and then Kotrina would find time to sob over his woes, but for the greater part of the time he had to be left alone, barricaded upon the bed. The floor was full of drafts, and if he caught cold he would die. At night he was tied down lest he should kick the covers off him while the family lay in their stupor of exhaustion. He would lie and scream for hours, almost in convulsions, and then when he was worn out he would lie whimpering and wailing in his torment. He was burning up with fever, and his eyes were running sores. In the daytime he was a thing uncanny and impish to behold, a plaster of pimples and sweat a great purple lump of misery. Yet all this was not really as cruel as it sounds, for sick as he was, little Antanas was the least unfortunate member of that family. He was quite able to bear his sufferings. It was as if he had all these complaints to show what a prodigy of health he was. He was the child of his parents' youth and joy. He grew up like the conjurer's rosebush, and all the world was his oyster. In general he toddled around the kitchen all day with a lean and hungry look. The portion of the family's allowance that fell to him was not enough, and he was unrestrainable in his demand for more. Antonas was but little over a year old, and already no one but his father could manage him. It seemed as if he had taken all of his mother's strength, had left nothing for those that might come after him. Ona was with child again now, and it was a dreadful thing to contemplate. Even Jurgis, dumb and despairing as he was, could not but understand that yet other agonies were on the way, and shudder at the thought of them, for Ona was visibly going to pieces. In the first place she was developing a cough, like the one that had killed old Dede Antanas. She had had a trace of it ever since that fatal morning when the greedy streetcar corporation had turned her out into the rain, but now it was beginning to grow serious and to wake her up at night. Even worse than that was the fearful nervousness from which she suffered. She would have frightful headaches and fits of aimless weeping, and sometimes she would come home at night shuddering and moaning, and would fling herself down upon the bed and burst into tears. Several times she was quite beside herself and hysterical, and then Jurgis would go half mad with fright. Elzbieta would explain to him that it could not be helped, that a woman was subject to such things when she was pregnant, but he was hardly to be persuaded, and would beg and plead to know what had happened. She had never been like this before, he would argue. It was monstrous and unthinkable. It was the life she had to live, the accursed work she had to do, that was killing her, by inches. She was not fitted for it. No woman was fitted for it. No woman ought to be allowed to do such work. If the world could not keep them alive any other way it ought to kill them at once, and be done with it. They ought not to marry, to have children. No working man ought to marry, if he... Jurgis had known what a woman was like, he would have had his eyes torn out first. So he would carry on, becoming half hysterical himself, which was an unbearable thing to see in a big man. Ona would pull herself together and fling herself into his arms, begging him to stop, to be still, that she would be better 
it would be all right. So she would lie and sob out her grief upon his shoulder, while he gazed at her, as helpless as a wounded animal, the target of unseen enemies. End of chapter 14 Recording by Tom Weiss Chapter 15 of The Jungle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss The Jungle by Upton Sinclair Chapter 15 The beginning of these perplexing things was in the summer, and each time Ona would promise him with terror in her voice that it would not happen again, but in vain. Each crisis would leave Jurgis more and more frightened, more disposed to distrust Elzbieta's consolations, and to believe that there was some terrible thing about all this that he was not allowed to know. Once or twice in these outbreaks he caught Ona's eye, and it seemed to him like the eye of a hunted animal. There were broken phrases of anguish and despair now and then, amid her frantic weeping. It was only because he was so numb and beaten himself that Jurgis did not worry more about this. But he never thought of it, except when he was dragged to it. He lived like a dumb beast of burden, knowing only the moment in which he was. The winter was coming on again, more menacing and cruel than ever. It was October, and the holiday rush had begun. It was necessary for the packing machines to grind till late at night to provide food that would be eaten at Christmas breakfast, and Maria and Elzbieta and Ona as part of the machine began working fifteen or sixteen hours a day. There was no choice about this. Whatever work there was to be done they had to do, if they wished to keep their places. Besides that it added another pittance to their incomes. So they staggered on with the awful load. They would start work every morning at seven, and eat their dinners at noon, and then work until ten or eleven at night without another mouthful of food. Jurgis wanted to wait for them, to help them home at night, but they would not think of this. The fertilizer mill was not running over time, and there was no place for him to wait save in a saloon. Each would stagger out into the darkness and make her way to the corner where they met, or, if the others had already gone, would get into a car and begin a painful struggle to keep awake. When they got home they were always too tired either to eat or to undress. They would crawl into bed with their shoes on and lie like logs. If they should fail they would certainly be lost. If they held out they might have enough coal for the winter. A day or two before Thanksgiving Day there came a snowstorm. It began in the afternoon, and by evening two inches had fallen. Jurgis tried to wait for the women, but went into a saloon to get warm and took two drinks and came out and ran home to escape from the demon. There he lay down to wait for them, and instantly fell asleep. When he opened his eyes again he was in the midst of a nightmare and found Elzbieta shaking him and crying out. At first he could not realize what she was saying. Ona had not come home. "'What time was it?' he asked. "'It was morning, time to be up.' Ona had not been home that night, and it was bitter cold and a foot of snow on the ground. Jurgis sat up with a start. Maria was crying with fright, and the children were wailing in sympathy little Stanislavus in addition, because the terror of the snow was upon him. Jurgis had nothing to put on but his shoes and his coat, and in half a minute he was out of the door. Then, however, he realized that there was no need of haste, that he had no idea where to go. It was still dark as midnight, and the thick snowflakes were sifting down. Everything was so silent that he could hear the rustle of them as they fell. In the few seconds that he stood there hesitating he was covered white. 
he set off at a run for the yards, stopping by the way to inquire in the saloons that were open. Ona might have been overcome on the way, or else she might have met with an accident in the machines. When he got to the place where she worked he inquired of one of the watchmen. There had not been any accident, so far as the man had heard. At the time office, which he found already open, the clerk told him that Ona's check had been turned in the night before, showing that she had left her work. After that there was nothing for him to do but wait, pacing back and forth in the snow, meantime to keep from freezing. Already the yards were full of activity, cattle were being unloaded from the cars in the distance, and across the way the beef-luggers were toiling in the darkness, carrying two hundred-pound quarters of bullocks into the refrigerator cars. Before the first streaks of daylight there came the crowding throngs of workingmen, shivering and swinging their dinner-pails as they hurried by. Jurgis took up his stand by the time-office window, where alone there was light enough for him to see. The snow fell so quick that it was only by peering closely that he could make sure that Ona did not pass him. Seven o'clock came, the hour when the great packing machine began to move. Jurgis ought to have been at his place in the fertilizer mill, but instead he was waiting, in an agony of fear, for Ona. It was fifteen minutes after the hour when he saw a form emerge from the snow-mist, and sprang toward it with a cry. It was she, running swiftly. As she saw him she staggered forward and half fell into his outstretched arms. "'What has been the matter?' he cried anxiously. "'Where have you been?' It was several seconds before she could get breath to answer him. "'I couldn't get home,' she exclaimed. "'The snow! The cars had stopped!' "'But where were you then?' he demanded. "'I had to go home with a friend,' she panted. "'With Yadviga!' Jurgis drew a deep breath. Then he noticed that she was sobbing and trembling, as if in one of those nervous crises that he dreaded so. "'But what's the matter?' he cried. "'What has happened?' "'Oh, Jurgis, I was so frightened,' she said, clinging to him wildly. "'I have been so worried.' They were near the time-station window, and people were staring at them. Jurgis led her away. "'How do you mean?' he asked, in perplexity. "'I was afraid. I was just afraid,' sobbed Ona. "'I knew you wouldn't know where I was, and I didn't know what you might do. I tried to get home, but I was so tired. Oh, Jurgis, Jurgis!' He was so glad to get her back that he could not think clearly about anything else. It did not seem strange to him that she should be so very much upset. All her fright and incoherent protestations did not matter since he had her back. He let her cry away her tears, and then, because it was nearly eight o'clock, and they would lose another hour if they delayed, he left her at the packing-house door with her ghastly white face and her haunted eyes of terror. There was another brief interval. Christmas was almost come, and because the snow still held and the searching cold Morning after morning Jurgis had carried his wife to her post, staggering with her through the darkness, until at last, one night, came the end. It lacked but three days of the holidays. About midnight Maria and Elzbieta came home, exclaiming in alarm when they found that Ona had not come. The two had agreed to meet her, and, after waiting, had gone to the room where she worked only to find that the ham-wrapping girls had quit work an hour before and left. There was no snow that night, nor was it especially cold, and still Ona had not come. Something more serious must be wrong this time. They aroused Jurgis, and he sat up and listened crossly to the story. She must have gone home again with Jadwiga, he said. Jadwiga lived only two blocks from the yards, and perhaps she had been tired. Nothing could have happened to her, and even if there had, there was nothing could be done about it until morning. Jurgis turned over in his bed and was snoring again before the two had closed the door. In the morning, however, he was up and out nearly an hour before the usual time. Jadwiga Marcinkus lived on the other side of the yards, 
beyond Halstead Street, with her mother and sisters in a single basement room, for Mikolas had recently lost one hand from blood poisoning, and their marriage had been put off forever. The door of the room was in the rear, reached by a narrow court, and Jurgis saw a light in the window and heard something frying as he passed. He knocked, half expecting that Ona would answer. Instead there was one of Jadwiga's little sisters, who gazed at him through a crack in the door. "'Where's Ona?' he demanded, and the child looked at him in perplexity. "'Ona?' she said. "'Yes,' said Jurgis. "'Isn't she here?' "'No,' said the child, and Jurgis gave a start. A moment later came Jadwiga, peering over the child's head. When she saw who it was she slid around out of sight, for she was not quite dressed. "'Jurgis must excuse her,' she began. Her mother was very ill. "'Ona isn't here?' Jurgis demanded, too alarmed to wait for her to finish. "'Why, no,' said Jadwiga. "'What made you think she would be here? Had she said she was coming?' "'No,' he answered. "'But she hasn't come home, and I thought she would be here the same as before.' "'As before?' echoed Jadwiga, in perplexity. "'The time she spent the night here,' said Jurgis. "'There must be some mistake,' she answered quickly. "'Ona has never spent the night here.' He was only half able to realize the words. "'Why, why!' he exclaimed. Two weeks ago, Jadwiga. She told me so the night it snowed, and she could not get home.' "'There must be some mistake,' declared the girl again. "'She didn't come here.' He steadied himself by the door sill, and Jadwiga, in her anxiety, for she was fond of Ona, opened the door wide, holding her jacket across her throat. "'Are you sure you didn't misunderstand her?' she cried. "'She must have meant somewhere else. She—' "'She said here,' insisted Jurgis. "'She told me all about you, and how you were, and what you said. Are you sure you haven't forgotten you weren't away?' "'No, no!' she exclaimed, and then came a peevish voice. "'Jadwiga, you are giving the baby a cold. Shut the door!' Jurgis stood for half a minute more, stammering his perplexity through an eighth of an inch of crack, and then, as there was really nothing more to be said, he excused himself and went away. He walked on half-dazed, without knowing where he went. Ona had deceived him. She had lied to him. And what could that mean? Where had she been? Where was she now? He could hardly grasp the thing, much less try to solve it. But a hundred wild surmises came to him. A sense of impending calamity overwhelmed him. Because there was nothing else to do, he went back to the time office to watch again. He waited until nearly an hour after seven, and then went to the room where Ona worked to make inquiries of Ona's forelady. The forelady, he found, had not yet come. All the lines of cars that came from downtown were stalled. There had been an accident in the powerhouse, and no cars had been running since last night. Meantime, however, the ham wrappers were working away, with someone else in charge of them. The girl who answered Jurgis was busy and as she talked she looked to see if she were being watched. Then a man came up wheeling a truck. He knew Jurgis for Ona's husband, and was curious about the mystery. "'Maybe the cars had something to do with it,' he suggested. "'Maybe she had gone downtown.' "'No,' said Jurgis. "'She never went downtown.' "'Perhaps not,' said the man. Jurgis thought he saw him exchange a swift glance with the girl as he spoke and he demanded quickly, "'What do you know about it?' But the man had seen that the boss was watching him. He started on again, pushing his truck. "'I don't know anything about it,' he said over his shoulder. "'How should I know where your wife goes?' Then Jurgis went out again, and paced up and down before the building. All the morning he stayed there, with no thought of his work. About noon he went to the police station to make inquiries, 
and then came back again for another anxious vigil. Finally, toward the middle of the afternoon, he set out for home once more. He was walking out Ashland Avenue. The streetcars had begun running again, and several passed him, packed to the steps with people. The sight of them set Jurgis to thinking again of the man's sarcastic remark, and half involuntarily he found himself watching the cars, with the result that he gave a sudden startled exclamation and stopped short in his tracks. Then he broke into a run. For a whole block he tore after the car, only a little ways behind. That rusty black hat with the drooping red flower. It might not be Ona's, but there was very little likelihood of it. He would know for certain very soon, for she would get out two blocks ahead. He slowed down and let the car go on. She got out, and as soon as she was out of sight on the side street Jurgis broke into a run. Suspicion was rife in him now, and he was not ashamed to shadow her. He saw her turn the corner near their home, and then he ran again, and saw her as she went up the porch steps of the house. After that he turned back, and for five minutes paced up and down, his hands clenched tightly and his lips set, his mind in a turmoil. Then he went home and entered. As he opened the door he saw Elzbieta, who had also been looking for Ona, and had come home again. She was now on tiptoe, and had a finger on her lips. Jurgis waited until she was close to him. "'Don't make any noise,' she whispered hurriedly. "'What's the matter?' he asked. "'Ona is asleep,' she panted. "'She's been very ill. I'm afraid her mind's been wandering, Jurgis. She was lost on the street all night, and I've only just succeeded in getting her quiet.' "'When did she come in?' he asked. "'Soon after you left this morning,' said Elzbieta. "'And has she been out since?' "'No, of course not. She's so weak, Jurgis. She—' And he set his teeth hard together. "'You are lying to me,' he said. Elzbieta started and turned pale. "'Why?' she gasped. "'What do you mean?' But Jurgis did not answer. He pushed her aside and strode to the bedroom door and opened it. Ona was sitting on the bed. She turned a startled look upon him as he entered. He closed the door in Elzbieta's face and went towards his wife. "'Where have you been?' he demanded. She had her hands clasped tightly in her lap, and he saw that her face was as white as paper and drawn with pain. She gasped once or twice as she tried to answer him, and then began speaking low and swiftly. Jurgis, I... I think I have been out of my mind. I started to come home last night, and I could not find the way. I walked. I walked all night, I think, and... and I only got home this morning. You needed a rest, he said in a hard tone. Why did you go out again? He was looking her fairly in the face, and he could read the sudden fear and wild uncertainty that leaped into her eyes. "'I... I had to go to... to the store,' she gasped, almost in a whisper. "'I had to go...' "'You are lying to me,' said Jurgis. Then he clenched his fist and took a step toward her. "'Why do you lie to me?' he cried fiercely. "'What are you doing that you have to lie to me?' "'Jurgis!' she exclaimed, staring up in fright. "'Oh, Jurgis, how can you?' "'You have lied to me, I say,' he cried. "'You told me you had been to Jadwiga's house that other night, and you hadn't. You had been where you were last night, somewheres downtown, for I saw you get off the car. Where were you?' It was as if he had struck a knife into her. She seemed to go all to pieces. For half a second she stood, reeling and swaying, staring at him with horror in her eyes. Then with a cry of anguish she tottered forward, stretching out her arms to him. But he stepped aside, deliberately, and let her fall. She caught herself at the side of the bed, and then sank down, burying her face in her hands 
and bursting into frantic weeping. Then came one of those hysterical crises that had so often dismayed him. Ona sobbed and wept, her fear and anguish building themselves up into long climaxes. Furious gusts of emotion would come sweeping over her, shaking her as the tempest shakes the trees upon the hills. All her frame would quiver and throb with them. It was as if some dreadful thing rose up within her and took possession of her, torturing her, tearing her. This thing had been wont to set Jurgis quite beside himself. But now he stood with his lips set tightly and his hands clenched. She might weep till she killed herself. But she should not move him this time. Not an inch. Not an inch. Because the sound she made set his blood to running cold and his lips to quivering in spite of himself, he was glad of the diversion when Teta Elzbieta, pale with fright, opened the door and rushed in. Yet he turned upon her with an oath. "'Go out!' he cried. "'Go out!' And then, as she stood hesitating, about to speak, he seized her by the arm and half flung her from the room, slamming the door and barring it with the table. Then he turned again and faced Ona, crying, "'Now answer me!' Yet she did not hear him. She was still in the grip of the fiend. Jurgis could see her outstretched hands shaking and twitching, roaming here and there over the bed at will, like living things. He could see convulsive shudderings start in her body and run through her limbs. She was sobbing and choking. It was as if there were too many sounds for one throat. They came chasing each other like waves upon the sea. Then her voice would begin to rise into screams, louder and louder until it broke in wild, horrible peals of laughter. Jurgis bore it until he could bear it no longer, and then he sprang at her, seizing her by the shoulders and shaking her, shouting into her ear, "'Stop it, I say! Stop it!' She looked up at him, out of her agony. Then she fell forward at his feet. She caught them in her hands in spite of his efforts to step aside, and with her face upon the floor lay writhing. It made a choking in Jurgis' throat to hear her, and he cried again, more savagely than before, "'Stop it, I say!' This time she heeded him, and caught her breath and lay silent, save for the gasping sobs that wrenched all her frame. For a long minute she lay there, perfectly motionless, until a cold fear seized her husband, thinking that she was dying. Suddenly, however, he heard her voice faintly. Jurgis, Jurgis. What is it? he said. He had to bend down to her. She was so weak. She was pleading with him in broken phrases, painfully uttered. Have faith in me. Believe me. Believe what? he cried. Believe that I, that I know best, that I love you, and do not ask me what you did. Oh, Jurgis, please, please, it is for the best. It is... He started to speak again, but she rushed on frantically, heading him off. If you will only do it, if you will only, only believe me. It wasn't my fault. I couldn't help it. It will be all right. It is nothing. It is no harm. Oh, Jurgis, please, please. She had hold of him and was trying to raise herself to look at him. He could feel the palsied shaking of her hands and the heaving of the bosom she pressed against him. She managed to catch one of his hands and gripped it convulsively, drawing it to her face and bathing it in her tears. Oh, believe me, believe me, she wailed again and he shouted in fury, I will not! But still she clung to him, wailing aloud in her despair. Oh, Jurgis, think what you are doing. It will ruin us, it will ruin us. Oh, no, you must not do it. No, don't, don't do it. You must not do it. It will drive me mad, it will kill me. No, no, Jurgis, I am crazy, it is nothing. You do not really need to know. We can be happy. 
We can love each other just the same. Oh, please, please believe me. Her words fairly drove him wild. He tore his hands loose and flung her off. Answer me, he cried. God damn it, I say, answer me. She sank down upon the floor, beginning to cry again. It was like listening to the moan of a damned soul, and Jurgis could not stand it. He smote his fist upon the table by his side and shouted again at her, Answer me! She began to scream aloud, her voice like the voice of some wild beast. I, I, I can't, I can't do it. Why can't you do it? he shouted. I don't know how. He sprang and caught her by the arm, lifting her up and glaring into her face. Tell me where you were last night, he panted. Quick, out with it. Then she began to whisper, one word at a time. I was in a house downtown. What house? What do you mean? She tried to hide her eyes away, but he held her. Miss Henderson's house, she gasped. He did not understand at first. Miss Henderson's house, he echoed. And then suddenly, as in an explosion, the horrible truth burst over him, and he reeled and staggered back with a scream. He caught himself against the wall and put his hand to his forehead, staring about him and whispering, Jesus, Jesus. An instant later he leaped at her as she lay groveling at his feet. He seized her by the throat. Tell me, he gasped hoarsely, quick, who took you to that place? She tried to get away, making him furious. He thought it was fear of the pain of his clutch. He did not understand that it was the agony of her shame. Still she answered him. Connor. Connor? he gasped. Who is Connor? The boss, she answered. The man. He tightened his grip in his frenzy, and only when he saw her eyes closing did he realize that he was choking her. Then he relaxed his fingers and crouched, waiting, until she opened her lids again. His breath beat hot into her face. Tell me, he whispered at last, tell me about it. She lay perfectly motionless, and he had to hold his breath to catch her words. I did not want to do it, she said. I tried. I tried not to do it. I only did it to save us. It was our only chance. Again for a space there was no sound but his panting. Ona's eyes closed, and when she spoke again she did not open them. He told me he would have turned me off. He told me he would. We would all of us lose our places. We could never get anything to do, here, again. He, he meant it. He would have ruined us. Jurgis' arms were shaking so that he could scarcely hold himself up, and lurched forward now and then as he listened. When, when did this begin? he gasped. At the very first, she said. She spoke as if in a trance. It was all, it was their plot, Miss Henderson's plot. She hated me, and he, he wanted me. He used to speak to me, out on the platform. Then he began to, to make love to me. He offered me money. He begged. He said he loved me. Then he threatened me. He knew all about us. He knew we would starve. He knew your boss. He knew Maria's. He would hound us to death, he said. Then he said, if I would, if I, we would all of us be sure of work. Always. Then one day he caught hold of me. He would not let me go. He, he, where was this? In the hallway, at night after everyone had gone. I could not help it. I thought of you, of the baby, of mother and the children. I was afraid of him, afraid to cry out. A moment ago her face had been ashen gray. 
Now it was scarlet. She was beginning to breathe hard again. Jurgis made not a sound. That was two months ago. Then he wanted me to come to that house. He wanted me to stay there. He said, all of us, that we would not have to work. He made me come there in the evenings. I told you, you thought I was at the factory. Then, one night it snowed, and I couldn't get back. And last night, the cars were stopped. It was such a little thing to ruin us all. I tried to walk, but I couldn't. I didn't want you to know. It would have... It would have been all right. We could have gone on, just the same. You need never have known about it. He was getting tired of me. He would have let me alone soon. I am going to have a baby. I am getting ugly. He told me that. Twice he told me, last night. He kicked me last night, too. And now you will kill him. You, you will kill him. And we shall die. All this she had said without a quiver. She lay still as death not an eyelid moving. And Jurgis, too, said not a word. He lifted himself by the bed and stood up. He did not stop for another glance at her, but went to the door and opened it. He did not see Elzbieta crouching terrified in the corner. He went out hatless, leaving the street door open behind him. The instant his feet were on the sidewalk he broke into a run. He ran like one possessed, blindly, furiously, looking neither to the right nor left. He was on Ashland Avenue before exhaustion compelled him to slow down, and then, noticing a car, he made a dart for it and drew himself aboard. His eyes were wild and his hair flying, and he was breathing hoarsely like a wounded bull. But the people on the car did not notice this particularly. Perhaps it seemed natural to them that a man who smelled as Jurgis smelled should exhibit an aspect to correspond. They began to give way before him as usual. The conductor took his nickel gingerly with the tips of his fingers, and then left him with the platform to himself. Jurgis did not even notice it. His thoughts were far away. Within his soul it was like a roaring furnace. He stood waiting, waiting crouching as if for a spring. He had some of his breath back when the car came to the entrance of the yards, and so he leaped off and started again, racing at full speed. People turned and stared at him, but he saw no one. There was the factory, and he bounded through the doorway and down the corridor. He knew the room where Ona worked, and he knew Connor, the boss of the loading gang, outside. He looked for the man as he sprang into the room. The truckmen were hard at work loading the freshly packed boxes and barrels upon the cars. Jurgis shot one swift glance up and down the platform. The man was not on it. But then suddenly he heard a voice in the corridor and started for it with a bound. In an instant more he confronted the boss. He was a big, red-faced Irishman, coarse-featured, and smelling of liquor. He saw Jurgis as he crossed the threshold and turned white. He hesitated one second, as if meaning to run, and in the next his assailant was upon him. He put up his hands to protect his face, but Jurgis, lunging with all the power of his arm and body, struck him fairly between the eyes and knocked him backward. The next moment he was on top of him, burying his fingers in his throat. To Jurgis this man's whole presence reeked of the crime he had committed. The touch of his body was madness to him. It set every nerve of him a-tremble. It aroused all the demon in his soul. It had worked its will upon Ona, this great beast, and now he had it, he had it. It was his turn now. Things swam blood before him, and he screamed aloud in his fury, lifting his victim and smashing his head upon the floor. The place, of course, was in an uproar, women fainting and shrieking, and men rushing in. Jurgis was so bent upon his task that he knew nothing of this, 
and scarcely realized that people were trying to interfere with him. It was only when half a dozen men had seized him by the legs and shoulders and were pulling at him that he understood that he was losing his prey. In a flash he had bent down and sunk his teeth into the man's cheek, and when they tore him away he was dripping with blood and little ribbons of skin were hanging in his mouth. They got him down upon the floor, clinging to him by his arms and legs, and still they could hardly hold him. He fought like a tiger, writhing and twisting, half flinging them off, and starting towards his unconscious enemy. Yet others rushed in until there was a little mountain of twisted limbs and bodies, heaving and tossing, and working its way about the room. In the end, by their sheer weight, they choked the breath out of him, and then they carried him to the company police station, where he lay still until they had summoned a patrol wagon to take him away. End of chapter 15 Recording by Tom Weiss Chapter 16 of the Jungle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Chapter 16. When Jurgis got up again, he went quietly enough. He was exhausted and half dazed, and besides, he saw the blue uniforms of the policemen. He drove in a patrol wagon with half a dozen of them watching him, keeping as far away as possible, however, on account of the fertilizer. Then he stood before the sergeant's desk and gave his name and address, and saw a charge of assault and battery entered against him. On his way to his cell a burly policeman cursed him because he started down the wrong corridor, and then added a kick when he was not quick enough. Nevertheless, Jurgis did not even lift his eyes. He had lived two years and a half in Packingtown, and he knew what the police were. It was as much as a man's very life was worth to anger them, here in their inmost lair. Like as not a dozen would pile on to him at once and pound his face into a pulp. It would be nothing unusual if he got his skull cracked in the melee, in which case they would report that he had been drunk and had fallen down, and there would be no one to know the difference or to care. So a barred door clanged upon Jurgis, and he sat down upon a bench and buried his face in his hands. He was alone. He had the afternoon and all of the night to himself. At first he was like a wild beast that has glutted itself. He was in a dull stupor of satisfaction. He had done up the scoundrel pretty well, not as well as he would have if they had given him a minute more, but pretty well all the same. The ends of his fingers were still tingling from their contact with the fellow's throat. But then, little by little, as his strength came back and his senses cleared, he began to see beyond his momentary gratification. That he had nearly killed the boss would not help Ona. Not the horrors that she had borne, nor the memory that would haunt her all her days. It would not help to feed her and her child. She would certainly lose her place, while he, what was to happen to him, God only knew. Half the night he paced the floor, wrestling with this nightmare, and when he was exhausted he lay down trying to sleep, but finding instead for the first time in his life that his brain was too much for him. In the cell next to him was a drunken wife-beater, and in the one beyond a yelling maniac. At night they opened the station-house to the homeless wanderers who were crowded about the door, shivering in the winter blast, and they thronged into the corridor outside of the cells. Some of them stretched themselves out on the bare stone floor and fell to snoring. Others sat up, laughing and talking, cursing and quarreling. The air was fetid with their breath, yet in spite of this some of them smelled Jurgis 
and called down the torrents of hell upon him, while he lay in a far corner of his cell, counting the throbbings of the blood in his forehead. They had brought him his supper, which was duffers and dope, being hunks of dry bread on a tin plate and coffee called dope because it was drugged to keep the prisoners quiet. Jurgis had not known this, or he would have swallowed the stuff in desperation. As it was, every nerve of him was a quiver with shame and rage. Toward morning the place fell silent, and he got up and began to pace his cell, and then within the soul of him there rose up a fiend, red-eyed and cruel, and tore out the strings of his heart. It was not for himself that he suffered. What did a man who worked in Durham's fertilizer mill care about anything that the world might do to him? What was any tyranny of prison compared with the tyranny of the past, of the thing that had happened and could not be recalled, of the memory that could never be effaced? The horror of it drove him mad. He stretched out his arms to heaven, crying out for deliverance from it, and there was no deliverance. There was no power, even in heaven, that could undo the past. It was a ghost that would not drown. It followed him, it seized upon him and beat him to the ground. Ah, if only he could have foreseen it, but then he would have foreseen it if he had not been a fool. He smote his hands upon his forehead, cursing himself because he had ever allowed Ona to work where she had because he had not stood between her and a fate which everyone knew to be so common. He should have taken her away, even if it were to lie down and die of starvation in the gutters of Chicago's streets. And now, oh, it could not be true, it was too monstrous, too horrible. It was a thing that could not be faced. A new shuddering seized him every time he tried to think of it. No, there was no bearing the load of it, there was no living under it, there would be none for her. He knew that he might pardon her, might plead with her on his knees, but she would never look him in the face again, she would never be his wife again. The shame of it would kill her, there could be no other deliverance, and it was best that she should die. This was simple and clear, and yet, with cruel inconsistency, whenever he escaped from this nightmare it was to suffer and cry out at the vision of Ona starving. They had put him in jail, and they would keep him here a long time, years maybe, and Ona would surely not go to work again, broken and crushed as she was. And Elzbieta and Maria too might lose their places if that hell-fiend Connor chose to set to work to ruin them, they would all be turned out. And even if he did not, they could not live. Even if the boys left school again, they could surely not pay all the bills without him and Ona. They had only a few dollars now. They had just paid the rent of the house a week ago, and that after it was two weeks overdue so it would be due again in a week. They would have no money to pay it then, and they would lose the house after all their long, heartbreaking struggle. Three times now the agent had warned him that he would not tolerate another delay. Perhaps it was very base of Jurgis to be thinking about the house when he had the other unspeakable thing to fill his mind. Yet how much he had suffered for this house, how much they had all of them suffered. It was their one hope of respite as long as they lived. They had put all their money into it, and they were working people, poor people, whose money was their strength, the very substance of them, body and soul, the thing by which they lived and for lack of which they died. And they would lose it all. They would be turned out into the streets, and have to hide in some icy garret, and live or die as best they could. Jurgis had all the night, and all of many more nights, to think about this, and he saw the thing in its details. He lived it all as if he were there. They would sell their furniture, and then run into debt at the stores, 
and then be refused credit. They would borrow a little from the Chevilleses, whose delicatessen store was tottering on the brink of ruin. The neighbors would come and help them a little. Poor, sick Jadwiga would bring a few spare pennies, as she always did when people were starving, and Tomosius Kushlaika would bring them the proceeds of a night's fiddling. So they would struggle to hang on until he got out of jail. Or would they know that he was in jail? Would they be able to find out anything about him? Would they be allowed to see him? Or was it to be part of his punishment to be kept in ignorance about their fate? His mind would hang upon the worst possibilities. He saw Ona ill and tortured, Maria out of her place, little Stanislavus unable to get to work for the snow, the whole family turned out on the street. God Almighty, would they actually let them lie down in the street and die? Would there be no help even then? Would they wander about in the snow till they froze? Jurgis had never seen any dead bodies in the streets, but he had seen people evicted and disappear. No one knew where. And though the city had a relief bureau, though there was a charity organization society in the stockyards district, in all his life there he had never heard of either of them. They did not advertise their activities, having more calls than they could attend to without that. So on until morning. Then he had another ride in the patrol wagon, along with the drunken wife-beater and the maniac, several plain drunks and saloon fighters, a burglar, and two men who had been arrested for stealing meat from the packing houses. Along with them he was driven into a large white-walled room, stale-smelling and crowded. In front, upon a raised platform behind a rail, sat a stout, florid-faced personage, with a nose broken out in purple blotches. Our friend realized vaguely that he was about to be tried. He wondered what for, whether or not his victim might be dead, and if so, what they would do with him. Hang him, perhaps, or beat him to death. Nothing would have surprised Jurgis, who knew little of the laws. Yet he had picked up gossip enough to have it occur to him that the loud-voiced man upon the bench might be the notorious Justice Callahan, about whom the people of Packingtown spoke with bated breath. Pat Callahan, Growler Pat, as he had been known before he ascended the bench, had begun life as a butcher boy and a bruiser of local reputation. He had gone into politics almost as soon as he had learned to talk, and had held two offices at once before he was old enough to vote. If Scully was the thumb, Pat Callahan was the first finger of the unseen hand whereby the packers held down the people of the district. No politician in Chicago ranked higher in their confidence. He had been at it a long time, had been the business agent in the city council of Old Durham, the self-made merchant way back in the early days, when the whole city of Chicago had been up at auction. Growler Pat had given up holding city offices very early in his career, caring only for party power and giving the rest of his time to superintending his dives and brothels. Of late years, however, since his children were growing up, he had begun to value respectability, and had had himself made a magistrate, a position for which he was admirably fitted, because of his strong conservatism and his contempt for foreigners. Jurgis sat gazing about the room for an hour or two. He was in hopes that someone of the family would come, but in this he was disappointed. Finally, he was led before the bar, and a lawyer for the company appeared against him. Connor was under the doctor's care, the lawyer explained briefly, and if his honor would hold the prisoner for a week. Three hundred dollars, said his honor promptly. Jurgis was staring from the judge to the lawyer in perplexity. Have you any one to go on your bond? demanded the judge, and then a clerk who stood at Jurgis' elbow explained to him what this meant. The latter shook his head, and before he realized what had happened the policemen were leading him away again. 
They took him to a room where other prisoners were waiting, and here he stayed until court adjourned, when he had another long and bitterly cold ride in a patrol wagon to the county jail, which is on the north side of the city and nine or ten miles from the stockyards. Here they searched Jurgis, leaving him only his money, which consisted of fifteen cents. Then they led him to a room and told him to strip for a bath, after which he had to walk down a long gallery past the grated cell doors of the inmates of the jail. This was a great event to the latter, the daily review of the new arrivals, all stark naked, and many and diverting were the comments. Jurgis was required to stay in the bath longer than any one, in the vain hope of getting out of him a few of his phosphates and acids. The prisoners roomed two in a cell, but that day there was one left over, and he was the one. The cells were in tiers, opening upon galleries. His cell was about five feet by seven in size, with a stone floor and a heavy wooden bench built into it. There was no window, the only light came from the windows near the roof at one end of the court outside. There were two bunks, one above the other, each with a straw mattress and a pair of gray blankets, the latter stiff as boards with filth and alive with fleas, bedbugs, and lice. When Jurgis lifted up the mattress he discovered beneath it a layer of scurrying roaches, almost as badly frightened as himself. Here they brought him more duffers and dope, with the addition of a bowl of soup. Many of the prisoners had their meals brought in from a restaurant, but Jurgis had no money for that. Some had books to read, and cards to play, with candles to burn by night, but Jurgis was all alone in darkness and silence. He could not sleep again. There was the same maddening procession of thoughts that lashed him like whips upon his naked back. When night fell he was pacing up and down his cell like a wild beast that breaks its teeth upon the bars of its cage. Now and then in his frenzy he would fling himself against the walls of the place, beating his hands upon them. They cut him and bruised him, they were cold and merciless as the men who had built them. In the distance there was a church tower bell that told the hours one by one. When it came to midnight Jurgis was lying upon the floor with his head in his hands, listening. Instead of falling silent at the end, the bell broke into a sudden clangor. Jurgis raised his head. What could that mean? A fire? God! Suppose there were to be a fire in this jail! But then he made out a melody in the ringing. There were chimes, and they seemed to waken the city. All around, far and near, there were bells ringing wild music. For fully a minute Jurgis lay lost in wonder. Before, all at once, the meaning of it broke over him, that this was Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve! He had forgotten it entirely. There was a breaking of floodgates, a whirl of new memories and new griefs rushing into his mind. In far Lithuania they had celebrated Christmas, and it came to him as if it had been yesterday, himself a little child with his lost brother and his dead father in the cabin, in the deep black forest where the snow fell all day and all night and buried them from the world. It was too far off for Santa Claus in Lithuania, but it was not too far for peace and good will to men, for the wonder-bearing vision of the Christ child. And even in Packingtown they had not forgotten it. Some gleam of it had never failed to break their darkness. Last Christmas Eve and all Christmas Day Jurgis had toiled on the killing beds, and Ona at wrapping hands, and still they had found strength enough to take the children for a walk upon the avenue, to see the store windows all decorated with Christmas trees and ablaze with electric lights. In one window there would be live geese, in another marvels in sugar, pink and white canes big enough for ogres, and cakes with cherubs upon them. In a third there would be rows of fat yellow turkeys decorated with rosettes, 
and rabbits and squirrels hanging. In a fourth would be a fairyland of toys, lovely dolls with pink dresses and woolly sheep and drums and soldier hats. Nor did they have to go without their share of all this either. The last time they had had a big basket with them and all their Christmas marketing to do, a roast of pork and a cabbage and some rye bread and a pair of mittens for Ona and a rubber doll that squeaked and a little green cornucopia full of candy to be hung from the gas jet and gazed at by half a dozen pairs of longing eyes. Even half a year of the sausage machines and the fertilizer mill had not been able to kill the thought of Christmas in them. There was a choking in Jurgis' throat as he recalled that the very night Ona had not come home, Teta Elspeta had taken him aside and shown him an old valentine that she had picked up in a paper store for three cents, dingy and shop-worn, but with bright colors and figures of angels and doves. She had wiped all the specks off this, and was going to set it on the mantel where the children could see it. Great sobs shook Jurgis at this memory. They would spend their Christmas in misery and despair, with him in prison, and Ona ill, and their home in desolation. Ah, it was too cruel! Why at least had they not left him alone? Why, after they had shut him in jail, must they be ringing Christmas chimes in his ears? But no, their bells were not ringing for him. Their Christmas was not meant for him. They were simply not counting him at all. He was of no consequence. He was flung aside like a bit of trash, the carcass of some animal. It was horrible, horrible. His wife might be dying, his baby might be starving, his whole family might be perishing in the cold, and all the while they were ringing their Christmas chimes, and the bitter mockery of it, all this was punishment for him. They put him in a place where the snow could not beat in, where the cold could not eat through his bones. They brought him food and drink. Why, in the name of heaven, if they must punish him, did they not put his family in jail and leave him outside? Why could they find no better way to punish him than to leave three weak women and six helpless children to starve and freeze? That was their law? That was their justice! Jurgis stood upright, trembling with passion, his hands clenched and his arms upraised, his whole soul ablaze with hatred and defiance. Ten thousand curses upon them and their law! Their justice! It was a lie! It was a lie, a hideous, brutal lie, a thing too black and hateful for any world but a world of nightmares. It was a sham and a loathsome mockery. There was no justice, there was no right anywhere in it. It was only force, it was tyranny, the will and the power, reckless and unrestrained. They had ground him beneath their heel, they had devoured all his substance, they had murdered his old father. They had broken and wrecked his wife, they had crushed and cowed his whole family, and now they were through with him, they had no further use for him, and because he had interfered with them, had gotten in their way, this was what they had done to him. They had put him behind bars, as if he had been a wild beast, a thing without sense or reason, without rights, without affections, without feelings. Nay! they would not even have treated a beast as they had treated him. Would any man in his senses have trapped a wild thing in its lair and left its young behind to die? These midnight hours were fateful ones to Jurgis. In them was the beginning of his rebellion, of his outlawry, and his unbelief. He had no wit to trace back the social crime to its far sources. He could not say that it was the thing men have called the system that was crushing him to the earth, that it was the packers, his masters, who had bought up the law of the land and had dealt out their brutal will to him from the seat of justice. He only knew that he was wronged, and that the world had wronged him, that the law, that society, with all its powers, had declared itself 
his foe. And every hour his soul grew blacker, every hour he dreamed new dreams of vengeance, of defiance, of raging, frenzied hate. The vilest deeds, like poison weeds, bloom well in prison air. It is only what is good in man that wastes and withers there. Pale anguish keeps the heavy gate, and the water is despair. So wrote a poet, to whom the world had dealt its justice. I know not whether laws be right, or whether laws be wrong. All that we know who lie in jail is that the wall is strong, and they do well to hide their hell, for in it things are done, that son of God nor son of man ever should look upon. End of chapter 16 Recording by Tom Weiss